Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, and welcome to the TEDx BGSU for the Public Good. On behalf of the C. Raymond Marvin Center for Student Leadership and Civic Engagement and Bowling Green State University, I want to personally welcome you to our 2023 event. My name is Sir Evans. I'm the founder of the Superpower Planner. And amongst my many roles and achievements, I'm a former TEDx BGSU speaker. Last year, I spoke to BGSU community about the importance of creativity and its place in creating the public good. Today, I have the honor of welcoming you and serving as the MC for our first section of talk surrounding innovation. TED, which stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, was founded in 1984 by Richard Saul Worman and Harry Marks. After observing the convergence of these three fields, these two individuals sought to amplify the importance of working together by hosting a series of talks and presentations by experts in each area. After a few hiccups in the process, Worman and Marks hosted the first official TED event in Monterey, California in 1990. Over 30 years after the debut of the first TED event, the nonprofit organization has grown to host over 3,000 independent organized TED events, in addition to their own conference each year. TED Talks are available in over 100 languages. The TED website gets over 17 views per second, and the TEDx YouTube channel alone has over 190,000 videos. Worman and Marx envisioned an organization that would aid in the collaboration of technology, entertainment, and design industries, yet ultimately created something that would allow ideas to be spread and amplified throughout the world. Today's events are sure to leave you feeling engaged, informed, and inspired. As participants, you'll hear from doctors, musicians, and writers. You'll learn about sustainability, art, preservation, and the science behind loneliness. You'll be asked to consider your humility, your passions, and your own role in leading for the public good. And in the end, we hope you leave feeling stronger connection to the sense of belonging to BGSU and the TEDx community. Now, before we introduce our first speaker, I've been asked to cover a few housekeeping items as we enjoy today's event. So first, if you must leave during the section, just please try and wait until our, first, until our speakers have concluded their talks, just not to interrupt them during their speech. I assure you, they have rehearsed and worked very hard to be here, so we like to give them the utmost respect. Second, all talks will be photographed, recorded by members of the event staff today. We ask that you refrain from recording or taking photos yourself so that the officials recording and getting photo photographs will not be affected. All TEDx BGSU photos and videos will be made publicly available after the event. Finally, we want to thank the following people for making today's event possible. First off, Julie Davis and the team of WBGU for today's recording. Abigail Martinez and the team at BGSU Marketing and Brand Strategy. Amy Davis and the Conference and Event Services team, including those that helped set the stage and put together this incredible venue. BGSU Catering for the refreshments and labor for helping us provide food for our guests. Campus Operations for assisting with the signs across campus. The Office of Campus Sustainability for helping us to make this a zero waste environment. All of the volunteers that make today possible. And finally, our speakers for their hard work, dedication, and preparing for today's talks and this incredible event. The first section of today's event is titled Innovation for the Public Good. To innovate is to make changes to something that's established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. Our first speaker is surely an expert on the subject of innovation. Vagish Vela, a Londoner and Toledo transplant, he's worked as a strategist, software engineer, and marketer. He is also a startup founder, loves to travel with his family, and give back to his community through philanthropy and volunteering. Vagish talk titled, You Are the Product, will focus on the importance of privacy in our digital world. 
He'll pose questions about the data usage, and if that usage is really worth the privacy we're trading in the long run. Please join me and welcome to the TEDx BGSU stage, Vagish Vela. We live in a world where we've gotten used to free products. When we want to learn about something, we go on to Google and search for information about it. When we want to connect with family or friends, we hop on social media. When we want to chat, we use text, iMessage, Messenger, Discord, and so many more tools. Do we pay directly for these products? In most cases, no. We get these services for free. But are the companies creating these products doing this for us out of the goodness of their heart? Assuredly not. They are doing it for profit. If we don't pay, then how do they make money? They make money from the data we hand over to them on a daily basis. Let's take social media for an example. When you sign up, you give them your name, your email, address, date of birth, and some other information. You then follow or connect with your friends respond to their posts, and make posts yourself, say, of a group photo from last night, tagging all your friends who were there. Those interactions tell the social media company who your friends are in addition to what you like and dislike in regards to the content you engage with and who you hung out with. The information you have given is then used to create a product, which is you. Advertisers come along and want to purchase access to you. They can identify whether or not you are their target audience, thanks to the information you have provided to the social media company. When the social media platform does sell access to you based on whether you meet the target criteria provided by the advertiser. The cr criteria could be something as simple as age range or geographic location, or more complex, such as your taste in popular culture products, which are derived from your interactions with posts, views, likes, and other interactions. Search engines do a similar thing as well. An example of how companies can find out about you from the data you inadvertently provide is this story from over a decade ago. <clears throat> there was an incident where Target sent a high school girl coupons for baby clothes to a family home. Her father was understandably furious when he saw these and complained to Target. But little did he know that Target had information that he didn't. The company knew his daughter was pregnant before he knew. How did Target figure this out? They associate identifiers to each buyer, and based off historic buying patterns of women who were expecting, they were able to predict that this high school girl was expecting a baby to the point of even estimating the due date and sending out cor coupons corresponding to the stage of pregnancy they anticipated she was in. After this issue, Target has changed their process and mix in pregnancy coupons with general coupons. A more modern example that you are likely to be familiar with in the United States is when you go to the grocery store and they print out coupons for you, using your buying patterns to encourage you to spend more. So far, we've looked at places where we directly engage, but what about the companies who collect data that we don't directly engage with? Think about credit scores. Where do they get their data? Well, they don't disclose all their sources. But if you look at the, a report, it has things like foreclosures, tax liens, bankruptcies, collection information, and so much more. There is a lot of information from numerous sources. How do these credit score agencies make money then? A quick Google search will tell you that the big three credit scoring agencies made over $9 billion in 2016 namely Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. We see those mailers from credit card companies telling us we are pre-approved to apply for a credit card. Well, these companies purchase lists from the credit agencies using criteria such as age and credit score. They also sell you fraud protection services. Unfortunately, you can't really get out of using credit score agencies as they are used by banks to open checking accounts mortgage applications, car loan applications, rental applications, 
credit card applications, and sometimes even background checks for potential employers. The credit score agencies all come under consumer reporting agencies, and there is a 41-page document listing the agencies on the Federal Reserve website, ranging from employment screening agencies to low-income and subprime consumer reporting agencies. Across your consumer reports, there is a lot of data there, but we rarely knowingly consent to provide this information. It is probably in one of those terms and conditions agreements we checked a box to, like the 14,000 word terms and conditions of Facebook. If you've been to college, you may remember taking the PSATs, SATs, or APs. You may remember providing some personally identifiable information to them when you registered. This information is then used by the college board to connect students with colleges. Once you take one of those exams, you often start receiving a lot of mail trying to get you to apply to colleges. To colleges, you are the product they're buying access to. This is an example where your personal information is sold, and especially when you are so young that you may not understand the implications of this. Unfortunately, the USA's data privacy laws are not at the level of the EU laws. One such law is called GDPR, expanded as the General Data Protection Reg Regulation. So we don't have as much control over our data as our European Union counterparts. This doesn't mean you have no control, just that you have less control. In the example of a scenario where you shop in person, the stores can tie an identifier to your rewards account, your credit card, email, or something else. The chances of avoiding data collection is futile. So it is really knowing about what data collection is happening and what data you are happy to share, and what you aren't. Right now, if you want to share less data, you might get away with paying with cash. But it is not feasible for most people and certain types of, certain types of expenses. And when facial recognition takes off, companies could use that to associate your purchases with you. Facial recognition is already being piloted by the TSA to get through security. And even the IRS had a brief stint with requiring facial recognition to log into your account. We have, however, had some breakthroughs in data privacy laws stemming from California, which is called the California Consumer Privacy Act, abbreviated as CCPA, and has been adopted nationwide by some large corporations. Even though the USA doesn't have the same data privacy laws nationally, or on par with the EU's data laws, large companies such as Google and Facebook have adopted a lot of the higher data privacy protections globally rather than focusing by region, which gives us more power over our data. However, not all companies are doing this as they don't have to apply these regional laws globally. We live in a world where data breaches are commonplace. The companies who guard our credit scores telephones, and government institutions have had data breaches. Even the IRS accidentally released 120,000 taxpayers' information by error on their website. It feels like sharing data is inevitable, but the thing we have control over is how much we share within limitations. Of course, you can't stop shopping, but you can do things like managing your Facebook privacy stopping Google from storing your location history, or even using an alternative search engine, and the list goes on. There was a time when we knew little about data as a population, but we live in an era where sharing data is inescapable. Your data is not just about privacy, but it is a gateway into your life. With certain pieces of data, someone could commit fraud. So something you can do to reduce your risk is to protect your credit score by using the ability to freeze your score. To manage your data sharing, there are other examples of things that can be done, such as reviewing your privacy settings on your social media and other accounts, deleting accounts that you don't use anymore, and opting out of your data being sold, thanks to the California Consumer Privacy Act. However, this is only required in the state of California. 
though it has been adopted nationally by some large corporations. There are many ways in which you are the product. Whether social media companies sell access to you to advertisers, grocery stores sell access to you to grocery product manufacturers, credit scoring agencies selling your data to credit card companies, or even the college board selling your data to the universities. However, in most of these scenarios, you can control how much data and if any data is sold. Eventually, the more data out there creates more risk from data breaches, and managing your data reduces your risk. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use social media or other free platforms where you're providing your data in exchange for a free service, or that you should start paying all your bills in cash and not filing your taxes. However, knowing what data you are providing, how the companies or organizations are using it, and your personal comfort level is important. And finally, take control of your data and make your own decisions. One more time for Vagish. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So a question for you. Um, do you ever feel like there's a way that we can completely hide our digital footprint from the radar? I don't really think that's possible. You can reduce it. Um, there are more movements in terms of regulations. Like in the European Union, you have the right to be forgotten. So you can actually get information deleted off the internet. However, it's your, anything that goes on the internet is, is going to be there. It's got to be there. Good to know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So we want to thank you once again, Vagish. Now, have you ever wondered what you could or should do with the plastics that you consume on a regular day's basis? Do you recycle often but ask yourself, are there better or more effective ways that you could live sustainability? Our next speaker has a few suggestions for you. Elise is a second year political science major with a concentration in comparative government and two minors, peace and conflict studies and international studies. Elise is an alumni laureate scholarship through the Honors College and also has a role in the executive board for the undergraduate student government and the College Democrats. Finally, Elise is also vice president of Pi Kappa Delta and works on campus as a student learning analyst and peer facilitator. Elise will soon be able to add TEDx BGSU speaker to the long list of accomplishments. Elise will be teaching us all today about eco-bricking, a way to stop single-use plastics from deteriorating into microplastics in landfills or creating toxic gases in the atmosphere after being burned. Please join me and welcome Elise Adrian to the TEDx BGSU stage. Is it on? about how much plastic you use on a daily basis. Every time you get groceries, almost everything is wrapped in a form of plastic. Every time you get takeout or your large family comes over and you don't want to run the dishwasher five times, so you use plastic plates, forks, knives, and spoons. On average, every American uses and throws away 295 pounds of plastic annually according to the Environmental Protection Agency. It may seem like most of that plastic can be recycled, but according to the EPA in 2018, only about 9% is actually recycled. The EPA has not released any more recent statistics, but new estimates by other uh, experts see rates fallen to about 5%. 
there are many myths surrounding recycling. So I'm going to deconstruct a few for you today before moving on to the main focus of this talk, what eco-bricking is and why it is important. According to a 2022 report by Greenpeace, there are five reasons as to why plastic recycling fails. Number one, plastic waste is too widespread to collect. Plastic waste is spread across the 123 million households in America. There are systemic infrastructure issues with plastic collection because there are many different ways that plastic recycling can be collected. You could rely on a household to bring their plastics to a recycling plant, or a city could put out a collection can that goes along with the trash. Regardless of how each city or county decides to collect their plastic recycling, there is still the issue of thousands of recycling plants across the country that do not collect plastics in a standardized way. Two, mixed plastic waste cannot be recycled together. There are a bunch of different types of plastic, each, each with its own unique comp composition, which means that they cannot be melted down together. A plastic milk jug and a detergent bottle cannot be melted down with a plastic water bottle or a takeout food container. It is impossible to sort through the millions of pieces of plastic waste each year so that they can be separated by type and reprocessed. If even a single piece of the wrong plastic accidentally got into a batch, that whole batch is contaminated and deemed unusable. This is what single-handedly holds up recycling processes, and unless a uniform plastic is created and the number system is eliminated, then plastic recycling will never be effective. If somehow plastic waste were to be efficiently collected and sorted, there would still be issue number three. Plastic recycling is wasteful and a pollutant. When plastic is mechanically recycled, microplastics are created and washed into water sources. This is extremely problematic because you could be drinking microplastics and never know because they're not visually identifiable. There have already been scientific studies acknowledging that microplastics have been found in the lungs and bloodstreams in a majority of the people tested. This can cause health issues in humans as well as animals that live in or drink from contaminated water sources. Number four, recycled plastic has toxicity risks. Plastic products absorb the products or chemicals that are put into them and plastic is inherently made with chemicals. So that means the millions of pounds of food grade plastic created each year cannot be recycled back into food grade plastic because it is not safe for food to come in contact with most recycled plastics. This leaves either downcycling that plastic waste into lower value products or simply throwing it away. Five, newer plastic is cheaper and more economical. New plastic is cheaper and higher quality. It is also extremely expensive to collect, sort, move, and reprocess plastic waste in a safe manner. It will never make sense for corporations to use recycled plastics. And if corporations won't buy that recycled plastic, then why are we making it? With all of these reasons, we need to come up with more creative solutions to the plastic problem. The most viable solution, in my opinion, is eco-bricking. So what is eco-bricking and what does it do for the environment? I started my journey on ecobricks.org and all of this information has been implemented by me in workshops here at BGSU. Do you remember those microplastics that have contaminated water streams and already been found in the majority of the human population? Eco-bricking could help mitigate that effect. It is a way to sequester plastics, to keep them from degrading into microplastics and leaching toxins into the ground, air, and water systems. When plastics are left to degrade in the landfill, they are hit with the sun's rays and photodegrade into microplastics. This photodegradation creates greenhouse gases that 
contribute, albeit a small amount, to climate change. Incineration of plastic is also not viable because it releases microplastics, biphenols, and phthalates, which are big words, but those are ultimately gases that you should not be breathing. So how does eco-bricking help that? Well, it solves the issue of net surface area being exposed. Malleable single-use plastics are shoved into a plastic bottle until it forms a brick. Since the plastic is now sequestered, there is less degradation that occurs. Now, eco-bricks are not the whole solution to the plastic crisis. They just help in the short term. Plastic recycling is not going to be figured out anytime soon because of those five reasons mentioned earlier. But plastic usage is also not going anywhere. In our current market, it would be almost impossible to eliminate single-use plastics. So while these two issues are being solved, it is important to have a solution that works with the current system. And I believe that is eco-bricking. So now I'm gonna teach you how to make one. You take malleable single-use plastics, like this chip bag, wash it and dry it, and then shove it into a bottle. When building bricks, you can use plastic bags, any kind of single-use packaging. Things that you shouldn't include in eco-bricks are metal and glass, because those can be recycled safely, or biodegradables, because those are compostable. So there are six steps to making an eco-brick. Number one, save, segregate, clean, and dry. Save all of the plastics that you use in a week and clean and dry them. This step is extremely important because if there is residue left on the plastics, then when they're packed into the bottle, methane can build up and it can cause the bottle to expand and burst. Number two, pick a bottle. I recommend using 20 ounce bottles because those are the easiest to work with. Number three, choose a stick. I use a fiberglass chopstick, um, but you can use anything that fits within the mouth of the bottle. Number four, cut up your plastics. Cut up plastics into smaller, more manageable pieces because that allows it to get into the brick easier and it allows more volume to be put into the brick. Number five, fill your bottle halfway and then push it down with a stick. So fill it halfway, push it down, fill it halfway, push it down until you get a finished brick. The bottle is packed tightly and there are no air pockets. You leave one to two centimeters at the top so that the cap will fit on nicely. It is super important to periodically shove down the plastics that you put in there because it will reduce air pockets and allow more plastic to fit into the bottle. After that, you have a finished eco brick. So what can you do with it? You can build things. This is a fantastic way to reuse plastics. I'm working on creating a plant potter, like this one, that's going to go somewhere on BGSU's campus. Depending on how much time you want to dedicate to a project, you can begin collecting your own eco bricks to use for your own project, or you can donate them to a collective that makes bigger structures. So eco bricking not only helps keep plastics out of the landfill and can be used to create great structures, it's also an exercise in mindfulness. It can help you figure out how much plastic you use. And then, since it's consciously on your mind, you slowly eliminate easy plastics from your life, such as that convenient plastic water bottle and plastic grocery bags. Then you can start buying more sustainably when possible. Now, it would require a lot of hard work, discipline, and money to not use any plastic anymore. And that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm asking you to do is be more mindful of what you buy be responsible with your plastic trash, and use a reusable water bottle. In the long run, it could save you more money. But what am I actually asking you to do? I'm asking you to take this information home and try it. Just try it for one week. Collect all of the plastics that you use in a week, wash them, dry them, 
sit down over the weekend, get comfy, and pack it into a bottle. You will be shocked at how much plastic you collect. You can help save the environment one brick at a time. Thank you. Do you want this to give to Adrian? Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause once again for Elise. So, question for you. Would you say that there's any area of opportunity or maybe, um, a disadvantage to the eco breaking. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the big disadvantage is the amount of time that it takes. Um, it takes between four and five hours to like create an eco brick, and that's like after you kind of know how to do it. Um, so it does require a lot of like time on your part to do it. But we need that time if we're going to save this environment. So Definitely. that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you once again. Thank Let's you. give a round of applause one more time for Elise. Thank you. All righty. I kind of out. Our next speaker, Adrian Osden Moore. Adrian joined the BGSU community in January of 2022 and serves as the executive director to the Jeffrey H. Radbill Center for College and Life Design. Prior to the role, Adrian served as director of the Institute of Applied Creativity for Transformation at the University of Dayton. In her talk today, Adrian will be discussing the concept of prototyping and how we can apply it to life in an effort to achieve our goals. Prototyping can, in fact, be the solution to the paralysis we feel when we have a dream, but we aren't quite sure how to reach it. As a part of the global community of life designers that originated at Stanford University, Adrian has been teaching life design, including concepts like prototyping, since 2017, and serves as an advisor and coach for Stanford's life design studio, for the university educators. Please join me and welcome Adrienne Osenmore to the TEDx BGSU stage for her talk titled, The Power of Prototyping. Often we hear that we should follow our dreams or shoot for the stars and create big goals. But how do we actually accomplish that? We know we need to do something, but we might not even know where to begin. Not to mention there's so much pressure to have it all figured out when there's so much about the future that's simply unknown. So rather than standing here frozen in fear, how do we get started and take action? by embracing the power of prototyping. In the world of design thinking and life design, prototypes are simply opportunities to try something out, test an idea, or explore a curiosity. These small steps can actually lead to big goals. And today, I want to share with you how the power of prototyping has worked in my own life. Today, I am the executive director of the Radbill Center for College and Life Design here at BGSU. But back when I was in college, I had no way of knowing that this is where I would end up someday. I was a graphic design major with a marketing minor who loved dance and theater. I was, and still am, what is sometimes referred to as a multi-potentialite. This term was coined by Emily Wapnick to describe someone who has lots of interests and is looking for ways to connect those interests rather than just choose one path. As I was approaching graduation, I really struggled. I was overwhelmed by the idea of finding the perfect job or picking the right career path. The pressure was real. As we all know, the most popular question asked of any college senior, so what are you going to do after graduation? And even though I loved my field of study, it was still an incredibly overwhelming time as I stepped out of the known sequence of traditional American schooling and into the real world. When I graduated, I took a job as a part-time administrative assistant for an arts living learning community on campus. It was outside of the expected path of my major, but it was a new initiative and it seemed really interesting. 
In that first job, I quickly realized that I loved being part of building something new, but I still had bills to pay. So the countdown was on to work my way to a full-time position or move on. So I started paying attention to opportunities, no matter how small. A freelance graphic design project, a graduate class that was free for employees, attending workshops to learn about other parts of campus, etc. As it turns out, I was designing my career one step at a time. And over the next decade, I worked my way up to being director of that same department. But back when I started that first job, I was asked by a faculty member, don't you have bigger ambitions? And I remember feeling like I had somehow fallen short of his expectations. That's when I learned to never say that to a student or recent grad. Thankfully, I saw that faculty member at a conference a few years ago, and he admitted that I had made a pretty good career out of that initial prototype working in higher education. In design thinking, a prototype is when you take an idea and turn it into something tangible with the goal to maximize learning for minimum investment, as described by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans from Stanford University. They're also the authors of the book, Designing Your Life. When designers create a prototype, they are using the resources available to them to outline the basic concept of a product or an idea. So remember how I said I had been interested in theater? Well, my campus job as a student was in the costume shop, and we did a lot of prototyping there. For one production, the director asked me to build a woolly mammoth costume. Yes, there was a character in the play that was a woolly mammoth, but where would I start? There was no instruction manual for how to build a woolly mammoth costume. The internet wasn't nearly as robust at the time, and YouTube didn't even exist yet. So the only way forward was, well, to try it. So a faculty member helped me create the head with paper mache, and we used dryer vents and wire and fake fur, and we just kept working through it until, lo and behold, the character on stage looked pretty much like a woolly mammoth. In life design, we talk a lot about prototyping, too. But instead of turning an idea into a product or a woolly mammoth, we are talking about the ways you might pursue a curiosity or explore an interest in your own life. When I first learned about life design, I remember Bill Burnett and Dave Evans talking about how life designers pay attention to opportunities. And at that moment, it clicked. That's what I had been doing all along. I had always been a curious person, and one small opportunity often led to a new curiosity, and so on and so on. It's kind of like that trade-up game. You know, where you start with a paperclip, and then you might trade it for a hair tie, and maybe you trade that for a piece of candy. And on it goes until you've somehow managed to end up with a bicycle. In my case, over the course of my career, some really small steps have ended up leading me to pretty big goals. I mentioned earlier that I'm now an executive director of a donor-funded center leading a bold vision to transform the student experience through life design. But what you don't know is that the path that led me here actually starts with a job I didn't get about six years ago. I was still working at the university I had graduated from, and I had applied for a leadership role in marketing and communications. I was a finalist, but ultimately I wasn't offered the position. So I was trying to figure out what the next step in my career might be. My boss at the time suggested that I check out a workshop at Stanford called Designing Your Life. So I went, and I discovered that I had an incredible interest in helping students to feel more confident about their futures. Then the opportunity arose to design and teach a mini course using that framework of life design. And I said yes. Then the folks at Stanford encouraged participants to share their prototypes with each other. And I said yes. Two years later, I was asked to come back to that same workshop, but this time as part of the facilitation team. And I said yes. Two years after that, I learned that BGSU was seeking to hire an executive director for life design. And I said yes to having a conversation to learn more about the role. And one year ago, I made the leap to a new university and a new job with much bigger responsibilities and opportunities, all because I said yes to that workshop back in 2017 that led me in a direction I could never have predicted. 
I recently lost a close friend and colleague after a long battle with cancer. Anne wrote her own obituary, where she described her say yes mentality toward life. And that perfectly describes how I remember her. Anne viewed life as one big adventure, and she managed to accomplish some really incredible personal and professional goals in her lifetime. She traveled around the world, she hiked to see gorillas, she became a full professor, she was published in a national magazine, the list goes on. But even more than her own accomplishments, she always took the time to encourage others to say yes to opportunities. In fact, she was one of my biggest cheerleaders when I was considering, and then ultimately took that big career leap. Now I lead a team whose entire job is to help students access those types of opportunities and build the confidence to design their own paths. Life can be overwhelming, especially at the beginning and end of college. You might feel like you should have a foolproof plan, that decisions already need to be made that impact the rest of your life, that you need to be perfectly sure that you are on the right path to success. But here's the secret. Life is a journey, and even if you think you have it all figured out, there are going to be unexpected twists and turns along the way. I still don't have it all figured out, and that's okay. Martin Luther King Jr. is quoted as saying, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. My own variation on that quote is something I tell friends and students frequently. You don't need to have it all figured out right now, but you do need to choose the next step. Take a moment to think about something you might want to pursue. What is one small thing that you could do today, tomorrow, or this week to explore that curiosity? For example, if you think you might want to live and work in France someday, what's the first thing you do? You could quit school, sell everything you own, buy a one-way ticket to Paris and hope for the best, or you could start by talking to someone who's lived in France or by exploring short-term study abroad opportunities, or even just downloading an app to help you learn some basic French phrases. In life design, prototyping is often as simple as a conversation or an experience. The great thing about prototyping, the stakes can be pretty small. If it works out well, then great, move on to the next step. But what if it's a disaster? What if you discover you hate it? Well, then you learn from the experience, adjust as needed, and most importantly, thank yourself for figuring it out sooner than later. The design thinking process is iterative, where you test out ideas and you're constantly learning something new along the way. In short, I am simply encouraging you to take action and embrace the process, because you never know where one conversation or experience might lead you. For example, I had a student named Jenny and she used LinkedIn to reach out and send a message to an alum living in Chicago, which is where she wanted to live after graduation. That alum connected her to a friend of theirs who worked in marketing, which was Jenny's area of interest. And now Jenny is living in Chicago and working at LinkedIn, supporting other businesses to recruit new employees, doing it all through LinkedIn, of course. It is my mission to ensure that every student has access to these types of opportunities to help you build a team that can support you along the way, to encourage you to get curious and take action, to empower you to take those first small steps toward bigger goals. Now, I've talked a lot about what students can do, but what can we do as educators, employers, or mentors? Take the advice of my friend, Anne, and say yes to providing professional development opportunities, to job shadowing, to requests for informational interviews, say yes to sharing your story, including the twists and turns you encountered along the way. And whether you're a student now or you graduated decades ago, you can still be a lifelong learner because it's never too late to try something new. So what's one small action you can take today to move you one step closer to your goals? Thank you. Thank you, thank you once again, loved it. Thank you. So I have a question for you. Okay. I think I might have to. All right. So 
Um, I know you have spoken to the opportunities and saying yes. Is there a tip that you can give someone for finding maybe the right opportunities that they should say yes to versus another? Sure. So I think a lot of times I think about um, what's an opportunity that's going to help you learn the most, um, but feels accessible, right? So it doesn't feel like you are shooting way beyond what you might be able to try right now. Um, and the other thing I would say about that is lean into your team, the people who support you, because they probably are seeing those opportunities even when you might have not have the confidence to see it for yourself. Love that. Love that. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So what we're going to do here, we have a brief moment. We have a drill that's going to be coming up here, just a tornado drill, just to make sure that we're safe and secure. But that's going to be coming up in a few moments. After that, we'll continue our show. So what I want to do here, I figure we'll do a little giveaway. How about that? That sound good to everybody? We'll do a little giveaway. Question for you, how many um, Bowling Green alumni do we have in the house here? Show of hands, show of hands. Okay, how about a little volume there? Just because it's a little dark out here. Clap of hands if we got an alumni in the house here. Good, good, good. So I have, an, I have a trivia question for you. And what we're going to be doing today here, I'm going to give away one of the super power planners. So it's a product that I have here that's really innovating the way that we are planning today. Um, Built-in charger, wireless charging in there, and sections for all of your goals. And I want to give this to one of our alumni here. So I have a trivia question for you. All right. So the trivia question is, first of all, who's familiar with our fight song? A. Oh, my. Wait a minute. I heard crickets out there. When I graduated, it was my favorite thing to say when I saw that falcon tag. I'm going to say one more time. A. There we go. There we go. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. So the trivia question is, who created our fight song? A Ziggy Zumba. Who created our fight song? And there are no rules to this answer. I won't make it too hard for you. But who created our fight song? I'll give you a few moments. Anyone, anyone have the answer on who created our fight song? Now, once again, I said that there are no rules on how you come up with this answer. <laughs> and we had a very fantastic talk about a digital footprint. <clears throat> Might be able to utilize that. What do we have? Do we have an answer over there? I think we might have another answer. I think our BGSU has another answer on there as well. Boom. I heard it. I heard it. In the middle. Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> Gilbert Fox. We have a winner. Do us a favor, ma'am. What's your name? Kelsey Buckley. Kelsey Buckley. And nice to meet you, Kelsey. What year did you graduate? Uh, 2014. 2014. Congratulations, Aza Here back is as a grad back as a grad student. Well, thank you. What are you studying? Nutrition. Nutrition. Oh, that's a great study. Great study. Love to hear. One more question for you too. What's your superpower? Now, everyone has a superpower. It is what you do that no one else can do the way that you do it. No pressure. So what I always tell people to do, um, do you have siblings? I always tell them to ask your sibling or your significant other, what's your superpower? Because we're oftentimes too close to it. We're too close to ourselves to see what makes us truly phenomenal. Well, my, my sibling is good. Mm. <laughs> well, I think there's a positive spin on the mood. So you're good at asking or good at getting things, maybe. Hmm. We'll spend some time there. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. So I just want to give us a few more minutes. We got it coming up here. But I also wanted to mention, too, this morning, I know we had a little grayer skies than we had yesterday. I was expecting to wake up and see a little more sunshine than I got. But um, I woke up feeling refreshed. 
You know, how many people woke up feeling refreshed? Let's get a show of hands. How many people woke up feeling refreshed? Anybody woke up this morning and said, eh, I'll, I'll come, but not really in the best of mood today, but I'll, I'll still make it my best duty to come. Anybody? Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's beautiful because, you know, I, I woke up feeling refreshed, not necessarily because yesterday was a long day or today would be a long day or it's a rough day, but really just refresh that it's a new day, right? And I think a lot of times we lose sight that we can actually refresh our days anytime we want to, right? So what I do want us to do before we do our drill, I just want us to take a moment and just hit the refresh button, right? So I'm going to count to three. On a three, we're just going to take a deep breath in and out, okay? So one, two, three. Perfect time for the drill. <laughs> all right, folks, so we're going to do our drill, and then we'll return for our next set of speakers, all right? Perfect. All right, looks like the drill is over. Everything is safe and secure, and we are here, and we are ready to rock and roll. All right? All right. So, have you ever felt stuck or ever felt like you hit a wall and you tried so hard to run through it when maybe what you actually needed was to take a step back and wonder how the wall got there in the first place? Our next speaker, Kirsten Stuckey, has experience with this proverbial wall and has come up with some insight on how we can get past it. A current senior studying education from Detroit, Michigan, Kirsten is a part of several organizations on campus, including the President's Leadership Academy and the National Panhellenic Council. In her free time, she likes to spend time with her dog, Kaido, and with her friends and family. She's a big Netflix watcher, and she also enjoys reading. She's excited to share her message with all of those in attendance today. Kirsten's talk, Finding Comfort Where You Are, is about finding peace in your space and finding comfort in what seems uncomfortable. Please join me and welcome Kirsten Stuckey to the TEDx BGSU stage. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here. My name's Kirsten Stuckey. I'm a senior here at Bowling Green State University. And last year, I had one of the most monumental breakdowns in my entire college career. Picture this. You're sitting at your desk in your room, working on final exam projects, and you've had a hard year. 18 credit hours, three jobs, several student organizations, and not to mention, your academic program tasks you with one of the most important jobs that there is. Developing young, impressionable minds with knowledge and information, also known as teaching. Senior year is a big year for any teaching major, and that stress has been looming over your head since you started the program. All of a sudden, you start to feel this nauseating feeling bubbling up inside. All of the stress of everything is getting to you, so you get up and you lay out on the floor and breathe. That was me. Junior year, last week of school, in the spring of 2022. I felt like my entire life was crumbling to pieces. My calendar was jam-packed. I had more commitments and requirements than I could keep track of. 
and not to mention my personal well-being was suffering. In the midst of this chaos, I was struggling to find any semblance of peace or hope because I felt lost and confused. It felt like I had been hit by a train of emotions. So I'm laying there on the floor, contemplating everything I had ever done in my life. And as I got ready to make one of the biggest changes in my college career, I thought to myself, I'm not going to grow if I can't accept change, even if the change makes me uncomfortable. How can I expect anything different when I'm not open to difference in the first place? Now, if you know me, you know I'm someone who plans my life out to the T. Rarely do I leave anything to chance because having control for me looks like having one hand on the steering wheel at all times. Meaning I don't really do change because life should go according to plan, my plan. But if there's anything that I've learned about life, it's that often we are more out of control than we are in control. At that moment, I found peace in my situation. I have found a way to be, more, to be comfortable with all the changes that were happening around me and I managed to soothe myself into a state of comfort and relaxation. This is because I had to remind myself of three very important things at that moment. The first is that failure doesn't make you a failure. It makes you a doer. By putting yourself into a situation with outcomes that are less than favorable, you are allowing yourself the option to make mistakes. You are saying to yourself, it's OK if this doesn't work, because I'm still taking that leap of faith and doing it to begin with. You are allowing yourself the courage to try something new, and, that, and that's a good thing. Often, we associate failure with fear, and that's because we see fear as a bad thing, so we see failure as a bad thing, and that's not true. Fear is a healthy emotion. Fear helps us understand where the thin line is that separates comfort and discomfort. Fear is important, and so is failure. What we have to have the courage to do is know what risks are worth taking. Which risks will open up new worlds of possibility versus the ones that will cause significant damage to our health or state of being? For example, jumping from a 12-story building with no safety gear. You should be afraid, very afraid. Switching to a new job. Have some fear, but let your courage outweigh it. We have to understand that the outcomes that lie on the other side of fear and failure are often the best, not the most comfortable decisions for us. The second thing I learned was that perfection is impossible. I've had this idea of what my perfect life would be like since I was young. I've always told people, I live my life in a fairy tale. And if I work hard enough, my life will look like happily ever after. And yet, no matter how many times life showed me that that was quite literally not a real aspiration, I chased it anyways. Perfection is a man-made concept that we give to ourselves, and we don't realize the pressure that comes with it. And from what we know about pressure, that can turn into a problem very quickly. Imagine you have a pot on the stove with water, and you turn the heat on high. You put the lid on, and you walk away. As the water starts to boil, it will pop higher and higher until it forces its way out and spills over. That's called pressure, and that's what happened to me. For me, understanding that I couldn't have a perfect life, or better yet, a perfect college experience, was a very humbling experience, I'll tell you that much. But perfection should not be the goal. Happiness should be. Now, do I still strive to have what I think is a perfect life? Of course, old habits die hard. The main difference is that now, when things don't turn out the way I expect it, I cope a little better. Instead of watching the pot fill with pressure and water, wanting to boil over, I turn the heat down. The last thing I learned was that success is inevitable for me. While things may fall apart around me and situations may seem hopeless, I am not doomed forever. The trajectory of my life is based on a sign that reads, all roads lead to success. Meaning that no matter how many ups and downs I have, despite the twists and turns, eventually success will come. Kirsten, how do you know? How can you be so sure? For me, there is no point in stressing over things that are out of my control because eventually they will happen as they do. All I can control is how I react and what I do with the cards I'm dealt. I remind myself constantly that my best is good enough and my great is unstoppable. I have confidence no matter what space I'm in. I'm determined to get everything I want out of life. I am driven by my passions. I think and therefore I am. 
You have to be your biggest cheerleader because no one else is going to. And with that, you also have to be your biggest paramedic. Because when life hits you, and eventually it will hit you, you have to be able to pick yourself back up and put you on a road to success. With those things in mind, I found comfort in the chaos that was my life. I picked up the phone, called my mom, and I told her I was changing my major. I made a plan to spend the summer researching options for my career, and I took a deep breath. I let go of my fear of failure, diminished my drive for perfection, and refocused my faith on a path to success. We have to be able to find peace in our situations because we are all we can control. I can't tell you exactly what the future holds for me, but I can tell you these two things. Happiness is imperative and change is inevitable. We cannot operate without happiness and we cannot control change. Since both of these things are true, all that's left is to find happiness in those changes and comfort will follow. Now let me be clear. If you are going through a traumatic experience, cry. If, you are, if things aren't going your way, scream at the top of your lungs. Feel those big emotions. No need to force yourself to be happy. However, when it's all said and done, remember that life is going to happen as it does. And we only control so much of it. So sometimes it is better to just focus on making yourself happy and comfortable in the chaos than finding a solution. Finding comfort where you are is about standing still, taking a deep breath, and saying, I am here. I have come far, and I am going further, but here is where I stand. It's about being OK with the in-between space that we occupy. There is safety and comfort, and we have to find our safety, find our happy, find our in-between space before we can find a way to move forward. Since making these changes, I have found so much happiness in the freedom that I possess. I've been able to zero in on the things that give me joy and spend more energy pursuing those. But if I hadn't been able to accept my failure, to understand the weight of pressure, and to know that success is coming to me regardless, I could only imagine how miserable I might be. So in conclusion, when in doubt, just lay on the floor and breathe. Thank you. Love it, love it, love it. So, of course, I have a question. I love the uh, perfection piece, too. And I was always thought about excellence over perfection. So I'm curious with the uh, fear. Do you feel like it's possible to use that fear to get happiness? I feel like you have to. I think the thing that we misunderstand about fear or don't understand about fear is that it's a driving emotion. So if you can use your fear to power your courage, to power your faith, to figure out ways through problems, you'll find that what's on the other side of fear is happiness. Everything we want out of life lies on the other side of fear because fear acts as a barrier from what you really want. So if you're afraid of something, I say do it and then do it twice. Because if you can get over your fear once, you can do it again and you can diminish it. Makes sense. One more for you. Okay. What is success to you? Yeah. Success for me looks like being remembered as someone who was true to my values. Success for me is not about the material things or accomplishments. Those are, I mean, those are great. They, you know, they boost my ego. But success for me truly looks like being remembered as someone people could count on, um, having accomplished the things that matter to me, accomplishing goals that matter to me, but also being remembered as someone who people could count on and being a resource for others. Love it, love it. Well, thank you once again. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause one more time for Kirsten. Yeah. Thank you once again. Woo All right. And our final talk for the Innovation for the Public Goods section of today's event will be delivered by Bowling Green State University's President, Dr. Rodney K. Rogers. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Rodney Rogers, uh, president here of Bowling Green State University, and it's absolutely my honor to serve in this role. You know, Bowling Green State University, we are a public university for the public good. 
And I absolutely love BGSU. I also love higher education. To me, the power of education is personal. Uh, so you see, I'm, I'm a sixth generation Ohioan. I grew up in a small town here in Ohio, Kenton, Ohio. And if you haven't been to Kenton, we are proud uh, to be the county seat of Hardin County. Its population is about 8,000 people. So it is, by all definitions, a small town in a rural community in the heart of the Midwest. My parents uh, did not go to college. Uh, they worked hard, they saved, so my brother, my sister, and I could. Um, I'm a first-generation college student, and trust me, I could never imagine the opportunities that I have had because of education. I've had the opportunity to live and, and work uh, in all kinds of regions here in the U.S. as well as the world. That had broadened my perspective and certainly understanding. But the foundation was this education, higher education. You know, and as president, I, I've had an opportunity to meet incredible students, faculty, staff, uh, business and community leaders, elected officials, and supporters who have shared their stories of success because of their education. I am inspired every day by those stories. And uh, I certainly recognize that I have been incredibly fortunate and I am humbled by that fortune. Um, but I also know each of you in this room and that are listening to this TEDx, you have your own story of how education has transformed your life. And so my ask is just take a few seconds right now to think about how education has transformed your life. Keep that thought. So those of us who have the uh, honor to work in the field of education, we absolutely have a responsibility to ensure, to ensure that we are good stewards uh, of the colleges and universities in which we serve and or lead, to make sure that people have continued access to higher education, especially public higher education. You know, and, and it's not always easy. In fact, there is a conversation happening right now about the relevancy and the value of higher ed. You know, some say it's not worth it. Uh, there are so many other options. You know, you don't really need a degree. Now, that may be true for some, and it's okay. But I would hate to imagine a society without higher education for all. And as this dialogue plays out from dinner tables to the legislative floors, I worry higher ed might lose this battle of perception unless it tells the rest of the story. You know, we focus a great deal on what we do for our students. We, we prepare them for great careers and, and for a meaningful life. Uh, that's why we're here, right? Sure. You know, it makes sense. You know, our country was built, in part, upon individual rights. The Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution starts with individual rights, the amendments, the, the Bill of Rights. Often, when people think of universities, they focus solely on that individual good, the, the private good, if you will. And when we award a degree at universities, it absolutely belongs to the graduate, it is an individual good, and it will benefit them uh, in their jobs they get, in the salaries they earn. That has the value to the individual, a private good. And that is absolutely important. Perha but perhaps we, the universities, have missed talking about the rest of what we do, the public good of higher education how and why higher education matters to everyone. That private good, the degree we award, becomes something much greater when our students go into the world. 
They start and grow businesses. They build. They teach. They treat. They advance our collective knowledge. They create. They innovate. They advance the human condition. They create public good. And higher education has always been a part of moving our communities and society forward. So take BGSU for an example. In the early 1900s, we started as a normal school. Uh, that's what we were called. Our mission was to educate future K through 12 teachers for Northwest Ohio, building the foundation of education. Sure, we could have continued to train teachers to simply teach, but our country and the world evolved. It changed. We learned more. And we understood we had a greater responsibility. So we invested in new education, research, and creative activities to broaden perspectives, to think critically and grow as individuals and as a community. And while today the economic impact of BGSU has been calculated to be over $3.1 billion, we know that the full impact of education is hard to quantify. Our country's founders and leaders knew that education was critical for our economy, for our society, and for our democracy to evolve and thrive. John Adams famously uh, said, liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. Serving people is critical to higher education's DNA, yet we haven't always talked about that. Higher education is everywhere, touching lives uh, in ways we as individuals don't always realize through the public good. Our academic programs are building workforces of tomorrow, creating an economy that impacts each of us from advances in our technologies to our communication tools to our transportation systems. After all, this is our collective economy. It has been created by the work of each of us. Certainly there is individual gains, jobs and careers, but it is also a public good. It isn't either or, it is absolutely both. Faculty researchers are leading discovery around our most pressing topics, from the quality of the water to the air we drink, well, that would be the air we breathe, and to advances in our health care and our medical treatments, and improving the very structure of our homes and technologies we use daily. Faculty are also advancing our understanding of our society through their creative activities. It all has immeasurable impact. And so often, those items fly under the radar. And while individual discovery is exciting, it is the collective good, the public good, that moves us forward. Our story, the story of higher education, must balance the responsibilities we have to individuals, our students, with the collective needs we have as a high-functioning society. There are short-term needs, certainly. We must empower students to find joy and meeting in their college experience. But long-term public good is really about ensuring the next generation of leaders to make sure they are creative, ethical, hardworking, and dedicated to making our country and the world what it could be. Higher education allows us to compete globally, advances our knowledge and technology, it allows us to think creatively in growing our perspective and lived experiences, and, and hopefully makes our country and the world a more just place. It creates pathways that may not have otherwise existed, something I know firsthand. You know, this is not new for higher education. Colleges and universities have been doing this every day. We just haven't always told the entire story. And it's one the public needs to hear to ensure higher education, public higher education, remains available to all. That is the ultimate.
public good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you once again. Thank you. So I have a question for you, and I, I love the concept of the, uh, the public good. And I guess my question for you, first of all, is where do you feel like um, the biggest changes that you see going into the future for education, especially here at Bowling Green State University? Uh, it's a combination of, of making sure that uh, we are doing all we can do to support our students, to empower our students to uh, be successful and realize they have the opportunity to navigate through all sorts of challenges. Uh, several of the talks we've heard already today talks about ways in which um, students have found their way through uh, the journey uh, and, and, and success in their um, collegiate career or, or in their life after college. So I think those wraparound services, those, that supporting community is absolutely something that we have to make sure we are providing each and day. We've got to make sure students are curious, that, uh, that they're, they're thinking boldly about what they can do, and that they're kind, because great learning communities have those three elements. With respect to our research and creative activities, we've got to make sure we're sharing that and, and making sure that the work we're doing is relevant and meaningful and we can articulate why that work is helping move our society forward. And we have great faculty at this institution and staff that are working on those things every day. We just need to make sure we tell our story more strongly. Absolutely, absolutely. And as an alumni, I can testify to that. I definitely experienced that community, that education piece, and I just thank BG so much for that. Uh, my last question to you, I have to ask you, what do you feel like your superpower is, and how do you feel like it applies to your role? So uh, backstage, when you asked that question earlier, Kirsten and I, I asked her what's her superpower. Mm -hmm. I won't disclose that. But I thought to myself, I don't think I have one other than um, uh, I am curious about the stories of other people mm. around me. And I, I, I'm, I'm always, there is always uh, a fascinating story to hear. So it maybe yeah. it's not a superpower, but, but I think it's an orientation of curiosity. I, I urge everyone to ask questions, be curious, be willing to change your mind about things, be curious, and I ask everyone to tell your higher education story. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you once again, President. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All righty. Well, everyone, this concludes this our innovation for the public good section. And I hope that you feel encouraged and inspired to go forth and innovate in your own way in an effort to create public good. We encourage you to join us in the TEDx BGSU Community Hub located in the multi-purpose room on the other side of the mezzanine here. And you'll have the opportunity to engage with speakers, stop by the pop-up bookstore, and participate in the community art pieces. Our next section of talks starts promptly at 10.15 a.m. and we will focus on the concept of growth. Please join us back in the ballroom for our next series of talks. And thank you again for coming out, and we hope to see you again soon.
All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 TEDx Talk here at BGSU. How's everyone feeling? Yes. Woot wooting is encouraged today, all the hoots and hollers today. Um, well, I'm Claire Mitchell. And my name's Steve Iwanek, and both of us are the co-news co co anchor, excuse me, for the BG Falcon Media Newscast program here on campus, and we're both journalism students in our third year here at BG. And we're really excited and honored to be a part of this event today. We'll be with you guys the rest of the day if you're staying around with us, and we're really excited to hear the fantastic lineup of speakers that we have for you today. Now, the theme for today's event is for the public good. You're going to be hearing that all day today. And for our second session, we are talking about growth for the public good. Now, growth is seen all over this campus, whether it's our biology greenhouse used for research. You're literally seeing plants being grown. There's public visits. Maybe it's the personal growth, like through the life design program where students can design their college experience and, and find themselves on the path that helps them grow. Our campus is thriving. And everything that is flourishing here will be put towards that public good. This first lineup of speakers today are talking about their own kind of growth that they are maybe seeing, have experienced, or ways for you yourself to grow. Kicking things off for growth for the public good today is Dr. Jacob Clemens. He will be... No, sorry, I should start off with what he is. He's the senior director of the C. Raven Marvin Center for Student Leadership and Civic Engagement here at PGSU. His speech is called, May I Give You Some Feedback? It touches on the value of receiving feedback from someone you share trust with. So let's give a warm welcome to the TEDx BGSU stage today, Dr. Jacob Clemens. May I give you some feedback? I feel disappointed that as a society and in our community, we are not very good at receiving feedback criticism, or insight about how we have treated others. Our typical response to feedback is significant defensiveness, vicious counterattacks, avoidance of the issues, gaslighting, and making immediate excuses. I want us to do better. These responses to feedback are not limited to people in public leadership positions, although we see plenty of that. They occur daily in our heart, in our inner workings of our families and friendships, in our work environments, and in our communities. May I give you some feedback? This simple statement implies that someone is asking for your consent to give you feedback, to provide an observation or critique about your performance or behavior. You consent to this feedback in healthy relationships with some form of shared trust and care. There may be folks in your life that you may not trust, and you're not interested in their feedback. You might have someone in your life who will use feedback as a way to intentionally cause harm. This is not the sort of feedback I'm interested in. I'm interested in sharing with you the importance and value of receiving feedback with consent from someone you have some shared trust with. Many of us are taught how to give feedback, use I feel statements, avoid attacking the individual, remaining calm. If you want to be heard, you need to go through certain steps to ensure you communicate in such a way to minimize defensiveness in the listener. And I think it's important to acknowledge that this probably requires some courage from the giver of the feedback, because they can say things in the best way possible and still don't know how we are going to receive it. So what's our job as a receiver? I think outside of encouraging folks to not get defensive, we are almost never taught how to receive feedback. We talk about active listening, being attentive, summarizing what you're hearing. And yes, these are all good to having helpful and productive conversations. But what happens when the conversation triggers an emotional response, as feedback often does? When we are having an emotional response, let's be honest, it's very difficult to stay in active listening. And so what's the consequence of this? I think one, potential damage to the relationship, especially if it becomes a pattern. And two, missed opportunities for growth. This may sound obvious because I think we all understand that the point of feedback is to help us do something better or to be better, but how many times when we receive feedback do we maybe not agree with the feedback? And we could quickly interrupt and say, that's not what I intended, that's not what I meant. Or we're quick to tell them why the information they're trying to share just isn't true or accurate. Or even quickly just jump to the conclusion to end that conversation right there. How many times have we given in to our emotional response and you may think, but it is true. 
That's not what I intended. It is true. That isn't exactly what happened in that previous interaction. Maybe there are reasons the feedback doesn't quite match what you think is true. But maybe you agreeing with the feedback isn't the point. Let me share with you the feedback I find most difficult to receive. It is given by my wife. My wife, Christina, is a mental health therapist, and we have three small children. There are times when my kids get in arguments or fights over a toy or become jealous of one another. I will step in to resolve the situation, and eventually the tension subsides. And sometimes, after the situation winds down, Christina pulls me aside. Remember, she's a therapist, and says, may I give you some feedback? And I can immediately feel the emotion rising in my body because I know she's about to criticize how I just handled that conflict between my kids and how I'm an utter failure as a father and I'm just ruining my kids. Of course, that isn't what she says at all. In reality, she usually shares what she observes and provides some valuable insights about how I might handle that situation differently in the future and how what I said or did probably were not the most effective ways to get my desired outcome. But when she says, may I give you some feedback, it really feels like a knife to my heart because the job I take most seriously, the job I take most pride in, my wife, the therapist, just said, I need to do better. And I don't want to hear that. And sometimes at first, I don't really agree that the way I handled it wasn't helpful. After all, they aren't fighting any anymore, are they? You see, when the feedback we get doesn't quite match what we already think or believe about ourselves, our first instinct is to be able to reject it, to get rid of it especially if it's about something that's important to us, something we value, something that has to do with who we think we are. I am a good dad, and getting feedback on my parenting hurts. But I trust my wife. I consented to that feedback. What do I do with this when I want to reject it? Remember when I said that the person giving feedback comes to us not knowing how he might react to that feedback, and it probably requires them to have some courage? I believe the counterpart to us as a receiver is humility. I believe that humility is essential in the process of receiving feedback. Humility means staying grounded, open, and vulnerable, and being willing to grow the parts of ourselves that we may already think are done growing in. It means putting aside our ego, our power, and control. I have observed that receiving feedback humbly from others who have the same or less positional power than you gives some of the most insightful and helpful feedback. Bringing humility to the interaction communicates to the person giving the feedback that you can actively listen, that their experience matters, and that the relationship matters. When we bring humility and have a willingness to feel whatever emotional experience comes up for us and do nothing about it but to notice it and hold it with humility, we may find there is, at minimum, probably some truth in what is being shared. And these truths do not erase or prove wrong who we already think we are. I am a good father. And receiving feedback from my wife in ways I can, I can be a better father only strengthens that good father identity. It is to our benefit and to the benefit of those around us that we foster relationships by hearing with humility and create a culture where others feel confident in sharing that feedback with us. I wonder, what could change if we started receiving feedback with humility? What if leaders on every level were able to receive feedback with humility and use it to create meaningful and positive change instead of using it to reinforce us versus them? Recall the feedback I shared at the start. As a society in our community, we are not very good at receiving feedback, criticism, or insight about how we have treated others. Our typical responses are defensiveness, vicious counterattacks, avoiding the issue altogether, gaslighting, and just making excuses. I want us to do better. Meaningful and authentic relationships emerge when they are shared trust, courage, and a willingness to humbly listen to feedback and differing perspectives and experiences. I am a better father because my wife has the courage to give me feedback about my parenting, and I muster the humility to accept and incorporate that feedback. So that's something. If we each shared responsibility to listen with humility, to humbly consider the feedback about the structures institutions and values we hold most dear. It, initially, it might feel like a knife to the heart, like the feedback my wife gave me about my parenting. But with humility, this feedback could make things better. With this in mind, the next time someone offers you feedback, how will you respond?
All right. Can we have another round of applause? He's the first one for this section. This is tough. Please, that was a great speech. Okay. How do you feel? Great. You feeling good? Yeah, I feel great. Are you lying? Are you being No, dirty? I feel great. <laughs> Okay, so so after each, for those who are, of you who are just joining us today, after each speech, we do have a question. It's nothing scary, no. not a pop quiz. I promise you got it. So my question for you is, deciding on a topic, I've been, you know, I, I, this is the second year I've done this, and deciding on a topic for me seems like one of the most difficult steps to this. Was there an incident for you or something that happened in particular where you were like, yeah, this is what I'm going to talk about today? Or what made you want to talk about this in particular? Um, I work in a leadership center that focuses on leadership and how to develop leaders. And I think one of the most key things for leaders to do is be humble and listen to feedback, particularly with those around them and people who are following them. And I think it's a message that our leaders in our society and our communities don't hear enough. And so I really kind of held on to that idea as a message I want to get out there. And so that's kind of what drew me to it. I think you did a great job. Didn't you do a great job? Yes. All right. I'm going to welcome our next, next speaker to the stage. Please, Steve. All right. Once again, how about Jacob, huh? First session, or second session, first speaker. Absolutely fantastic. Well, up next, we are going to dive into the gray of our world, the concept of comprehensive, complete, and blended thought, a way of life that many people still fall short of understanding. Why is our world cutthroat and assumed to be clear? That ideology is only a snippet of a vast world of thought that drives the action of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So please give a warm welcome to the stage our next speaker, Kayla Robbins, with her talk today on what lies beyond the black and white. Please, Kayla Robbins. When I was eight years old, I had a whole life plan. I made up my mind then and there that I was going to become an FBI special agent. Pretty cool, right? And I remember Googling on the computer the steps that I needed to take to get there. And well, that was it. I thought that I was on my way there. Little did I know at that time that life had other plans for me that were far beyond the black and white. Unfortunately, the story that I'm about to share with you today is not unique to myself. I am here today to bring out one of those skeletons in the closet. You know, the ones that we as a society would rather not talk about, would rather not acknowledge that it exists, let alone acknowledge that it has happened to us or even people we know and love. The truth is that regardless of one's gender, age, ethnicity, or socioeconomic background that no child is immune to childhood sexual abuse. I'm a mother of two boys, and they're ages nine and seven, and I too, like every other parent, want to believe that I can effectively protect them from harm. However, childhood sexual abuse is real. It is happening here. It is happening to people we know and love. According to Wood County Job and Family Services, last year there were 969 investigations of neglect and physical and sexual abuse involving children. This is the largest number of investigations the agency has completed to date, and the cases reported were of a greater severity. 126 of these investigations involved childhood sexual abuse. 126 children in our community have been forever changed. See, the reality is childhood sexual abuse is happening in our churches, in our schools, in our communities, and for some of us within our own families. Transformation begins with the truth, and I'm here today to share mine publicly for the first time with the hope of letting others know that they are not alone, and to reduce some of the societal stigmas of shame surrounding childhood sexual abuse. As children, we are taught and conditioned to live in a world of black and white, that there are good situations and that there are bad situations, that there are good and that there are bad people in this world, that the good people go to church, that schools are safe places for our children, and that our justice system treats victims with dignity and respect. 
I ask you, what happens when we are forced to acknowledge that the truth is far more complicated than what is in black and white? How can we step outside the mindset that not every situation can be justified as good or bad? Well, there's a comfort and simplicity in the right, wrong, good, bad, and black, white mindset. There's a truth that lies somewhere outside everything we thought we knew about life and the world around us. I am here to challenge you today on the truth that lies beyond the black and white and how accommodating our new truths can transform not only our lives and perceptions, but how we interact with the world and shape those around us. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in church, whew, and I mean a lot. There were the Sunday morning worship services, the Sunday evening services, Wednesday evening services, and a variety of other religious obligations in between. The church that I attended was in Assemblies of God, which is generally considered the largest Pentecostal denomination of the Protestant church. It was in this church that I would meet the man who would later sexually abuse me. I remember being taught as a child how if a stranger tries to kidnap or otherwise hurt you to yell for help and run away. I was never taught what to do when it was someone that I knew and trusted. Our children are taught how stranger means danger, but not of the real danger of being groomed by someone they know and trust. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network of these sexual abuse cases that have been reported to law enforcement, 93% of juvenile victims knew their perpetrator. So to further break it down, that's 59% were acquaintances, 34% were family members, and only 7% of perpetrators were strangers to the victim. This person was someone I had trusted. This person was someone I had looked up to like a father. This person was someone who I looked up to as a person of God. I had no way to predict what was to come. As far as the specifics of the abuse, there's a lot of emotions involved for me, and some of them are truly very conflicting. There are several things that have stood out over time, and it's not only what happened to me, but the way it was handled. Why didn't you stop him? Why did you let it happen? Why didn't you scream? These words and questions unfortunately stuck with me for years and years and replayed in my mind like a broken record over and over and over again. Why didn't I scream? Because even if I did, there was no one to hear me. Why didn't I stop him? Because I was afraid. I didn't know what he would do if I didn't go along with it. I didn't know if he would try to hurt or kill me. Why did I let it happen? Because trauma is far more than just the typical fight or flight, and it's far beyond the black and white. Typical of the grooming process, it began with him sharing intimate details with me about his life. This man told me how he tried to hang himself and how his wife cut, walked in and cut down the rope. He told me how I made his life worth living again and how he would never mean to do anything to hurt me. By the time a sexual boundary was crossed, I was unable to see him for not only who, but what he was as I was so desensitized and powerless in the situation. It took years for me to understand that my body's response of pretending like I was in a movie was in order to survive and in turn escape the horrible reality of the situation. Why does our society blame the victims? Why was the justice system allowed to further re-traumatize not just me, but other victims with a lack of sympathy and judgment? Why was the only question I was asked by the jury was about where I went to school? See, where my parents live is on the edge of two bordering school districts. Why was the only question I was asked was, why do you go to school in Perkins if you live in Milan? Did you get in trouble or something? I will never forget the confusion and then hurt when I realized that I was being made out to be the bad kid for what this man did to me, a child. 
These are the questions that I will likely have to accept I will never have the answers to. Unfortunately, it is not, com not uncommon for abusers to highlight behavior changes as a means to discredit the child. As I said, it's not just what happened to me, but the way it was handled that has played a part in forever shaping who I am. The lawyer for this man was someone we both went to church with. The lawyer's wife had taken me and other girls my age on overnight trips in the church. How does a lawyer choose financial gain only not only from a Christian standpoint, but a moral and ethical standpoint, the right thing to do? It was then that I realized the power money has in our world and our society. The justice system did nothing to provide a sense of justice for me. I don't think there's any amount of time that he could have served that would ever be able to undo the damage that was caused. I know other victims and families of victims of like who can understand and relate to this, that nothing can undo what has happened. Unfortunately, acknowledgement, as painful as it may be, is something that has to happen to be able to move forward. For me, I know I'm not alone in feeling that the systems in place to protect me not only forgot, but failed me. Because my perpetrator and his wife were related to the head pastor of the church, he was still welcomed. It started with him being allowed to attend services from a top balcony, to then him being allowed to continue to provide landscaping, biz landscaping, through his church, to, landscaping to the church through his business. I can only speculate why he was welcomed back in the church even after, becoming, even after having a prison sentence and becoming a registered sex offender. I don't know if it is because it is easier to avoid the truth or reality of what he had done. Or if it's because his family was related and had connections. Regardless, it is inexcusable and a complete lack of violation and safety of trust. According to David Pooler, a professor at Baylor University, churches will often mistreat survivors of abuse. They will blame the child for leading a holy man's astray as a means to minimize and downplay the situation. The spiritual manipulation and alienation from the church led me to a place where I felt it was my fault. My survival mindset and way of dealing with the situation was very black and white. When the abuse happened, I told myself, it won't affect me if I don't let it. And while it sounded so simple, it was so far from the truth. One's body can only be numb to a situation for so long until it begins to process it. For me, it was years that I unintentionally used emotional numbness as a coping mechanism to deal with the trauma. I would simply categorize people as good or bad, situations as safe or unsafe, not taking into account or consideration that the fact that not everything in life can be viewed in that black and white mindset. While it is not uncommon for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to develop a black and white way of thinking as a coping mechanism, this black and white mindset can be problematic and will often carry over from childhood into adulthood. I truly thought that once I made it into adulthood, I was safe, that the trauma was behind me and it would no longer to continue to make, take up unwelcome space in my mind, body, and soul. But I was wrong. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2011 as an intelligence analyst. I truly thought I had made it. I knew that this could open doors for me in my childhood dream of becoming an FBI agent. But my body kept the score. I did not understand how as an adult survivor, my body still revisited the traumatized mindset. I wanted to love and be loved, but the unhealed child part of myself was stuck. I couldn't understand how Intimacy would trigger memories of the past and leave my mind trapped in the fight or flight. As cited by some of the greatest pioneers in neurology and psychiatry, Sigmund Freud and Jean Martin Charcot, as much as sufferers want to forget whatever happened, their memories kept forcing themselves into consciousness, 
trapping themselves in an ever new present of existential horror. It was during my time in the Marines that I began my journey of understanding not only myself, but my trauma. Everything I thought I, I knew about life, my career, and future expectations for myself were far beyond the black and white, with there being no one right answer nor one correct path or solution. I remember as a kid reading this quote about how when you're a child, you have this whole image of what your life is supposed to look like and how life will never simply operate like that. I was so set on what I thought was my dream that I almost missed to making it to where I am today. Here, a mother, a graduate student in the social work program, a veteran, an amateur photographer, but most importantly, someone who is not afraid to stand up, someone who is not afraid to advocate for not only myself but others, and someone who can trust and listen to myself. According to Dr. Linda Meyer Williams, a graduate student of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania in the early 1970s, as long as a memory is inaccessible, the mind is unable to change it. But as soon as a story starts being told, particularly if it is told repeatedly, it changes. The act of telling changes the tale itself. Our minds cannot help make meaning of what it knows, and the meaning that we make of our lives changes how and what we remember. It has been far too long and far too many years that I've had to wear a blanket of shame. I'm here to encourage you today to tell your story to have those difficult conversations with your loved ones about childhood sexual abuse, and to cultivate courage to not only listen to survivors, but to transform the secrecies and shame surrounding childhood sexual abuse. A child's innocence is not destroyed from talking with them about childhood sexual abuse. I know that you're listening, but can you hear me? Our children's innocence is not destroyed from talking with them about childhood sexual abuse. It is destroyed from it happening to them. Thank you. That was powerful, was it not? I mean, thank you. <laughs> sometimes you come into these speeches and you don't know what you're going to hear, but that, that's inspiring, what you just said. I just want to make that very clear. Thank but you. my question for you is, you know, you're in the Marine Corps. Yes. You know, and, and the Marine Corps, and just military in general, it's a very you, strict deadline. You have to do this A to B to C. So my question is, what inspired you to come up here with all of your background, all of the history and the trauma you've had to go through? What made you be inspired to come up here today? especially someone who was a little nervous backstage to present something so powerful to these people today. I think I just, do we take, no, I think I just felt tired of feeling silenced and how there's so much like shame that I have associated with this. And a part of me, it's, it's like hard knowing that you're alone and I don't want other people to feel that. And also almost like putting some of the shame and blame back where it belongs, so I don't have to continue to feel that anymore. Well, Kayla, thank you so much for sharing your story today. One more round of applause for Kayla Robbins. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kayla, thank you so much for sharing your story today. All right, moving on to the next speaker. I'm excited about this one. Up next, we have Tony Hickson. He's the co-founder of Hickson Zerker Capital Management and an Amazon best-selling author. His speech today is entitled, Find Meaning, Live with Purpose, and Leave a Legacy, where he will touch on a tragic personal experience that led him to change the way he helps others plan for retirement. Please welcome to the stage, Tony Hickson. Still. 
cold. Gray. These are the words that describe that dreadful morning 12 years ago on this very day, March 22nd. The chill in the air was palpable, and the gray that winter had left behind had not yet lost its grip. My cell phone rang that morning, and it was my dad. Hey, Dad, I said. Tony, she's dead. Pam, Mom, she committed suicide. Immediately, my legs gave way as his words pierced my heart. The decision that day would change the course of history for me, for my kids, for my family, for my clients, and my career. Pamela Mae Hickson was born, or was graduated, as a registered nurse in 1971, quickly climbing through the healthcare ranks and starting as a, as a floor nurse, floor nurse at, a, at a local hospital. But the long hours and swing shift proved difficult as she raised her young family, including my, my sister and myself. She soon found a, a job as a home health nurse, offering more regular hours and a steady income. And it was there that she was first introduced to hospice. Within a short amount of time, she became the director of hospice at a local agency. It was her career and calling as an, a, hospi a, a hospice nurse that was her ultimate joy, her, her greatest calling, her significance, and her purpose. It was this career in hospice that led to the greatest career burnout I had ever seen. In the mid-2000s, electronic medical records, EMR, became a thing. And my mom, technologically challenged, found herself behind a desk more often than she was able to be bedside, caring for the terminally ill as they passed from this life to the next. Instead, administrative work, bureaucracy, and EMR became her begrudging focus. And suffering from relational and spiritual and emotional and career burnout, she wanted nothing more than to retire, to exit the rat race and enjoy a quiet life on the farm that my dad and her still lived on. So she ran the idea past her primary financial advisor, the idea of retiring, in which this advisor pulled out her credentialing experience in software and decided and came up with the fact that my mom and dad had enough money and gave her the green light to retire. And I was eight years into my career at the time, and she wanted to give me the opportunity to provide a second opinion. And I pulled out my credentialing, my experience, and my software, and I came up with the same result. Mom and dad had enough money, and I too gave her the green light to retire. And so she did. Retiring in the fall of 2010, Within a short amount of time, we knew something was wrong. The significance and purpose that she had felt in her career were now nowhere to be found. She knew exactly what she was retiring from, but had no idea what she was retiring to. My dad was still employed, working at the time. Her social connections that she had at the office were still at work, and she found herself bored and wandering. She had enough money to sleep at night, but not enough purpose to get up in the morning. And six months after retiring, she fell into a deep depression as her mental health spiraled downward. And on the, on the morning of March 22nd, 2011, my mom, Pam Hickson, chose to take her life. And the ripple effects of that decision were staggering. My dad, they were high school sweethearts, had no one to journey through life, the rest of life with. My sister and I, no mom, and my kids, her grandkids, would miss out on the blessing that their grandma would be to them as they grew up. And I, I was left to pick up the pieces. You see, I was one of the financial advisors that gave my mom the green light to retire, the very thing that led to her death. And I could have let, I felt an immense amount of guilt and shame, and I could have let that guilt define me, to ruin me. 
But I chose, by God's grace, to turn this tragedy into triumph and these stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And I learned the hard way that money is only a part of the equation. Meaning, purpose, living significance, and, and finding meaning in the second half is just as crucial. It's not near as important for the retiree to define what they're retiring from, but it's important that they do the hard work of understanding who they are apart from their career, to understand who they are and to discover what they're retiring to. I believe that our greatest victories are often found in life's transitions. The problem is these transitions can lead to stress and conflict and change. And retirement is a voluntary transition. And oftentimes, we've prepared financially, but we don't know how to continue a life of joy and purpose in our second half. And oftentimes, the retiree can feel a sense of loss and a feeling of being lost within the first few months of retirement. As for loss, they feel this as they experience a loss of structure and routine, a loss of a steady paycheck, a loss of significance or title or power that they may have had in their career, a loss of social, social connections that they once had at the office. As for lost, they feel this as they look forward into their future and they have no idea who they are, let alone what they want to do. But I believe that retirement can be one of the most beneficial, rewarding, and fulfilling times in our lives if we do the hard work of transitioning well. How is that possible, you ask? The statistics would show that over 40% of retirees will experience some sort of anxiety and depression within the first two years of retirement. Further research reveals that divorce rates spike within a short amount of time as marriages are tested from the career phase where there was a bit of healthy separation to now being together all the time. Well, it is possible. How? In a word, half the time. Half time, think of, uh, think of a football game. The teams go out in the first half and they play the game. And they go to the locker room at halftime. And they assess what happened and they come out and they come up with a game plan to come out in the second half and win the game. No one remembers the score at halftime. But victories often hang in the balance of a successful halftime. So what makes a successful halftime? I believe there are four main aspects. First, discover your values. What makes you unique? I believe each one of you were created on purpose for a purpose. You each have a unique set of skills and abilities and passions that other people don't have. This answers the question of who am I? And it creates a vision for your future. Next, once you decide what that vision is, I call it reorienting and repurposing. And you need to determine where you want to go. Perhaps it's volunteering at the local nonprofit. Perhaps it's starting a, a new business or working part time. Or it's taking a skill you currently have and using it in a new way. It's about putting traction to discovering who you are and making a bigger future for yourself. Once you've de decided where you're going to go, ask yourself, who's coming alongside me? This is about securing social connections. We were made for relationships. And oftentimes in retirement, it's important for us to re replace workmates with playmates. These could be kids, grandkids, or people that you meet at clubs, organizations, or churches. We were made for social connections, and securing them in your second half is crucial to a successful retirement. Last, I call leave a legacy. This answers the question, why is all this important? Well, it's important for a few reasons. The first of which, we want our life on earth to matter. We want to finish this race well. We don't want to look back with any regrets. Another reason is we want to help those who are left behind. 
But so often we think of leaving our legacy as uh, our estate planning documents. Well, I'm here today to say we don't have to wait until we're gone to start leaving our legacy. It can start today. Write that note to a loved one. Send that text to a grandkid. Document that story, that life lesson for the next generation to learn from. What gifts of your time, talents, and treasure can the next generation get from you today? Well, as you can see, I've learned a lot from my mom's tragedy. And in late 2019, I embarked on a journey to put her story and these learnings into book form. Little did I know in a few short months, March of 2020, COVID would hit and cause major disruptions in the markets and economy and the wealth management firm that I co-founded. All the while dealing with enforcing COVID policies, I was pecking away at my manuscript, concluding my 35,000 word manuscript in the fall of 2020. I submitted my manuscript to my publisher and it underwent its first round of edits called a developmental edit. I was assigned to a lead editor whom I immediately looked up on LinkedIn only to find that Lisa had a doctor of literary science from Harvard. Hmm, I thought this will be interesting. Five weeks later, I received my manuscript back. And perhaps you've used the track changes function in Microsoft Word. And if you have, you know that if there's a change, it turns it red. When I opened up my manuscript for the first time, I saw a sea of red. And I was devastated. Each page was littered with critique, and I wanted to stop. I wanted to give up. I invited my business partner, Adam, down to my office. I said, look what she's done. Being a good friend and business partner that he is, he looked at me and said, I understand. But you can't stop now. You wanted to honor your mom's legacy. Keep going. You can do it. Later that evening, I showed my wife, Carrie, look at what happened. Carrie saw the destruction. But she laid her hand on my shoulder, and she said, you can't stop now. I believe in you. And later that night, I shook my fist at God, and I said, how did you let this happen? I don't have time for this. Why? And I've never heard God speak audibly to me but in my spirit, I heard him say, Tony, I gave you a doctor of literary science from Harvard. You're welcome. And with that, my attitude changed. And I couldn't wait to get back to the office where I patiently and painstakingly combed through her edits. Around that time, February of 2021, I wanted to reconnect with a good friend and business mentor of mine who had retired about four months earlier. We met at a coffee shop, and I expected to hear stories of how his kids and travel and grandkids and his nonprofit passion points were filling his time. And instead, upon arrival, I saw a semblance of the man that I once knew. And after exchanging cordialities, I decided to try to dig a bit below the surface. I looked him in the eye, and I said, Joe, how's retirement treating you? And in a moment of vulnerability, Joe decided to be honest with me. And he looked at me and he said, Tony, not well. You see, I pre prepared financially. I met with my advisor and he gave me the green light. I have enough money. But life just feels so meaningless. I feel so lost. Need I remind you, I was midway through my edits at the time. To say that I knew my content was an understatement. And because Joe had opened his heart to me, I knew I needed to steward this moment well. I looked Joe in the eye and I said, have I ever told you the story of my mom? Later that afternoon, my wife Carrie came to town so we could do lunch. I couldn't wait to tell her about that more, what had happened that morning and the impact that mom's story and this content was having on others. And it was eight months before the book would even be published. 
already having an impact, a positive impact on others. And she was excited. And as providence would have it, at the very same time, I received a text from Joe. And far be it for me to be one of those married couples that stares at their phone the whole time as you eat lunch together. So I asked permission, may I, uh, can I check this text? It's from Joe. She said, absolutely, please do. And I opened the text, and tears began to flow. And the text read, Tony, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your mom's story. Whether you know it or not, today, you quite literally saved life. Ladies and gentlemen, my mom was a nurse. And as such, she cared for her patients well. And I'm a financial advisor, and as such, I care for my clients well. And this message and this platform provides me the opportunity to join my purpose with hers as we seek to help those who are transitioning into retirement to avoid the same mistakes and the mental health challenges that come from an unplanned retirement. Do the work. Money is only part of the equation. Take a half time. Make your future bigger than your past. And in retirement, in your second half, may you find meaning, live with purpose, and leave a legacy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for having me. How are you feeling? Uh, well, today's the day. It was uh, the 12 year anniversary of mom's death. So um, I'm emotional, but excited to be able to share the story and hopefully help others along the way. Well, I'm sure we can all agree in here that we all learned something from what you shared today. So thank you for being vulnerable, because that's a hard thing. Please, another round of applause for Tony. Thank you. Okay. So my question for you today is the, the title of your, your talk today is Find Meaning, Live With Purpose, and Leave a Legacy. Who is someone in your life that embodies that? Yeah, I have a good uh, friend and business mentor of mine. Um, his name is Scott Miller. He's actually uh, a life coach at our firm, and uh, he's been uh, a great um, mentor and friend of mine over the years that has really left a legacy for me and to the man that I am today. Well, thank you so much. Another round of applause for Tony, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Once again, what a wonderful speech. So far, we are off to a fantastic start in this second session. So one more round of applause for the speaker so far. And we're, we're not even done yet. We have a couple more great ones coming up. So we're going to shift gears a little bit now, and we're going to talk a little bit about tracking. Now, we all virtually in our pockets have a device that knows exactly where you are at nearly all times of the day. The power of tracking has developed into a technological phenomenon that can, it's, that can excite but also scare. But tracking where we are does not always have to be referred to a satellite up in space. Do we always know where we are in life? Do we always understand who or what is making sure we are on the path to success. A clear judgment for oneself of that idea is hard to concretely decipher, especially post-pandemic. So here next to the stage to present their next talk on how you can literally GPS your way to, su to success after the global pandemic shutdown, please welcome to the stage Dr. Kareem Ellis. start my talk today by asking you guys a very, very powerful question, and that's simply this. How clear is your vision? You heard me correctly. I said, how clear is your vision? You know, as a child growing up in Ohio, I was known by my peers for three things. Number one, I was super smart. So smart that I actually skipped a grade. I went from kindergarten to second grade, totally skipped over first grade. Number two, I was talkative. 
I routinely got in trouble from elementary school all the way through high school for talking too much. My teacher would move me at least three to four times a quarter because I would consistently interrupt her class. And number three, I was the kid that had eagle eye vision. That means my sight was absolutely flawless. This means I could see anything clearly from a great distance. Now, out of those three things that I was known for, I was proudest of number three on the list. That was my vision. You know, when walking home from football practice in the fourth grade, one of the worst things that could possibly happen to you was to get chased by an angry stray dog. Well, my sight was so good that I would routinely spot stray dogs from two blocks away. I would instruct my friends that we should jump a fence so that way we can stay safe all the way home. And when riding around with my dad in the back of his car in the days of MapQuest.com, I would be the eagle eye navigator, helping him to figure out which way to turn. And oftentimes, my eagle eye sight would spot the destined location literally from blocks away. On a side note, can you guys believe there's actually a moment in history where we printed out like 15 sheets of paper and traveled around to locations like pirates looking for a buried treasure? Unbelievable, right? So everyone around me relied on my eagle eye vision, unbeknownst to me that everything was going to radically change. You see, my 10th grade year, I decided to go out for the high school basketball team. And within one day of tryouts, I made the team. However, to be officially accepted, I still had one thing left to do. That was to obtain an up-to-date physical examination. Now, I was in great shape, so I knew I was going to pass that test with flying colors, but in the back of the exam, there's also a vision test. And for the first time in my life, Mr. Eagle Eye, the guy who can see it all from a distance, is about to be tested beyond his limits. Now, you guys are familiar with getting your eyes tested, right? You plop down in the chair, they would dim the lights back in the day, and this giant chart would pop up on the wall on the opposite side of the room. And the optometrist would begin to instruct you to read the chart from right to left with one of your eyes closed. Now, reading the chart, that wasn't a problem. I mean, the font size of the letters are like 60-inch font, right? I mean, who struggles with reading something like that? But things got a little dicey as we got to the middle. The font size of the letters felt like they were magically shrinking, and I knew by how hard I was beginning to squint that my chances of reading correctly were shrinking as well. So what do you think I did in this situation? I think I did what most people would do. I started randomly guessing letters and, and hope for a miracle. A, E, the I, the O, the U, and sometimes Y. There's a teacher in this room that's going to catch that in a second. But at that moment, the optometrist let out a sigh signaling that I was failing this test miserably. And as she turned on the lights, I got quiet in my chair. It took about 27 seconds for her to realize something was wrong. So she asked me, you don't want to wear, young, wear glasses, young man. My response was a resounding no. May I ask you why not? Because they make fun of kids in my grade to wear glasses, and everyone knows me because of my ability to see things at a great distance. And honestly, I I'm not ready to give that level of fame up. Oh, I see, she replied. Listen, young man, there are three things I need you to understand before you leave here today. Number one, change is constant. And there's nothing you're going to be able to do about that. Number two, you always have options. Listen, you don't have to wear glasses if you don't want to. You can opt for contact lenses, and when you turn 18, you can do LASIK surgery. And number three, my job is to send you out into this world with perfect vision. Now, I'll pause for a second, because I believe that the quality of the question determines the quality of the result. So I have to ask her, what is perfect vision? She replied, perfect vision is 20-20. It's the best vision a human being can get. So I have a question for you guys today. How clear is your vision. You know, three years ago, we successfully made it through one of the most horrific times in history on planet Earth. I'm talking about that hell year known as 2020. Ironically, I tell most people that this was the year of perfect vision, 2020, 2020. You see, right up to December 31st, 2019, people from all over the world were celebrating the coming of a new year. People were screaming, new year, new me, planning their goals, their dreams, without knowing that once we cross that 2020 threshold, COVID-19 would literally change our way of life. It took a virus out of control that we didn't understand alongside of a three-month government-mandated shutdown to change life as we know it. And believe it or not, we're still recovering from the global pandemic shutdown. You know, for the first time in a long time, we were forced to look at certain aspects of our life and realize that we were approaching things with astigmatism. Some of us were far-sighted with our thoughts. Some of us were near-sighted with our thoughts. You know, there are a bunch of things I thought prior to 2020 that I only saw clearly when I realized how far-sighted and near-sighted I was on certain topics. So 2020 was the year I was forced to get clear about my goals, my dreams, my aspirations, and most importantly, my vision. So how have you been affected since the shutdown? You know, when it comes to the pursuit of your goals and your dreams, your passion and your purpose, 
I want to spend the rest of my time here today going over five ways you can still get what you desire out of life post-pandemic with a philosophy I call GPSing your way to success. So how does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. The reason why I chose a GPS for this analogy is that I firmly believe a GPS is a vision machine. That means you give it an address, and the GPS's sole mission is to take you wherever you want to go. So number one, we got to set an address. This is a choice we make. If our lives truly mirror a GPS, then a GPS is useless unless we decide where we want to go, but our lives become super effective when we understand where we're trying to get to, this means it is your responsibility, not your mom's, not your dad's, not your grandma, not your grandpa, not your favorite teacher. The responsibility belongs solely up to you. So where do you want to go in this thing called life? You see, when we get clear on the destination, we also get clear on the resources that we're going to need to make the trip. This means that I need to be selective over resources such as my money, my time, my education, my friendships, my mentorships, and most importantly, my habits. Because all these things, if I'm intentional, not accidental, can help me arrive at my desired destination much quicker and much faster. Guys, it only took me 26 years to figure this out, but knowing it allowed me to create two successful businesses and a 100% completely debt-free lifestyle. Number two, we must learn to move with clarity over confusion. Now, I've, I've, I've never seen this, guys. I've never seen a confused GPS. You know, I, I give a GPS an address, and this job is to provide me with crystal clear instructions that can be followed to the letter. Why? Because it's hard to get to your destination if your instructions are confusing. So when it comes to what you want in life, in college and after you graduate and leave here, can you see your fantastic future with clarity or are you operating in a state of confusion? You know, one of the things that helped me tremendously was knowing the power behind programming the subconscious mind. Your mind, believe it or not, works pretty much like a computer. That means whatever program you feed your mind on a daily basis, it's jobs to take that and produce results for better or for worse. This is why it's so important to spend time feeding our mind what we want instead of what we don't want. Every single day your mind is being programmed, from the shows you watch to the commercials you see to the conversations you have. And over time, if you're not careful, you end up acting on these thoughts. You know, mega corporations spend upwards of $5 million to run a 60-second ad on Super Bowl Sunday every year because they know they can program your results based on what you see on a regular basis. So why are we not doing the same? I mean, why are we not getting up every day intentionally subjecting our minds to the things we desire? Because right now, you're living your best life by default or design, but that task is solely up to you. So get clear about what you want and surround yourself with people, places, and things that will help you to make your goals and dreams your reality. And number three, we've got to stay connected and dodge the dead zones. You know, for my GPS to work, I need to continuously maintain a strong Wi-Fi connection. As long as that connection is strong, my GPS can take me anywhere I want to go. However, there are pockets of the city that I call dead zones. You know, when you hit a dead zone, you temporarily lose your signal, and if you're not careful, you can end up losing your way. So do you have a strong signal currently, or are you hanging outside a dead zone? How do you maintain a strong signal? You know, for me, I choose to stay intentionally connected to mentors and friends and family members that uplift me. I choose to remain connected to like-minded people. You know, they say birds of a feather flock together. So I stay connected to the right education and organizations that I know can help me arrive at my point of destination. But I must be aware of the dead zones in my life. Sometimes those dead zones can be toxic family, friends, and even coworkers. And at times, it could be my own limited belief system or the doubts that creep up when I walk into scary, unfamiliar territory. You know, when I enter a dead zone, I feel stagnant, so it's imperative that I find my way back to a place where I can create a strong signal. Number four, we got to be willing to recalculate. There's been several occasions where I gave my GPS an address, gassed up the car, got on the road because I was distracted, messed around, and missed my turn. There's even been occasions where I was following the GPS instructions to the letter, only to realize a car accident or a road closure kept me from moving forward. You know, whenever this happens, my GPS doesn't beat me up and call me names. It doesn't instruct me to go back home. It focuses on the original address provided at the beginning of the journey and immediately begins to recalculate as many alternative routes as possible that can get me there. It never gives up on the assignment. You know, the global pandemic changed a lot of how we do business. It affected everything without our permission. But that doesn't mean that you must give up on your goals and your dreams. Are you willing to recalculate along the way? Do you understand there's always more than one way to arrive at your fantastic finish line? You know, I love what Bruce Lee said. He said to be formless like water. If you pour water inside of a cup, it takes on the shape of the cup. 
He means that water will adapt to its environment. And for you to escape Murphy's Law, which says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong at that one inopportune point in time, you too, my friend, must learn to become formless. And you must believe in the ability to recalculate why. Because there's always more than one way to make it to your fantastic finish line. And number five, we must check the history log. Now, an old friend of mine got caught cheating on a significant other many years ago. And you guys will never guess how this happened. It wasn't racy text messages. He didn't get caught smelling like her perfume. He didn't get caught sliding into the DMs. He got caught via the GPS. You see, he had been messing around with said mistress for roughly about three months. And one day while his wife was driving his car, she accessed the GPS, looked into the history log, and found a bunch of addresses there that she wasn't familiar with. Now, what type of addresses, I'm sure you're asking? Well, there were some addresses to some expensive five-star restaurants that the wife had never been to. There were some addresses to some fun date night places that she also had never been to. And if you haven't figured it out by now, there were some rather pricey hotel addresses that popped up in the GPS history log that she definitely had never been to. Now, I'm not telling you this story so that all the women in the room can leave out here saying I heard this great, fantastic speaker by the name of Dr. Kareem, and he taught me how to catch my man cheating 101. That is not a class. That's not a syllabus on this campus. But the reason why we're going to wind down our story on this point right here is simply this. If I were to walk off this stage and go person to person, chair to chair, for those of you watching by video, step into your living room and ask you for your life's GPS, just so I can take a look at the history log, would I find that you're guilty of cheating on your goals and dreams because you're spending all this time chasing everybody else's agenda? You know, as you move to your current stage of this journey, be clear about the addresses that get reflected in your life's history log. Because where our focus goes, our energy flows. And we want to be sure that we're giving birth to all the right things. Why? Because the addresses we input in our life's GPS will always determine our destination. You know, guys, if you can apply these five principles I've given you on a regular basis, you should have no problem hearing these powerful words. You have arrived at your destination. My name is Dr. Kareem Ellis. They call me the number one breakthrough strategist. I want to thank the TEDx community for coming out today. And remember, together with clear vision, we can all GPS our way to success. Thank you. I have, yes. Dr. Ellis, I got to tell you, your energy is like a cup of coffee in the morning. I, it is just <laughs> infectious. My goodness. No pun intended when you're talking about the pandemic, though. So anyway. Let me ask you this question, Dr. Sure. Ellis. Uh, you know, you said you had two businesses and you're debt-free. Yes. And every business owner was affected significantly mm -hmm. by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How did you use those principles in your own personal business to make sure that you were able to get out of this pandemic as we're still kind of getting through it and still be as successful as you were pre-pandemic? Absolutely. So number one, the address was always put inside the GPS. I knew what both of my business were supposed to do, so the vision was clear, right? I was moving with clarity the whole time, so just because situations change doesn't mean that the business necessarily has to go bottom up. We just have to figure out how do we solve the problems needed in that day and age versus what everyone else was doing, which is trying to stick to the old models and methods that doesn't want to work. And then the most important principle we use that we talked about today was that recalculation, which is always figuring out there's more than one way to make it to our fantastic finish line. I believe that more businesses thrived during the global pandemic because they were forced to change. And those that didn't want to change are the ones that we say goodbye to in this season. So we always have to remember to be adaptable and understand there's more than one way to make it to our fantastic finish line. Well, I hope you take his advice to heart and use it. If you're going to be a future business owner, if you are a business owner, use these five tips. One more round of applause for Dr. Kareem Ellis. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. Okay. We are coming to the last speaker of our Growth for the Public Goods session today. She's a real treat. I'm really excited for you guys to hear what she has to say today. She also, major round of applause at the end because she has traveled a long way to come here. She'll tell you about it, I'm sure, with some point throughout her speech today. But I'm talking about Sri Nakade. She's been working as a design build engineer with Kiwit Engineering since 2022. She's an architect, has a master's degree in construction management. She's a member of Technical Institute of America and Architecture in India. 
She's busy right now working on the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority Rehab and the Champlain Hudson Power Express Project. Busy lady, to say the least. So please give a warm welcome to her with her speech today called entitled Chicks with Bricks, Women in Construction, Shri Nakade. I was very excited to come to the States for my higher education. It was mandatory to have flu shot that year for everyone who came across from other countries so that you can get used to this weather. Thus, my initial experience in US involved with the nurse administrating the flu shot to me. She asked me, what's your name? And I said, Bhagyashri. And she said, what? And I said, Bhagyashri. And she made a weird face and said, what about last name? And I replied, Nakade. She thought I said naked and replied out loud to me and said, Miss Naked, please follow me. And this is how I began my journey in the United States. Aside from my studies, now I had two tasks to do. One was to find a scholarship and other to educate people how to pronounce my name. Believe me, I did not give up on my identity, but I was always welcoming to all these challenges coming on my way. Hello, everyone. I go by Shri Nakade and started my career right here like most of you. I graduated with master's in construction management degree in 2018 from Bowling Green State University. I have been passionate about design and construction ever since then. My affinity for building and their design began at a very early age. As a child, I was fascinated by birds' nests in my backyard, always thinking how they have made it. How did they manage the whole process within time? I always believed that there is something extraordinary in them that enables them to understand the intricacies and complexities involving in those constructing those nests. I want to know how those birds communicate with each other and make this happen every season. There is a sense of compassion and understanding behind this, which drives them to accomplish this as a project. I was always wanted to explore those extraordinary talents that enables me to understand and fantasize people and feel the way I felt in my childhood. So I joined architecture as my first brick to build my nest. Seeing different type of nest from other birds and their constructability shows the number of possibility such a simple thing has. Just like various construction projects, we have list of disciplines to focus on. Our industry is vast, and so the jargons of our industry is even extensive. Just imagine, you are passing by these fancy structures. Now think about its architect and construction manager. How many of you picture of women? These are all designed by architect Zaha Hadid. So let's break the stereotype that most of us have here by starting with how my everyday looks like here, right? I work in the railroad and infrastructure engineering industry. My previous job had, I had to be on the job site every day at 6 a.m. in Boston, Massachusetts which means that I would wake up at 4 a.m. every day since I had an hour drive to reach to my job site. It does not snow where I live in India. And driving in snow on a black ice at 5 a.m. was scary for me, especially because it was a brand new car and all, everything was paid by myself. I used to work with the crew, my crew members on updating the retrofit electrical houses. 
for those who do not know, what are those? Those are the small, teeny houses which are across the railway tracks, which feeds the electricity to the track. So every day as the rail progresses, we change our job site to our next, next hut. I take construction job site as an adventure. Yes, it's a party every day at job site. We are all have, are treated equally, and there's one time bomb always ticking on us as a deadline. We all are in the same mission and with a limited amount of money. Having a period or going to the bathroom on these remote job sites was very challenging to me in the beginning. But since I had a great team, they used to fill my position for a while and respected my needs. I started my career as an estimator with a reputed construction company in Miami, South Florida. My first job involved estimating cost of a building by analyzing the area and performing a takeoff. Now, this is not a plane takeoff. This means that we estimate the building material using specialized softwares and giving estimated cost to our client. I was very excited about my job, as it allowed me to work on multiple projects, visit different sites, and work in these fancy offices with all my exp expenses covered. I felt like I'm living in my dream. However, my promotion came with an offer to relocate me on a, onto a job site where my team interviewed me for a project involving a well-known entertainment company located in Orlando. My manager said exactly these words to me. You are not the first American, Hispanic, or Asian. You are the only female here we hired on this job site. Now, I, would be, I was being very uncertain whether to feel intimidated or proud. I supported my team with all my American estimating experience and my Indian negotiating skills. Since we were going through a lot of changes that year during pandemic, I always felt safe and never experienced any harassment onto the job sites. And soon we became family in no time. Additionally, I received trainings like CPR, first aid, and self-defense techniques from our safety manager, who was previously served as a police officer. However, my friend in a parallel universe was also the only female on her job site. She was working with an equipment rental company and faced struggles with male crew members. One time, she fell off the equipment and her colleagues laughed at her. She was really upset when she called me. However, she persisted and addressed this issue in a meeting, impressing everybody with her tenacity. Her manager also supported her and offered her to teach anything that she wanted to learn from that point onwards. By the end of the project, she became a superstar, and everyone wanted to see her with her non-giving up attitude. I was blown away from all the narrow thinking about who can perform well in this industry and deny all the myths and tradition, traditional gender stereotype that we have reading all these years on the internet. So how do we fit in this macho industry? According to Dozer, an equipment rental company reports that the gender pay gap is really small in construction jobs. McKinsey Co., a global management consulting firm, has found that the construction companies with more women in executive roles perform better than those without. These suggest that women make significant contribution to these companies. And now more companies have positions available for them. The same reports also indicates that company with gender diversity are 25% more profitable. 
Additionally, a study published in BMC Psychology on multitasking shows that women outperform men in multitasking scenarios. Same study also suggests that men are slower and less organized when it comes to switching between the tasks as compared to women. Sometimes I feel very powerful, yet scared, because I'm building with someone's lifetime hardened money. And now I know that their hopes and dreams, everything is in my hand. We are not just drawing buildings and infrastructure here, but also contributing to country's economy. I'm presently employed with a large scale construction company ranked top third as per construction engineering news record for 2022. Our company has a significant number of women in senior and team leadership positions. Interestingly, my direct supervisor is a woman too. And all the projects that I'm currently working on are headed by exceptionally capable women. This represents a new beginning a positive shift in this industry. I see these women leaders displace empathy and understanding towards our team, resulting more collaborative work in the environment, which ultimately benefit, benefits the company. Every year, 500,000 individuals apply to come to United States, but only 80,000 are granted a visa for their higher education. Of these, only 30 to 35% are women, and very few want to explore their career in this particular industry. So I'm hoping that you could think about what a proper education and experience could do to this multi-billion dollar industry. So let me ask you a question here. If you are willing to shape the future of millions of people, where would you place your first brick? Chicks with Bricks is an initiative in London that promotes female talent that helps disadvantaged girls and young women to gain experience in construction by Holly Potter. In my case, Bird's Nest inspired me. I hope you find your inspiration one day too. And no matter where, what career path you go or choose, at the end of the day, it's you that matters. So one day, if someone asked me, what am I doing here in construction? I would just say, I was born for this. Thank you, everyone. I love that last sentence. So moral of the story, folks, uh, don't mess with Shri, because she'll take you down. <laughs> hands down. So I have a couple questions for you. So you gave me just a brief, a quick story on, you, first off, you're traveling here. Yeah. Can you tell, tell the folks in the audience what that's looked like over the last uh, three days? It was horrible. Uh, I, tra <laughs> I, travel, I was traveling via Paris, and I just realized that Paris um, declared their national emergency. So all the flights were diverted. And I'm traveling from India um, just here, just for this event. And then I, of course, I'm working in Virginia office, so I'm going to be flying back. But uh, it was really a long flight. <laughs> so you know where you'll find Shri after this, taking a nap. <laughs> so, so you're our last speaker for today. And, and this is about growth for the public good. A lot of what we heard today, you touched on it. All of our speakers in this section talked on it. Finding your purpose, setting your goals, finding your why is really going to set you up for success in growth, seeing yourself grow. You have a lot of college students listening either over live stream or, or in the audience today. What would you say to a, a college student, but especially a female college student who's really struggling finding their purpose, finding their why, and struggling trying to wonder, will I be successful in this field I'm, I'm reaching after? Sure. Um, I think this is a very um, interesting thing with, where we have a gender stereotype where all of us are thinking that construction is not for women. I don't know why. 
But if you go back and do your research, you will see and you'll be surprised that there are a lot of positions and it's a well-paid job. And it's not like I have to be there on the job site every day. Now I don't. I be, I be in the office and I work 24 seven in the office. I go to the job site sometimes, <laughs> but it's not that hard, you know? So I just wanna encourage everybody to, um, to just explore this um, if that interests you. Well, thank you so much. You thank did you. conclude our growth for the public good. So give a big round of applause to Shri. Big round of applause to all of our speakers today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, like Claire just said, that concludes our growth for the public good section. I hope you all feel encouraged and inspired to go forth and grow in your own way in an effort to create a public good. We encourage you all to join us for our next session, which will start at about 1240. In the meantime, you can join us in the TEDx BJSU Community Hub located in the multi-purpose room just down the hallway on the other side of the mezzanine. Here, you'll have an opportunity to engage with the speakers, stop by the pop-up bookstore, and participate in the community art pieces. In our next session, like I just said, we'll start at around 1240. All right, thank you so much.
All right. Well, welcome back. If you are a returning listener, and if you're a first-time listener, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Iwanek. And I'm Claire Mitchell. And we are the MCs for today's TEDx event. And we are both the co-news anchors for BG24, which is the newscast program within BG Falcon Media. And we're really excited to welcome you for this third session here, talking about community for the public good. Yeah, so like you said, community for the public good. This is going to be our third session for today. Um, something we just emphasize, please do not leave in the middle of a speech. Um, please turn your phones off if you can, just for the respect of the speech, the speeches, the speakers, I should say. Um, and hooting and hollering is encouraged. It is really scary standing up here. I know it's a small stage, but these speakers have taken a lot of time, a lot of hard work to put these speeches together, and it would be a little scary if everybody was just silent. So try and liven up the room. We'll be good. We're very excited. Good lineup today, right? Abs absolutely. This session, we're going to have four speakers, and we're all talking about community for the public good. So I want to talk a little bit about community. And community, to me, is the sum of the parts that individually play their own role in creating a better place for everyone. You know, it's whether it's a wide receiver catching a pass from the quarterback, if it's the teacher helping the student understand some concepts on a test, or if it's the mother up giving a hug to their upset child. We all have parts in our own unique community that allow ourselves to see how vast the world around us really is and helps us on our life, our journey to a better life. And we all need each other, but sometimes we don't always realize that. You know, so I want you to think about that question as we're going into our first speaker. So here to start off this session is Tamara Norris, the Vice President of Workforce Development at Cherry Street Mission Ministries in Toledo with her talk on Does Doing Good Really Do Good? So please welcome to the stage, Tamara Norris. A few years ago, I had an opportunity to attend a workforce training conference in San Francisco. And I was super excited about getting to go, first because I'd never been to this beautiful city, and second because I was going to have a chance to be in networking and relationship with my peers from across the country. So as I was walking around down by Fisherman's Wharf, I uh, was approached by what I assumed to be a homeless woman who asked me for cash. Now, I didn't have very much on me at the time, so I pulled out a little bit of what I had and handed it to her. She took it, looked at it, looked at me, and said, is that all? Then she turned and walked away. That interaction has stuck with me to this day. Something just felt off about it. And in case you're wondering, yes, she did keep the cash. You see, the problem was I didn't offer her what she wanted, nor did I understand or ultimately offer her what she needed. And again, it just felt off to me. So it wasn't until a few years after that event that I started reading books like Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton and When Helping Hurts by Corbett and Fickert. And I began to rethink my own role in helping others. And these points were echoed for me as I prepared to leave for my first mission trip. There was a group of us from our church that were going to Appalachia. And my mentor at the church um, took me aside and reminded me that the mission trip was more than just about getting tasks done. It was about being in relationship with the people that we would be serving. So as my team prepared to build a shed on a widow's property, they got together and they were discussing the design of the roof and what it should look like. But I stepped off to the side for a moment and sat down with her on her porch. And she told me about her deceased husband and his military service. And we played with her dogs. And we just had really good conversation. You see, the shed was something that she wanted. The conversation and the time spent was something that she needed. So my talk today is going to be looking at the difference and, and talking a little bit about the disparity between wants and needs and how, until we form a relationship with somebody, that we won't necessarily know what those needs are. In our opportunity um, to look at this, that sometimes, by not knowing that, when our attempt to help actually doesn't do any good at all. And yeah, I said it. Sometimes when we try to do good, it actually doesn't do any good. Um, and why is this important? Well, there was a study from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that reflected 
uh, approximately 1 billion volunteers worldwide. And on average in the United States, we spend about 52 hours per year volunteering our time. In fact, as I look around the room today, I am willing to bet that there are many of you who have recently given of your time, talent, or treasures to help someone else out. And what I'd like for us to do for a moment is to rest in that. Think about a time recently when you volunteered either on your own or as part of a group to help someone else out. And if you would, just close your eyes and, and picture yourself in that moment. Picture what you were doing. And as you think about what you're doing, turn your attention now to the person or the people that you were helping. What do you see on their faces? Do you see gratitude, shame, joy, appreciation? And now turn your thoughts inward for a moment, if you would, and focus on the emotions that you're feeling in those moments. Are you feeling blessed? Outraged, happy, or at peace? Hold on to those for a few moments and please open your eyes again. In those scenarios that we've been thinking through, there's no right or wrong answers or emotions to be felt. Both you as well as the person receiving the assistance had something to gain from that transaction. And let's ramp this up a little bit. Let's consider you as individuals within a community-minded organization. Now, when I talk about community-minded organization, these are companies or organizations that have espoused values or mission statements around doing good in the community. They organize community service days where they give the employees a day off and they can go out and work in the community, or they form project teams and partner with local nonprofits. And by their sheer numbers, they have great opportunity to do good or not so. A 2019 story out of Tacoma, Washington um, reported that the Northwest Goodwill indicated that year it was going to cost them $1.2 million to dispose of donations that they received but they could not use. Things like air conditioners and propane tanks and mattresses are examples of donations that they receive that they are unable to repurpose or resell. And what's the net impact? that's $1.2 million less for them to invest in programming or education in their community. So before we go to help, let's step back for a moment and assess the help that is needed. The level of outreach that is needed when somebody has been involved in a tornado or a hurricane is very different than what is needed by someone who has been in generational poverty. Picture, if you would, the person that you pass on the street corner each day who's asking for money. Handing them cash is a crisis level response. It satisfies a want for today, but most likely tomorrow they'll be back. Because we are, without being in relationship with that person, we're ne never able to identify the need, whether it be secure housing, stable income, or mental health assistance. When we examine and think about what is a way to be helpful, I pulled on the work by Lupton and came up with this idea of a community outreach continuum. So as the community-minded organization is determining what's the best way to help in their community, they need to look at what is wanted or what's going on there. Let's uh, frame this in an example of a family who maybe has no insurance and recently experienced a fire. At the crisis level is the day that the fire happened and maybe a couple of days after. So the types of help they need are very different than several weeks later when we move into transition. So the transition may be when that family is ready to start rebuilding. The family could even potentially come alongside and be partners in that rebuild. And then finally, we look at the bigger picture of community development. So as the community-minded organization taps in to help, what can we do to the bigger picture? Could they work together in that community to establish, let's say, a benevolence fund in case of future emergencies? Or potentially, could they work with the city to determine if there was adequate number of fire hydrants in that area? So as we think through of a community-minded organization that wants to help, 
I began to think, too, of how do they choose which people from their organization to help? Could they be intentional in their leadership development as part of this outreach? So I drafted this idea of a leadership development continuum. The idea that brand new people within an organization can come in on these projects as team members. As they develop their experience over time, they would then become team leaders. And then ultimately, they would bring projects to the, to the uh, organization and look at leading those that they have brought forward. So given these two continuums, wouldn't it be awesome if a community-minded organization had some kind of grid where they could just say, how do we plug in to our community with our appropriate leaders? Well, I'd like to propose just that. This grid gives us an idea of where we could slot folks in. It intersects the community outreach continuum along with the leadership development continuum. And I want to use an example of a community-minded organization who would be interested in partnering, let's say, oh, with a shelter that assists people experiencing homelessness. A crisis responder might be someone from that community-minded organization who gathers up clothing from a clothing drive that they held and takes it down to the shelter. And while they're there, they take a tour so they can learn more about the inner workings of the shelter and working with that population. The crisis response leader is probably the person who organized the drive. They communicated with the shelter ahead of time to determine what the needs are and then share that information within the organization. The community champion is someone who is familiar with what the shelter does and they are going to be a team member as we ramp up our efforts in outreach with that shelter. And then finally, the community builder. This is a well-developed leader who's also very familiar with the workings of the shelter. So they may serve as a liaison between the two organizations or possibly even become a board member of that organization. So I'd like to circle back to my trip to San Francisco. What if the organization that planned that conference had deployed such an effort? How would that maybe have looked different? Well, as a new member of that organization, I would be a crisis responder. So they could have communicated with me what kind of things that Bay Area shelters need, and I could have brought or purchased those on my trip. The boots on the ground leaders would have been the ones that communicated with those Bay Area shelters to do the needs determination and then share that information with those that would be attending. And finally, at our community builder level, the leadership of the organization that held this conference, I envision them planning a round table where they invite in leadership from the various Bay Area shelters and they could talk about the intersectionality between workforce development and poverty, poverty alleviation. So I would challenge our community-minded leaders as we begin to think about projects. Look at it from the lens of what is the best way to intersect with our community? At the same time, what is the best way to develop our leaders? And in doing so, we would have an opportunity to do more good than harm in that community. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. First of all, how are you feeling now that the TED Talk is done? <sighs> it's, it's really, I can read yeah, now, yes. <laughs> that's been a common theme. A lot of our speakers, look, they, they put in a lot of work to get these done. And it, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and talk about a passionate topic like this. So really, it's a testament to you. Now, i got to ask you, just a, a little personal question here. What made you want to be involved? I know you're the vice president of Cherry Street. What, what made you want to be involved in this line of work and really want to help people as a, as a job? It's, um, it's something that I've been involved with. Actually, I came from academia and uh, had an opportunity to be involved in a workforce project at Cherry Street. And it was something that tugged at my heart. There was a time in my life that I myself was in poverty and um, relied on the goodness of uh, family and friends to, to help me through. So it just really um, something that spoke to me. So when this opportunity came up to um, do the work in space at Cherry Street, it just seemed like a natural fit. And so here I am a year later, still doing the thing that I love. And I definitely know that Cherry Street does a lot of great work in the upper Toledo, you know, Toledo community and also Northwest Ohio. So one more round of applause for Tamara Norris. <laughs> Thanks so much.
All right. Thank you, Tamara. Moving on now to our second speaker for Community for the Public Good, uh, Mr. Jacob Joseph. He's a fourth year student here at Bowling Green State University, pursuing degrees in both business administration and jazz studies. He's even the president of the Student Jazz Association and the first chair tenor saxophonist in both the BGSU Lab Band One and BGSU Chamber Jazz Ensembles. His speech today is titled Music, and followership, which shares his unique perspective on music and how others interpret and appreciate music. So please welcome to the BGSU TEDx stage, or TEDx BGSU stage, I should say, Mr. Jacob Joseph. Why do you listen to music? It's known as a universal language, however, everyone has a slightly different interpretation of what they're listening to and what it is within the music that they find to be valuable. If you were to share what you find to be valuable inside a melody with others, what can this do for you? I've been pursuing a degree in jazz studies for the last three years, and in that time I've made some observations as it pertains to music making with others. In a jazz combo, there are many different permutations of instruments, but there's often a soloist, perhaps a singer and or a horn player, and typically a pianist, a bassist, and a drummer. Improvisation is a fundamental aspect of jazz, where melodic and harmonic decisions are made by the musicians on the spot. When a saxophonist is playing an improvised solo, it is the responsibility of the rest of the ensemble to follow with a response that they feel is appropriate to them in the moment to communicate through certain notes, rhythms, articulations, or just playing loud or soft. In music making with others, one musician's decision, good or bad, causes the other musicians to follow with a response that they feel to be appropriate in that moment. This develops music overall, enhancing an ensemble sound to be far more engaging and intriguing than if the musicians chose not to communicate with one another. As a result of this communication, the musicians learn more about each other's habits, decision-making, personalities, and other idiosyncrasies that might not be easily communicated by word of mouth. When the musicians of a jazz combo get together multiple times to play a song, they can leverage this information in order to draw hypotheses about what decisions each musician might make each time that they play the song. For instance, you could say I'm a little biased towards one of these instruments, but let's say, oh, I don't know, a saxophonist chooses to play the same riff, the same series of notes and rhythms to start every solo that they play. When the saxophonist goes to play a solo in the future, the pianist could make the spontaneous decision to play a complementing part to the saxophonist riff, or the drummer could allude to the riff by outlining the rhythms and dynamics that the saxophonist uses. The ways in which the pianist and the drummer choose to complement the saxophonist communicates how they would respond in this scenario. And with more collaborative performing and communication through their musical vernacular, the quality of the music is better and the musicians learn more about each other's tendencies. But not everyone in the world is an instrumentalist, is a member of a jazz group, or enjoys making analogies to jazz saxophone. While I do believe Learning to play an instrument is a great way of understanding many facets of life. I don't think you necessarily need to be a jazz musician in order to enhance the music and the ensembles within your life. When you listen to music, you could be experiencing a myriad of emotions, frustration, excitement, ambition, or just passively listening as you're doing something. But almost always, the music that you listen to serves as a reflection of how you're feeling. And it could be anything within the music that resonates with you. The lyrics, the beat, the instruments, the artists, etc. If there's a certain identifiable aspect of the music that makes you think, I like what I'm listening to, you should take note of this, as this is an empowerful piece of information that can improve who you are and tells you how you can better function with other people. So one of my roommates and I, we were driving back from a grocery store and he told me to listen to a few songs from an album that he found to be interesting. So I said, okay, we listened to a few of the songs. 
We got to one of them, and I couldn't help but laugh because it was so different from the other songs in the album. And the singer sounded like they were really straining to sing some low, gravelly notes. The general tone of the lyrics were a bit more serious, so my laughing definitely seemed a bit out of place, and perhaps I may have come off as rude or offensive because of this. I decided to be vulnerable with my emotions and to share why I felt this way, and my roommate actually felt similar to me. Because of this, we were able to share a conversation about what we felt towards the music. We both learned more about what we value in listening to music. We developed a better understanding of each other. And of course, through this moment of vulnerability, we strengthened our relationship. And of course, now we can share a laugh about the low, gravelly notes in that song. A concept that I find to be highly relevant to my roommate and I's interaction, and my experience as a jazz musician, is the idea of followership. This is the reciprocal practice to leadership, which refers to one's ability or willingness to follow within a team. When the saxophonist plays the same riff at the beginning of every solo and the ensemble responds to it, the ensemble uses followership as a way of making the music better. When my roommate and I are listening to music in the car, we're using our individual listening or our followership of the music in order to generate conversation thus further improving our relationship. While I do believe both the saxophonist and the gravelly singer serve as effective leaders in these example situations, it is the followership of everyone else that makes it possible for them to take what they're given and to turn it into something valuable. But it'd be wrong to say that both of these situations were successful without a few other concepts to complement followership as well. These include willingness, Active listening, encourage. So for willingness, when you're sharing music, sharing a workplace, or even a community with other people, you must have the willingness to submit yourself to what a situation presents and to decide your emotions towards it. Without this, it's much harder to accept an environment for what it is and to make progress as an ensemble or with the people around you in your place of work, family, school, or whatever groups you might be a member of. With active listening, through engaging and actively listening to a music or what others have to say, you can draw more connections and conclusions about how you feel towards a situation. This awareness serves as a vehicle for what actions are necessary in order to better serve yourself and your groups. And finally, with courage. It certainly takes courage to do these things in the lens of a follower to have the courage to play the solo in your life, whether it's thoughtfully responding to someone in a, in a class or an important meeting. Sharing your opinion on a topic requires for you to be vulnerable and to openly express your emotions. Accepting how you feel and conjuring the willingness to share your thoughts, regardless of how others may think of you, certainly takes courage, but it is imperative for serving the greater good. With these concepts together, you can be a more effective follower in what you do. So with this, I encourage you to do two things. Find a song that you enjoy and to share it with someone. By listening to the music, know that you are following what the music has to provide. Thinking about what this music does for you, whether it supplies you with some sort of feeling or you think it has something that others should hear. This gives you the chance to start a conversation with others. By starting a conversation, you are vulnerable with your feelings, which can greatly improve your relationships foster effective communication skills, tune your active listening ear, and serve as a method for developing maturity and confidence. This can come in many shapes and sizes, but even just thinking about what the music does for you and what it provides you can certainly go a long way. And if someone approaches you with what they like about a certain song or are sharing something important from their life, for you to be actively listening and to be willing to follow them is crucial. With whatever music, might be in your life. Do what you can to seek out the opportunities where you can challenge yourself to be an effective follower and share it with someone as this helps yourself, your peers, and the community at large. Thank you for listening. All right. Got some whoops. How about that? Whoops. I heard it from this from this table right here, especially. Yeah.
Who is that sitting there? Uh, my mom, my dad, a friend from out of town, and another friend. So. What does that mean to have them here listening to you today? <sighs> it means the world. Yeah. Having them uh, and being able to share this opportunity was invaluable. So certainly a, a great time to have them here. So. It was invaluable to the rest of us, too. I certainly learned a lot. I thought I knew a thing or two about music. Not. Really, after that. <laughs> okay, so a couple questions for you. Sure. Just out of pure curiosity, outside of jazz, what are you listening to on those car rides? What's your favorite kind of music to listen to? Ooh, only can pick one I, or thanks, two. Thanks to my mother, I grew up with like 80s and 90s rock. <laughs> so I, it was a lot of Billy Squire um, and, uh, and the Queen. So. Ah. So. Good pick. I wasn't expecting yeah. you to say that, I'll be honest, but good Certainly. pick. Yeah. Um, so you are got two degrees, business administration and jazz studies. Future plans for you. What's next for Jacob Joseph, huh? I think it'd be really nice to travel internationally. I think it'd be great to, to discover cultures beyond just around Ohio and learning more about uh, Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's to be more cultural and to be more global, I think, is a, a great asset to have in life. And to be able to travel, it would be a, a great opportunity. And it's, I think this is the time in my life to be able to do it. So, Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Another round of applause for Jacob, please. Thank you. You did great. I gotta say, I do also like Queen. Um, I don't know what my favorite song would be. I guess Bohemian Rhapsody. I guess that's good. You know, it's a classic. So, anyway, we're gonna shift gears now. We're gonna talk about a different topic, and it's gonna be a little more of a a more somber topic, right? We're all we're all lonely somehow in our own way. We all somehow miss a friend. Maybe it's a parent, a soulmate, or even something simpler like a pet. And I must say, when it comes to combating loneliness and isolation, universities like BGSU do have wonderful resources available to help students, faculty, staff, and community members. But does that always mean, or that really does not always mean that people want the help or feel the self-confidence to get the help? And that can be dangerous. So to perform the next TED Talk here is Daniel Maitland with his speech on why loneliness is about more than being alone. So please welcome to the stage. Daniel Maitland. What's your preferred apocalypse? Don't worry, you're at the right talk. This is the one where I tell you about why loneliness is about more than being alone. However, it just so happens you can understand both loneliness and how to act to prevent loneliness during the apocalypse. When this question was posed to me, it was a very convenient way to avoid working on this talk. I'd spent two hours trying to think of how to start this conversation and quietly muttering under my breath about how Brene Brown had stolen my thunder a decade ago. I stopped by my lab where some of my students promptly asked me how I wanted the world to end. And I almost immediately thought of the Twilight Zone episode, Time Enough at Last. In Time Enough at Last, Henry Bemis, a man constantly in trouble for reading, survives a nuclear war. Initially distraught at the idea of being alone on an empty world, he soon finds a public library that's mostly intact and is ecstatic to spend the rest of his life reading, only to have those dreams literally shattered when his glasses fall off and break, leaving him almost completely blind. The story of Henry Bemis helps us understand much of what we know about loneliness. It's more than just being alone. Feelings of loneliness show up when there's a discrepancy between someone's actual and desired levels of social connection. When we're content being alone, we typically don't feel lonely. However, when we start craving some sort of social connection, those feelings arise. Our definition of loneliness highlights two key components of it. The first is there has to be a content or a contact level of social connection. The second is that there's a qualitative component to loneliness, how you actually interact with people when you're spending time with them. Most people think of being lonely as when no one's around, but the story's much more complex than that. 
Like Henry Bemis, most people or some people might be perfectly content with limited social contact given the availability of other things to do. And as such, you can be completely alone and not feel lonely at all for long periods of time if you're Henry Bemis, but others of us require much more contact than that, even if it's just sending a text message. So what's more tragic than the individuals that experience loneliness by being alone are those who are lonely despite being surrounded by other people. And this may be because some sort of quality of the relationship is lacking. This might be a situation where either you're not talking to those around you, or the conversation's so superficial that no connection forms, such as talking about weather. In psychology, attempt to attempts to ameliorate loneliness have typically taken a one-size-fits-all approach to understanding and addressing loneliness by utilizing cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. As detailed by a recent systemic review by Nisha Hickens and colleagues, cognitive behavior therapy includes skills such as social skills training, finding friends, and managing emotions. This is the behavior part of CBT. But these treatments also spend an extensive amount of time focusing on attempting to understand and challenge negative thoughts that the individuals might have, such as I'm boring or I have no friends. While these skills components of these treatments may help us address the scaffolding that we need to create social contact, based on our understanding and the definition of loneliness, it's possible that alternatives to challenging our thoughts are indicated. And specifically, I'd like to focus on changing our behaviors rather than changing our thoughts. One of my favorite professors in graduate school, Dr. Galen Alessi, once told me that understanding changing behavior starts with uh, looking at if it's a can't do problem or a won't do problem. That is to say, does the individual have the needed skills to accomplish the new task? Or is there some sort of barrier, such as a unwillingness to come in contact with feelings or thoughts that's preventing them from doing that? For individuals who are isolated or don't have as much social contact as they'd like, the question is no different. We frequently take it for granted how to meet new people, but there's objectively a skill to approaching someone you don't know in settings where you're unfamiliar, especially if you don't want to be creepy. So like any other skill, this is going to require practice. And unfortunately, like most skills, when you're trying something new, it's not going to start out perfect. My first tip is don't let this stop you, even when it's uncomfortable. Only practice is going to get you to the place you want to be. This is also linked pretty closely to the won't do side of social connection. It's not uncommon for individuals, especially those acculturated in Western society, to justify a lack of action by saying they don't feel like it. It's important to recognize that Frequently, motivation comes after you start doing something. So it's not uncommon for me to not want to go to a, special, or a social gathering, especially if I don't know many people there. However, once I go to the gathering, I'll start talking to people, I'll start enjoying myself, and I frequently end up not wanting to leave. This same principle can apply to other things as well, ranging from thoughts, such as if I go to this gathering, no one will talk to me and I'll feel embarrassed, to feelings themselves, such as anxiety and that sensation of tightness in your chest. Consequently, the second thing that I want to advocate for is make space for feelings you don't want to have. Those feelings may or may not go away. However, there's nothing from stopping you from connecting with others, even when those feelings are present. If the feelings or thoughts feel overwhelming, break them into smaller steps. So instead of having the goal of making a new friend, have the goal of getting in your car, driving to the party, and saying hi to someone you don't know. Those smaller steps can feel very achievable when those bigger steps feel insurmountable. Enhancing the quality of a relationship is slightly more complex than increasing the quantity of contact. While some people are content with activity partners, many people find these types of relationships completely unfulfilling. Increasing feelings between two individuals seems to be a reciprocal dyadic process. That is to say, both people have to engage in a role in this process. And connection forms when one person engages in a vulnerable behavior, and the other person responds to that vulnerability in a way that's perceived as responsive. 
Vulnerability in this context refers to any behavior that if the other person didn't respond well to, you, en you would engage in less frequently. And this can range from a disclosure to a request to just engaging in some sort of behavior. This part of the proverbial equation is where difficulties frequently arise. Vulnerability, much like trust, needs to be given before it's earned. You never know how another person will respond, and there's a real potential to be hurt. We also need to understand that not all vulnerability is a good thing. It's possible to come on too strong or disclose too much in a way that decreases the odds of the other person responding effectively to you. Finally, it's important to note that just like trust, vulnerability shouldn't be given to everyone. Odds are everyone in this room has had experiences being vulnerable with others that did not go well. The lesson is not to never be vulnerable, but instead to learn how to refine how to be vulnerable, who you're vulnerable with, and to keep taking those chances in thoughtful ways when it is scary. This dynamic of vulnerability is perhaps best exemplified in a more recent apocalyptic story, The Last of Us. The Last of Us takes place in a world that's been overtaken by fungus that turns people into what you might call zombies. However, the story is not about surviving the zombie apocalypse. The story is about two people, Joel and Ellie. Like most people in The Last of Us, Joel and Ellie have both experienced loss and trauma. Joel's a man in his 50s who's tasked with keeping Ellie, a young woman, safe as they travel across the country. And to say the relationship starts out rocky is an understatement. Joel won't engage with Ellie. He won't share anything personal whatsoever. And Ellie is doing everything she can to annoy Joel. They argue, they boss each other around, and they constantly ignore one another. The end result of this is that both of them are miserable and feel alone even though they are surrounded by one another constantly. As the show goes on, they start to take physical and emotional risks with one another. They risk their lives to save one another. They start to share their life stories of love and loss, and they share their fears about caring for one another, recognizing that it's only by caring about someone that you can lose a meaningful relationship. And in doing so, the relationship thrives. It evolves from being one of duty and obligation to one of genuine care and connection. In one particularly evocative scene, Joel, who's a traditionally masculine man, think firearm-wielding, flannel-wearing, pickup-driving Texan, becomes emotional as he talks about his fear of not being able to protect Ellie. He tries to have her travel with someone who's younger, who he thinks can keep her safe. And Ellie shares that in doing so, she'd feel alone and unsafe again. And she communicates to Joel that it's her connection with him that makes her feel safe, not any actual physical support he can provide. So while not everyone can be Henry Bemis and have the traits needed to be relatively content while alone, I think everyone can be like Joel and Ellie. You can seek out people when you're feeling alone and give them the gift of being open and maybe even a little vulnerable with them. And by knowing these steps and taking these steps, you can understand what to do to feel more connected and instill some hope that if you ever find yourself feeling lonely, it's not the end of the world. Thank you. Just like Jacob, I heard some whoops coming over here. Do you know anybody in the crowd today? Yeah, my, my wife and my research lab that uh, brought the question up to me are both here. Nice. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming out here. Real quick question for the audience. Who here's watched The Last of Us? I see a few hands. Yes, yeah, so I would highly recommend it. I'm starting to watch it, too, so uh, I would highly recommend it. Now, i got to ask you, when you have such a complex topic like loneliness, where it seems so simple at face value, but really when you, deep, when you do a deep dive, it's, it's very complex, what motivated you to do all of this research and really dive into this topic and share it with everybody? Um, so I actually started out as a psychotherapy researcher, and I do a lot of work looking at how the relationship between the therapist and the patient can lead to good outcomes. And this evolved into understanding more of the complexities, such as uh, why loneliness predicts mortality at the rate of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So just a lot to explore there. All right. Well, once again, give a round of applause to Daniel Maitland. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. So we are reaching the end of our Community for the Public Good session. We have one last speaker, last, very far from the least though. Catherine Bazo is gonna be our final speaker for Community for the Public Good today. She's a senior art history student. She actually transferred to BGSU in the fall of 2021. And since then, has served as president of the Art History Association, is a recipient of a BGSU CURS grant, has also worked at the National Museum and Art Gallery of Trinidad Tobago, is an art conservation intern. Oots for that, that's pretty impressive. Her speech today is cultural preservation through preventative conservation efforts. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Bazo to the stage. <laughs> My name is Catherine Bazo, and in 2022, I began a six-week internship in Trinidad and Tobago at the National Museum and Art Gallery, NMAG. I spent my days in the main art gallery among school children, tourists, and families, immersed in a space filled with artworks that visualized Trinidadian identity. My role within NMAG was to document the physical conditions of these artworks, and I grew to intimately know each piece through a process of condition reporting. Creating a condition report requires close observation of the artwork's surface and structure. And though the standard condition report does not include cultural context, my personal interactions with these objects led to an investigation of content. As I worked, I realized that by including the cultural connotations of the artwork, the condition report evolved from a physical justification for preservation into a more expansive advocate for the preservation of culture and identity. Specific artworks within NMAG's holdings warranted the inclusion of this cultural information. And for example, within the report of Alfredo Cadayo's Trinidad Folklore, I deviate from the standard description of the object by noting not only the figures comprising the painting, but also their context within Trinidadian folklore. Though documenting the physical condition of the artwork is still the emphasis of the report, the inclusion of any cultural information now ties the artwork to its cultural context which can work in condition or in tandem with condi the condition data to provide the museum, conservators, and the community with essential information to guide future preservation projects. These expanded reports allow the community to see the physical need for these projects as a part of cultural expression and reaffirming of local identities through the visual arts. This reaffirmation of identity is achieved not only through making the objects viewable, but by placing them within a legitimized space they're inherently seen as more valuable to local and global audiences. This accredited and accessible museum actively promotes local art and culture as high art, which is deemed valuable and worthy. And by placing these artworks within a nationally recognized space, it not only educates visitors, whether local or foreign, on what the art community has to offer, but establishes that Trinidadian voices are important, valuable, and needed within a global world. As NMAG works to preserve and legitimize local heritage and identity, the artworks which reflected that same ethos became the focus of my project. Alfredo Cadayo's Trinette Folklore and Leroy Clark's Weavers of the Dust are these types of artworks. The pair of artists and paintings reflect a history of Trinidadian art, where Trinidadian and Afro-Caribbean identity is investigated and validated within a contemporary art world. Cadayo's Trinidad Folklore poses a dynamic and captivating scene with distinct characters from Trinidadian mythology. The Wens are the, children of, are the souls of children who have died before they're baptized. Mama Glo is the mother of the water, and her partner, Papa Bois, is the elderly protector and father of the animals of the forest. La Jablesse is a devil woman who hexes men and leads them deep into the forest. The Bookman is a devil-like figure who writes the name of peoples into his book of damned souls, and the Moon Gazer, or Phantom, is a tall white being who stands at crossroads and traps anyone who passes through the wide stance of his legs. Cadayo's painting was the first visualization of Trinidad's folklore. He transformed the traditionally oral form of this mythology into a solid visual account of each character and identity. The artwork relies on a shared local lore for its viewers to recognize the characters who in many cases share their lived experiences. Painted in 1958, in an era prior to Trinidad's independence from Britain in 1962, it was crucial to visualize Afro-Caribbean culture and folklore as it reaffirmed local specific identities in contrast to one constructed and imposed by a foreign colonial power. 
The commission of this artwork by the Art Society of Trinidad and Tobago and Cadillo's own efforts to illustrate the pantheon of Trinidad's folklore demonstrate the individual and societal desire to depict Afro-Caribbean subjects within the public sphere, a space that was previously reserved for subject matter that fit a colonially defined definition of appropriate and high art. That significant narrative is ultimately what justifies its preservation and the considerable efforts which such preservation requires. I spent almost two days writing the report on this painting. I became enthralled with each of the characters and found it hard to put down my flashlight. The conservation of this piece not only preserves the physical artwork, which can be viewed and interacted with, but preserves the Trinidad identities and histories that are ingrained within it. Almost 20 years after Kadayo created Trinidad folklore, Leroy Clark found inspiration in his piece and utilized the folkloric subject to establish Trinidadian identities within a now post-colonial space. Upon the dissolution of colonial rule, the Trinidadians needed to establish their identity within a global world. Because of this, Clark intentionally focused on Afro-Caribbean folklore as essential to a Trinidadian national identity. Though actively working to share this folklore, Clark's Weavers of the Dust has an ambiguous narrative. The enigmatic subject of the painting is amplified through Clark's style, where figures are engulfed with a network of lines and interconnected symbols. It is unclear where the characters begin or end, and these almost hidden subjects may reflect the shared and esoteric knowledge of Trinidad's folklore by the local community. Though the subjects of the painting are generally ambiguous, Clark references Cadao's depiction of the phantom and the serpent-headed Mama de Lowe. These references to folkloric characters and Clark's fundamental knowledge of Afro-Caribbean religious beliefs and folklore empower the artwork to serve as a visualization of Trinidadian identity. Weavers of the Dust builds upon the creation of folklore as an acceptable subject while its subversion of images from Trinidad folklore places this subject, this artwork, within the contemporary art practices of a post-colonial space. For Clark, this immediate post-colonial world in which Trinidadians were searching for an expression of local identity is characterized by the need to keep Afrocentric folkloric subjects in the vanguard. This artwork is surrounded by an entire social framework that reaffirms the need to include cultural context within condition reports and justifies its conservation as well as the preservation of other cultural objects. These two paintings visualize Trinidad's folklore, confront the colonial standard of art, and empower real Trinidadian identities. These contexts provide radical justification for the preservation, protection, and continued display. By centering my conservation project around these two artworks, I hope to establish that the preservation of works that visualize local identity empower the individuals who see themselves in those pieces. This empowerment is essential in establishing local identities within a global space. By establishing these identities, Trinidad and histories, practices, and traditions can continue to exist and thrive. The national concern for the preservation of artwork and culture continues with active involvement with local peoples. This involvement may be communication to determine proper terminology, or collaboration to create entire conservation projects with culture groups like the Santa Rosa First Peoples Community, with whom we visited and whom my peer, Raven Bagel Long, worked with to establish accurate terminology for the museum when describing First Peoples. By involving the community, the conservation efforts of NMAG extends beyond the bounded museum setting and create both local and national advocation for the art object. Cultural reports, condition reports that include cultural context both recognize and honor local culture. These reports help museums create an authenticated and accessible space that provides the opportunity for visitors to view their identities reflected in works validated by the museum. The community can see this validation and in turn view their local culture as significant within a global setting. Condition reports also provide val valuable data, which is central in the safeguarding of culture and artwork. The safeguarding begins with a physical art object and extends into the heritage that surrounds the piece. This form of art conservation that includes cultural context actively participates in the reaffirmation and preservation of Trinidadian identities. While working in the gallery, groups of children and parents would surround my table, excited and curious about the work I was doing. I was able to interact with the community, telling, chatting with visitors about my project, and listening to their memories and stories attached to the artwork that I was working on. I'm grateful that I was a part of NMAG's conservation efforts. My time there transformed the way I viewed art, 
and I began to realize that the artwork that I was surrounded by reflected the people, landscapes, and histories of Trinidad that I saw each day. As the conservation efforts of the museum continue, the community will in turn see a validation of their people, their landscapes, and their histories. Thank you. Okay, so I just heard a wow, I just heard a great. How does that feel? Good, I'm so happy it's over. I, <laughs> I feel the stress just melting off. Totally. You feel good? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this world of technology that we're in, this world of being in our phones that we're in, a lot of ways, pretty much the, the main way that people seek information and seek entertainment anymore is through their phones, through computers, mm -hmm. through TikTok. Oh. Hello. I know about TikTok. You're welcome. <laughs> you heard about, heard about the thing. Heard about TikTok. So why, you know, not everybody thinks to go to the art museum anymore, sadly. What is it that, that a physical piece of art has that our phones just don't carry? There's an energy embedded with every single type of artwork. The second that you have the opportunity to be in close proximity to a piece, you can just feel that energy radi radiate off of it. And it allows you to build a connection with it that you can't get by looking at it on the phone. I, I know that I spent so much time in that gallery um, that I, I just was able to know and get that energy and feed off of that energy every single day. And I think that going to the physical museum, like I said, it empowers the people who, who view their identities reflected in those works. And even if you don't see your own identity inflected in those works, you can know that people across the globe are being empowered and being visualized. And yeah, I just, I love museums. <laughs> We can tell how passionate you are about it, so thank you so much for taking the time to share your passion, share your story, sharing those pictures. Thank I you. felt like I was right there with you, so thank you so much. Big round of applause for Catherine, please. Yeah. You did great. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our Community for the Public Good session. We're flying through today, folks, aren't I we? know. We're already over halfway through today's yeah. TEDx event, and they've been all fantastic yeah. speeches, don't you think? Absolutely. Knocking our socks off over here. I know. Here. I'm amazed wow. I still have my socks on at this point. <laughs> but we're going to take another pause as we're in the intermission between session three and session four. So we encourage you all to join uh, TEDx in the community hub in the multi-purpose room just across the hallway there in the mezzanine. You have an opportunity to engage with the speakers. You can go to the pop-up bookstore, participate in the community art pieces as well. Speaking of art, you know, and yeah. uh, we'll be joined back probably around 2.30 for session four. And so we hope you join us here in the ballroom. And as always, please work to do better for the public good. That is what we're all about today. And thank you to all our speakers in session three, and thank you to everybody for coming out for session three. See you soon.
That's okay. Oh. Hello. Let's try that again. Test, test, test. Can you hear me okay? No? I'll Looks like we're just using one mic. I guess. I guess I'll share with you, Steve. Or I'll just talk loud. One of the two. Right. Here. Anyway. Anyway. Welcome back to session number four of the BGSU TEDx event. My name is Steve Iwanek, and this is Claire Mitchell. We are both co-anchors for BG Falcon Media's newscast program, and we're excited that you're here today for this fourth session talking about change for the public good. So change for the public good. Change can be a scary thing. Us humans, we like comfortability, we like routine. We like to eat the same thing for breakfast. We like to take the same route to work. If you're like my dad, you like to park in the same parking spot at the office every day. No worries there, but we like our routine. We like our comfortability. But here at BGSU, students and staff, we welcome change. In fact, they believe change across campus can be for the public good. These speakers today emphasize that message through their speeches. Starting off our change for the public good section is Jacqueline Barchik. She's the creative director of Falcon Media here on BGSU's campus. She calls herself a creative problem solver for social change. She's passionate about understanding human behavior and reducing barriers throughout the decision-making process. Her speech today is called Inclusio, Adapting Homes where she'll talk about the importance of making your homes more inclusive so they can adapt to life's changes. Please welcome to the TEDx BGSU stage, Ms. Jacqueline Barchik. Watching baby's first steps, recording the kid's height on a door frame, Ringing in the new year with neighbors, sharing a family dinner. These are the simple moments that make up our lives. And where do they usually take place? In our homes. Homes that we've decorated with family heirlooms and vacation me mementos. Our homes are so much more than bricks and mortar. They're where we find rest, rest and refuge. They directly influence our well being. It's no wonder then that most of us can't conceive of leaving the places that hold most of our memories, the place we're most comfortable. Even when it gets difficult to navigate stairs or tight-fitting shower stalls, we want to figure out ways to stay in our homes. Period. End of story. In fact, three out of four people prefer to stay in their homes as their abilities change according to AARP. Unfortunately, only 20% of their homes will accommodate their changed abilities or chronic health issues. So when our homes become a barrier to our safety, what do we do? We might think about remodeling, but where do we begin? How do we find a contractor? What even needs to change? It can be so overwhelming. My name is Jackie, and I'm excited to talk about making our homes more inclusive so that they adapt to life's changes. Whether a small fix or a big renovation, it just takes a little planning. And I'll tell you this personal story with our daughter, Anna, really crystallized it. A Tuesday morning in early October, our day in Perrysburg, Ohio began early with my husband leaving, uh, driving to Columbus, Ohio with our dog, Stu, for a vet appointment. And afterwards, he was planning to meet up with our younger daughter, an Ohio State student at the time. And I left for work not far from home. Shortly after I arrived, I got a call from my husband, and I could tell by the sound of his voice that something was wrong. Jack, Anna's been in an accident. It's bad. We need to leave. I'm on my way, I say. I'll be right there. Mind you, there is in Cincinnati three hours away. Separately, we race to Cincinnati. And while on the drive down, I'm retracing in my mind the roads Anna takes to work, trying to figure out where did this accident happen. But as new information comes in while we're en route, I learn Anna wasn't in her car when the collision occurred. Okay, rewind, 7.30 the same morning, but in Cincinnati. 
Finishing up her morning run just a few blocks from home, Anna had the green light to cross the street in the marked crosswalk when she was violently hit by a driver who ran the red light. The impact was so great, her head smashed the windshield before she was thrown 10 feet into oncoming, the oncoming lane. Lying motionless and crumpled, the driver left the scene. Had it not been for a passerby on his morning walk, the story might have ended there. But because of his quick reactions, it took only moments for EMS to arrive. Minutes later, she's in emergency surgery to stop the hemorrhaging from her head. Hours later, the surgeon, neurosurgeon shared her assessment. Anna had sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. Half of her skull was crushed and not savable. Though the bleeding had been stopped, it would be a game of wait and see, no promises. Well, the first 10 days were touch and go. We could only see her for two hours at a, at a time, during each day. And the neuro team told us that every 15 minutes we don't hear from them would be good news. Gradually, she emerged from a coma as her neural pathways made new connections. The following three months, she endured three surgeries on her skull and regained the ability to walk, talk, and read. Because the right people were in the right place at the right time with the right things to say and do, Anna survived and is thriving today. It was during her stay in the neuro inpatient rehab hospital that I had an aha moment when I learned that one of the requirements for being released from rehab was that the home be safe and barrier free. For Anna, aspects of her home posed potential safety issues, such as stairs leading to the house, steep stairs within the house, and a bathtub shower. I also learned that case managers typically don't provide uh, information to patients and families to help them solve their safety issues. They're left to their own devices to find their own resources. Well, we were lucky because my carpenter husband was able to make accessible modifications. Simply replacing the standard towel bar in the bathroom with an ADA compliant towel bar solved two things where to hang a towel, where to get a second handhold. Additional modifications included adding a second railing to the main stairway that was 100% ADA compliant, building an exterior railing from the sidewalk to the house, building an exterior railing from the back door to the backyard, rearranging some furniture, and even adding a pet door to an interior door as opposed to navigating a pet gate. Well, it got me thinking, how many others are facing similar situations? Maybe they've had an accident, or maybe they're living with a chronic health issue. Who do they turn to when their bathroom floor plan is hard to use or can't accommodate a wheelchair? Not everybody has a carpenter husband like I do. I mean, let's think about it. Will your home be easy to use when your health or your abilities change? It's time we face some uncomfortable truths about accessibility and housing. And here are three things that I discovered. One, according to the CDC, one in five people are living with a disability. That's 65 million Americans. The most common disability is mobility, which includes difficulty walking and navigating stairs. And we have a growing population of folks whose abilities are changing. Second, Three out of four people prefer to stay in their homes over a lifetime. Just over half anticipate remaining in their current communities, and about a third expect their homes to require major modifications to make them barrier-free. And third, a housing study from Harvard University reports that four out of five of the current US housing stock lacks design features that will allow a person to remain in their home living safely and comfortably. Almost 80% of these homes are 20 years old, making it difficult for homeowners to navigate or even use their homes. More people living with a disability, 
more people want to stay in their homes over a lifetime, and yet a majority of our homes can't accommodate their changed abilities. This is a problem. But here's the good news. If you want to stay in your home, you can. Be proactive. Make modifications today so that you don't have to make changes tomorrow. Home Advisor reports that homeowners are completing projects now that will facilitate their lifestyle for many years to come. Projects include making their homes more inclusive and safer, with project improvements ranging from night and security lights to wider interior hallways to curbless showers. And design solutions can be beautiful. I was surprised to see how many choices of fixtures and towel bars there were that combined beauty and ADA accessibility. Creating accessible, inclusive homes has many advantages, including economic ones. Homes that are remodeled to include design features such as lever style door and cabinet handles, better lighting, zero thresholds between rooms, and countertops of varying heights accommodates users of all ages, sizes, and abilities and it can increase the value of your home. In terms of health care costs, it's more affordable for a person to remain in their home and receive in-home caregiving. And lastly, Pew Research tells us that a record 64 million Americans are living in multi-generational households. Reasons being economic changes or ability changes, parents needing children, or grandchildren needing grandparents. Making sure our homes are inclusive makes this possible. As people are responding to change, lifestyle and family structures are adapting, and so should our homes. Simply put, making your home more inclusive now will allow you to continue making memories in the place you're most comfortable over a lifetime. And it will make living easier for everyone, regardless of age, size, or ability. It just takes a little planning. Anna's traumatic collision and recovery opened my eyes to the benefits and the importance of making our homes inclusive and barrier-free. And it motivates me to help others make a plan for improvements. Don't wait for something catastrophic to happen or until your age makes modifications necessary in the moment. Be proactive. Begin with a small remodel project today and create a home that adapts for tomorrow's to come. So tell me, how does your home adapt to your lifestyle changes? I'd like to hear your stories. Thank you. Right. Jackie, thank you so much. Come on, let's join each other here on the red dot. Big round of applause again for Jackie. She's starting off the section. This is scary for everybody, but especially to be the first person. How do you feel? I feel like you're more relaxed. Feels good to have it all over with, right? It does. It was awesome. I know my story. <laughs> Well, we loved hearing your story, so thank you for being vulnerable. Um, so, you know, you talked about having adaptive homes. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure through this process and what you experienced, you found that there are places outside of the home that can afford to be more adaptive, more inclusive. What are renovations that say places like school here or grocery stores can do to make it more accessible and inclusive? I guess some easy, um, a couple easy solutions would be, I go back to the lever style handles. Um, because when we make it easier for people to open and close things and we reduce the action like this, it makes it possible for people of all ages and sizes to whether we're opening it this way or maybe we do a hand, you know, an elbow. But um, making those lever styles changes is a real easy one. And then making doors easy to open too. Again, not only the push pads that automatically open, but either lever style, you know, or pull. Mm -hmm. Well, Jackie, thank you so much. Big round of applause again for Jackie. Thank you. All right. Beautiful way to start things off. Okay. 
Up next is Joshua Otten. He is a fourth year student here at BGSU studying finance and insurance and is an FPNA analyst at Well Tower. Not too shabby, heard some claps back there. Fun fact, actually, you may know him as number two Iron Man in the group Sick Sick on campus. So that's pretty cool. I heard some woots in the audience. I like it. Today, his speech is called Why Financial Literacy Needs to Be a Priority to Change the World, in which he's going to explain the significant impact it can have on communities right here in Bowling Green and across the globe. Please welcome Joshua Otten to the stage. One of my favorite quotes of all time is a Nelson Mandela quote that goes, as long as poverty and justice and gross inequality exist in our world, none of us can truly exist. I think this quote is so inspirational and it starts talking about an issue that simply isn't talked about enough, the issue of poverty. Today I want to talk through about how we can all be a part of this solution, no matter who you are or where you come from or whatever your financial position is, how we can all come together to solve this issue through knowledge, through something called financial literacy. So let's begin right there. Let's begin with a clear de definition of what financial literacy is. I really love the Asian Bank Institute and how they define it, of people's understanding of financial concepts, as well as the skills and abilities to manage their money and make informed financial decisions. See, when you're financially literate, you have the foundation to relationship with money. And it's a lifelong journey of learning. See, the earlier you start, the better off you are because education is really the key to success when it comes to managing your money. I like to think about our relationship with our personal finance. It's kind of like running a marathon. And there's a couple components to this marathon. And I like to think of our financial literacy as our running shoes. And so I've never run a marathon and I've never tried this, but if you were to run a marathon without any shoes at all, I imagine you would get pretty hurt in the process, right? Now, the same thing is with money. If you've never had the opportunity to develop a strong relationship in terms, in terms of your personal financial literacy, then you could be seriously burned by not understanding how to manage your money. But by setting yourself up with a great start to a lifelong journey with money, you could be setting yourself up for a lot of success. Now, currently, financial literacy is offered in a variety of capacities throughout the world, everything from online courses to different classes taught at universities. But the way that most of us learn and start our relationship with our personal finances comes from our households that we grew up in. Now, some high schools are starting to offer a variety of different requirements and classes, and we'll get into talking about this in a little bit, but a lot of underserved communities still don't have the access to that financial literacy. In today's world, financial products and services have become so popular and so important to our society. Think about how sophisticated our financial behavior has become in just recent generations. A couple generations ago, everything you paid for was in cash, you put all of your money into a bank and you maybe invested in some low yield bonds for your children or grandchildren, and that was it. In today's world, now we have credit cards and debit cards, house loans, 401ks, car loans, cryptocurrency, Dogecoin, what the heck even is Dogecoin? I still don't know. And the list goes on and on, and it gets so confusing. Each has its own set of laws and regulations and return rates, and it's almost like playing a game that's set up for you to lose. And it's a lot to keep track of. And so, especially if you've never been exposed to healthy money habits or financial literacy. Unfortunately for most Americans, it seems that financial illiteracy is very common. According to a report done by FINRA, which is basically all the people that make the rules for all these banks and financial institutions, as of 2021, 66% of Americans are financially illiterate. And in this report and in this study that they did, they found a lot of good research. And so let's dig into some of the statistics that they found. So one concept that a lot of personal financial literacy courses will teach you is that you should spend less 
than what you make every month. So let's say in a given month that you make $3,000. You would be advised to spend less than that $3,000 and what's ever left over to, sa to save or invest that. According to the study, 53% of respondents with higher financial literacy did just that, compared to 35% of respondents with lower financial literacy. 53 to 35, that's quite a gap. Another important money management technique is to have an emergency fund. Money set aside to, if something was to ever happen, like an emergency, let's think about like a fire, or medical bills, or a car crash, have that money, that buffer set aside. This study indicated that 65% of respondents with higher financial literacy did have an emergency fund compared to 43% of respondents with the lower financial literacy, 65 to 43. Now this is just two ways and two examples of the way that financial literacy helps individuals to make smarter financial decisions. So we know the importance of financial literacy. It doesn't just provide us with useless knowledge like how to write a check. It actually provides us with the tools and skills to be su successful with our money and to be able to do some really cool things, whether that's save for your kids to go to college, be able to retire early, or to be able to give generously to the charities and donations that we care a lot about. We understand its importance, and so now we start to connect to the issue of poverty and start to connect the dots here. So at the beginning of 2020, it was estimated that just over 588 million people in the world were living in extreme poverty. That's approximately 7.7% of the global population that lives below the international poverty line of $1.90 per day. Comparing that to the US and the way that we look at the poverty line, which is your annual income based on the number of people in your household, 37.9 million people were living below the poverty line. That's 11.6% of our US population. Another way to put that is that these people don't have access to basic needs such as food or water, or shelter, or clothing. Concern Worldwide, which is Ireland's largest humanitarian and aid agency, they analyze these cycles of poverty and how they kind of translate throughout the world and within our countries. And they came up with four pretty neat ways to analyze poverty, four cycles of poverty. And so for most people, these cycles of poverty, without any outside intervention, this is a cycle that they've likely inherited from their parents, and they're extremely likely to pass it down to their children. So let's start with the four ways that they define um, these cycles of poverty. The first type is the occasionally poor. This group of people can expect to spend most of their time, long periods of time, living above the poverty line. Now, there might be some unexpected event, some shock that happens to them that might trigger them to go below the poverty line for some time period. But usually this group spends long stretches of time above the poverty line. These are the occasionally poor. Our second group is the silical poor. Now this group of individuals, they spend times going above and below the poverty line. They have those same triggers that the occasionally poor does, but these triggers happen more consistently, but on a less severe basis. This is the situation that a lot of folks who rely on agriculture face on the day, every year. So the, where they're going above and below the poverty on a yearly or monthly basis. And this would be, might be because some of the hungry seasons that come in between harvests, even without a drought or without flooding. Our third type of poverty, or our third cycle of poverty rather, is those that are usually poor. This can be seen as the inverse of the occasionally poor. These, this group of people can expect to spend long, times of pe long periods of time below the poverty line, but due to some, t some unanticipated help, that might help them go above the poverty line. This might come in the form of some high income labor. And our fourth type of poverty, our fourth poverty cycle is the always poor. Like the usually poor, this group of individuals spend majority of the time below the poverty line, but even with some fluctuations in their income, they tend to spend all of their time below the poverty line. And so we kind of analyzed the four different types of poverty that exist 
throughout the world and within the United States. And then 2020 came. And I don't have to begin to tell you the impact that the pandemic had and how it affected so many individuals, families, communities, and countries throughout the world. But when we talk about the economic impact that these communities that struggled the most throughout the pandemic and they're still struggling today, it's those with the highest poverty rates before the pandemic hit. See, we saw this uneven economic recover, recovery in our country in which these really wealthy communities were able to recover really quickly, whereas these communities with higher poverty rates are still struggling today. That's because when you're living day to day and you lose those financial resources that you count on, there's nothing to fall back onto. There's no buffer, there's no emergency fund, there's no job, and it's really hard to climb back. Additionally, the low financial literacy rates in our communities mean that these cycles of poverty often continue intergenerationally, like we talked about, passing it down to their children. And this is how financial margin is created and how that margin becomes greater. Because when you have something so devastating happen, these communities simply cannot recover. And this next, next statistic really goes to show the gap in financial literacy and the need that we have throughout our nation. And a study done by NextGen Personal Finance, throughout the nation in which schools that at least 75% of students were eligible for free or reduced lunch, a common me metric that is used to measure low-income communities and schools, and schools where at least 75% of students were eligible for free or reduced lunch, only 3.9% of students were required to take one semester of personal financial literacy. That's the need. That's the gap. See, we all know the importance of financial literacy. Financial literacy empowers communities. It will lead to stronger food security and a stronger, more educated workforce, which translates to lower crime rates, less stress in our lives, fewer foreclosures in our neighborhoods, and overall, happier people. In financially capable communities, everyone benefits. The problem doesn't lie in what we teach, but it's where we teach it. Financial literacy in underserved communities must be a national priority. Underserved communities have very little to no buffer to be able to absorb economic shock like a pandemic and will soon become a national crisis, and it already is. Within the United States, there's these cycles of poverty, and there's an unlikely chance that these children in low-income families will ever break this cycle. So it begs the question, what do we do? And I'm not here today to propose anything super out of the ordinary. What I'm here to propose is to start the conversation. Talk to somebody about it. Support an existing initiative or take part in community events and contribute to organizations that are working to promote financial literacy in underserved communities, like the YMCA or United Way. Every April, so this April here in a week, every April is National Financial Literacy Month. And this is your opportunity to take part in some of the ongoing initiatives there is to promote financial literacy in communities throughout the world. Because as long as poverty injustice, and gross inequality exist in our world, none of us can truly exist. Thank you. All right. Nice work, Joshua. How do you feel? Feeling good. Feeling, you got a mic. I keep handing it over <laughs> if they can't hear me. You got it. You're good. So we were talking backstage. I got kind of a twofer question for you here. We were talking backstage. You called yourself an introvert. Huh, some people in the audience are like, no way. You're an introvert. Why would you want to get up on stage and talk in front of all these people? What made you want to do this? Yeah, so um, about eight years ago is re really when I got into uh, personal finance. I was really inspired by my uncle. And um, I started doing all this research and finding all these statistics. And I was like, man, this is crazy stuff. Why is it not talked about enough? We have this issue of poverty, and we never really talk about how we can take ownership in it. Um, and I think really the key is, is, you know, when you have a platform, you have a sense of knowledge, it's your job to really advocate for those people in underserved communities, because um, a lot of times they can't advocate for themselves. And so I really, I strongly believe in the 
power that financial literacy has and um, how it can play such an impactful role of breaking those cycles of poverty. And I think it's an issue that's not talked about enough and that needs to be talked about more. And so that's kind of why I chose to come speak about it today. Well, you did a great job. Uh, second question for you, almost done, I promise. So in your line of work now and what you've studied, you know, when do you think kids should start learning about financial literacy? Because honestly, the first any sort of financial class I've ever taken was in college. Is that too late? I think I know your answer. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a great question. I think that financial literacy, as soon as you can get a... Um, get shown it, it's, it's really important. I mean, you even talk about there's videos of five-year-olds learning how to work with different types of money and be able to count it out. I think the earlier that you're exposed to healthy money habits, the more important and more impactful that it can be. And especially when we talk about these low-income families and underserved communities, the earlier that they can be exposed to these things, the um, longer they have and the more that they can learn to set themselves up for success to be able to break some of those cycles that we talked about. All right. Well, Josh, you did great. Big round of applause for Joshua. Thank you. Thank you. Or should I say Iron Man? <laughs> Haven't heard that one yet today, I'm sure. All right. Steve, you want to just use this mic? Yeah. We'll wait. Our next speaker's coming up. Yeah. The woo, whoever just wooed. Thank you. Hooting and hollering. Encouraged. Yes. All right. Sorry about the mic issue. My apologies. So. Thank you again to Joshua for that great talk on financial literacy. So now we're going to shift gears once again, and we're going to have a talk about acceptance, about inclusion, about fundamental equity of voices, platforms, and love for each other as a human being, as a mind, and as a soul. So here next to perform their talk on trans phylogeny, the world-changing powers and practices of normalizing trans womanhood, please welcome to the stage Pella Felton. Hey, can you all hear me? Can you, you all see me? What do you see when you look at me? It's a simple question. What do you see when you look at me? When you see this lovely human in front of you right now or on the screen that you're watching this somewhere, what do you see? Do you see a drag queen wearing too much makeup or maybe an actor pretending to be something they're not? a punchline, a problem, a fetish object? What does this body make you feel? Stress, anger, confusion? It's a harder question than it seems. And 30 years ago when I was known as Patrick, son of Carrie and Mark, I'm not sure I could have given you an answer for what you're looking at right now. And if you are watching this right now and you're in this space with me and you are made uncomfortable by this presence, I want you to sit with that discomfort for a second, and I want you to honor it, because one of the things that I wanted to do today is make this a little bit less weird for the people in the room and the people watching at home and give you a context for what you're looking at. So again, to the people who are watching live around the world and the tens of people who will watch this online in perpetuity, what do you see when you see me? Well, here's one answer. You see, Pella, I'm more than an image on a screen. I'm a real human being, and I'm not an actor, although I used to be. As a child, I was very awkward, but you couldn't shut me up, surprise, surprise. So eventually, my parents found me a hobby where they could get other people to listen to me talk. And I got to say amazing things written by amazing people uh, on some of the coolest stages on Earth. And the best part was I didn't even have to come up with my own lines. They wrote my lines for me, too, and they gave me my costumes, and I wore it, and I played my role. But I don't do it anymore. I, I play a lot of other roles in my life over my life. I've played the role of teacher, actor, preacher, poet, even stand-up comedian. But the role that I am most proud to play for you today is the role of woman. Hi, my name is Pella Felton. I use she, they pronouns. And this is transphylogeny. How many of you have heard the word transphylogeny before? Yes, but that's because I told you about it already. I made this word up about a year ago as a hashtag for the selfies on my Instagram. So transphylogeny is the affirmation 
and normalization of trans femininity as womanhood. It's also the discursive practices through which trans women become legible as women. And it comes from classic Greek and Latin. The prefix trans means to come across, beyond or on the other side of. And the prefix philo means from the Greek word philos, although on the teleprompter it says phils, so I just want to point out that trans phylogeny is also phils. Um, <laughs> which means loving and fond of. We love you, Phil, I don't know who you are. And the suffix gyne, which means the Greek word gyne, which means woman or female. So combining these three, I brought all three of these ideas together because I wanted a word to give value and respect to humans who transition into the role of womanhood. The month that I am performing this is National Women's Month, and I wanted to honor the women like myself who came to this role after playing a different role. And then because I'm a millennial, I started immediately posting about it to Instagram. So every Thursday, I started posting selfies of myself to Instagram, that's what a selfie is, along with the definition of transphylogeny that I just shared with you. I usually dress up in some of my favorite outfits, put on some makeup or not, go somewhere really pretty, and then post a picture. And I've been doing that for about a year under the hashtag transphylogeny Thursday. Um, it hasn't taken over the world or anything, and I'm fine with that. But every Thursday, my friends, my family, and those I choose to associate with have the honor of seeing me as I see me. And transphylogeny then has become the lens through which I have made myself known to the people that I love. By giving you this word, I'm giving you a guide on how to interface with me and with other human beings, and maybe by doing this, I'm even giving other people that are watching this a new way to flip the scripts on their own lives. That's it. That's the whole talk. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. No, there's actually more. No. But if there wasn't, that's a good talk, right? I'm proud of that talk. I'm proud to come to those conclusions because it took me 36 years to figure that stuff out. Think of all the years I lost of not knowing myself. So I'm giving you this word so that you can know this now. This word, say it with me, transphylogeny. Excellent. But before I give it to you, I need to give you a couple other words first. So scientists and physicians have been delineating sex and gender for decades. This is not new. In 2001, the Institute of Medicine found that there were some biological differences between how male and female patients should be treated, but significantly sociocultural and philosophical factors played an incredibly important role in determining proper health care of patients. This is 23 years ago. As a consequence, the IOM advises the use of the words sex and gender to differentiate between these areas of investigation. Sex should be used as a classification according to the reproductive organs and chromosomal functions, whereas gender should be used to refer to a person's self-representation, how that person is responded to in their social institutions based on their gender presentation. And if that sounds a little intimidating, I have another way to think about it. I like going to the movies. So imagine you're at the movies, right? And there's a big screen in the front of the auditorium, like that screen over there, right? And so that screen is built to specifications. And that's not to say there aren't other screens out there, right? All screens are valid, but the one that you're looking at now, the one that has the image on it, that has a steady impact, that has a steady makeup, until the movie comes on, and suddenly there are images projected onto that screen. And those images can be literally anything because the image is not the same as the screen that it is projected on, right? And sex and gender are kind of the same way. Our sex is like the screen. We are born with it, then the gender ideologies that are projected onto our body come later. Our race our gender, our social class, whether or not we come from quote unquote high quality families. And the totality of these identities that are projected onto us become the self. The gender philosopher Judith Butler calls gender a quote, identity instituted through a stylized repetition of acts. At some point, all of us in this room were born. A doctor looked at us, looked down, saw something and said, 
it's a boy, or it's a girl, or let me get my glasses. And then we're given a name, right? We answer to that name, then we answer to it again. Then we write the name down. Then that name becomes us. We are labeled boy or girl. And even before we realize it, we are performing gender. I am not boy. I was assigned boy, like a role in a play. I performed it. I lived it. I acted the script I was given. I wasn't very good in the role. But I only accepted that role because I didn't know there were any other roles available to me. And that's because the words we use shape how we perceive our lives and ourselves and the cultural realities around us. Neuroscientist Lyra Boroditsky argues that the way we frame and talk about something can drastically, can drastically change our perspective. Boroditsky notes that by choosing how we frame and talk about something, we cue others on how to think about it. If a word, quote, like transgender is never mentioned, or categories like race or gender are never recorded in official documents, then you can never have data of how services, violences, social ills or outcomes are distributed across those groups. But what happens when you come face to face with those things you don't have data for? What happens when something that defies your reality looks you in the eye? We see this thing, we can't explain it, so it becomes a threat. And we see something as a threat it brings up our fight or flight instincts. That's part of being human. And it challenges our reality like a glitch in the matrix. And because we don't have a linguistic context for it, we project those narratives onto it. We fear it. We marginalize it. We legislate it out of existence if we can. And that negative thought, which started out as a small discomfort with the body, becomes an ideology a prism through which we teach other people how to hate. 2014, I was a stand-up comedian. I was working at a comedy show at a roadhouse in South Point, Ohio, and I remember hearing the punchline of a very, very bad joke. In this joke, young man referred to a sex worker in an adult video by invoking a transphobic slur. And I remember being so angry, profoundly angry, disproportionately angry about this joke and not knowing why. This should not have bothered me as much as it did. I had heard much worse in that bar. Uh, and I still identified as a man. I wouldn't come to terms with my own gender identity for another five years. It never even occurred to me that I was insulted because I was a trans woman. How could I? I'm not that. I'm not a genre of pornography. I'm not a punchline. But when I confronted the comedian about the joke, all he had to say was, but that's what it's called. That's what the porn's called. And I think a lot about that interaction. I think about the reduction of an entire identity to a punchline, how that pushed me away from finding myself, how that suppressed something in me, pushed something deep into me so that I was not able to find it. And I get so very angry, you know? Sure, it was just a joke. But I don't care who your audience is. All comedy should be rooted in truth. And if your truth is reducing someone to your sexual gratification, I don't be, feel safe being around you. That isn't truth. That is slander. And I'm sick of having that lie projected onto me, especially after 38 documented murders of transgender humans were recorded in the year 2022, with 30 confirmed cases of trans women being assassinated. And I use that word intentionally. As of this speech, six American trans women have been killed in 2023, and there are 465 active bills in 44 state legislatures which seek to deprive transgendered persons access to basic human rights, health care, privacy, and public expression. This is not a public good. And it doesn't have to be like this. Which takes me back to transphylogeny. I coined this term a year ago because I needed a word to describe my pro performance. I needed a term to describe my performance of womanhood that wasn't drenched in violence 
hatred, or inevitable tragedy. Because the words we had were not enough. In Whipping Girl, trans activist Julie Serrano coined the term trans misogyny to give voice to the trans women who are on a daily basis attacked, delegitimized, and stigmatized. But that word itself is rooted in the word misogyny, which is the delegitimization and hatred of all women. Because it turns out the hatred to trans women is not just hatred towards trans women. Throughout history, women have been facing systematic oppression all over the world, particularly women of color. And despite all our progress, these oppressions are still happening today. By affirming trans women, we are affirming all women, particularly women of color. Trans Foulage Noir is part of trans phylogeny because to imagine the affirmation of trans women is possible, we are taking back the right to define womanhood on our own terms, patriarchy be damned. Trans phylogeny honors the equality of all women, regardless of sex, race, age, religion, or nationality. There is a reason that Black Lives Matter movement, its mission statement explicitly affirms the lives of black, queer, and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum to stand against the indiscriminate erasure of black lives, you have to stand with Kiana Stone, Unique Davis, and all the other amazing trans women of color who have been taken from us over the last two years by the pandemic of anti-trans violence. But that violence isn't the last scene. It can't be. I can't believe that that's how the show ends. I have to believe that this isn't our final draft. Anyone can write a tragedy. It's real easy. The real challenge is writing a future where we all just get to live our lives. We can write that. I promise you. I've started writing it already in my heart. Now, if you're waiting for the part of this story where trans phylogeny goes viral and starts trending on the internet, that's not what happens next. I mean, you could. You're, you're welcome to take what you've learned here today and go out into the world and perform trans phylogeny how you see fit. I would love it if that is what you do today because it's America, you also have the choice to not do that, ignore everything I said. I can't stop you from doing that either and as long as you don't take away my rights, I do not care. But if you've learned anything today, I need every single person that is watching this in this ballroom in March of 2023, those watching at home, look at me and know this. I will not be erased from this draft. You will not martyr me because the future isn't female or male or man or woman. The future is whatever we decide we want it to be. So why not trans phylogeny? Why not trans phylogeny noir? Why not trans philandry? What if the future is better for cis women and cis men and everyone? The future's possible, but you have to start by flipping the script. So now I want everyone to look back at me again, this body that you've shared this space with and decide whether or not you can see me, if not at least as a woman, as a human. Come on, it's easy. You have the words for it now. Trans phylogeny. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. How about that reception, huh? How does it make you feel? It makes me feel good. Um, they, they, they used my name. Yeah. And you were talking to me before you went out here today. You were talking about you had someone who came from West Virginia. Yes. Is, he, is that person here today? Yes. Um, that is uh, the Reverend Derek Beyond. Is Derek here today? There he is. Right there. He's drove all there. the way. Look at that. Welcome. You said it was a five hour trip to come up here? Yes. Look at that. That's dedication right there. That's yeah. a true friend. So. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to Bowling Green. I got to ask you a question. Yeah. That was, there was a lot of, of talk about, you know, why we need to accept this. Right. What is, 
what's the reason why it hasn't happened yet? I know that's sort of a broad question for such a deep topic, but what if you could pinpoint it to maybe one reason that kind of just wholesomely encapsulates the, the, the pushback to this, what would it be? It's a weird example, but um, my father fa finally gave his flip phone away uh, two years ago after having it for almost 20 years um, because he's a, he doesn't like change. And um, I remember he and I had a conversation about it that um, in retrospect is one of the weirdest conversations because he just looked at me um, and said, you know, it's like when Dick Sargent replaced Dick York on Bewitched and there was suddenly a different Darren. And, um, and then after a while, I realized that we weren't actually talking about his flip phone anymore, and we were talking about me. And I, I paused a little bit and I said, well, you know, some people actually prefer Dick Sargent. And like, I think that we are so used to things being a separate way that we think there's this new thing that is going to tear our families apart. And there are a lot of families, I'm from one of the lucky families, that found a way to have, to find some level of acceptance. It's still weird. It's still going to be weird. Because when you have a son and then you suddenly have a daughter, it is weird. What I think is scaring me about this and why I'm really worried about the fact that it hasn't happened yet is that the language is being taken away from people on how to deal with it. People aren't being allowed to have that conversation anymore because that is being erased from the spaces where those conversations are happening. And that is a problem. It's not, you aren't taking away someone's trans identity. You're not erasing it by erasing the opportunity to talk about it. We've had it for 200 years. You go back and look at some of the earliest records of immigrants to the West Coast, particularly San Francisco, and there are numerous examples throughout all of our history of there being trans people here. So it is not that there is a change that is happening that we suddenly have this new thing that hasn't existed. It's that suddenly it's happening to people around us and we have to change and we have to become comfortable with it. And that is really hard, you know? Like, I, I want to say that, like, Pronouns are a big deal, and if you have a trans person in your life, or you have someone in your life that uses they, them pronouns, and it's hard for you, that's okay. It is, it's going to get easier, and one of the things that makes it easier is doing the thing over and over again in time. This speech got a lot better the more times I rehearsed it, right? And so, like, we just have to keep rehearsing the script, right? We have to keep rehearsing the thing, and we get better at it. Well, if there's, yeah, please, yeah. Well, if there's one thing that can be certain, we are so thankful that you're here today to talk to us, and we wish you all the best. Thank and thank you so, you so much. much for sharing. One more time, round of applause for Pella Felton. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to welcome Claire back as she introduces our final speaker. Not sure how I'm going to follow up after that one. All right. Okay, final speaker of our Change for the Public Good session today, um, Dr. Andrea Mata. She's the daughter of a Mexican immigrant and grew up in a gang-infested neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. At 11 years old, her life tragically changed. This fueled her passion and desire to become a clinical child psychologist. She has a really important story to tell today in her speech, From Murder to Mission, How I Found My Life's Calling. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrea Mata to the TEDx BGSU stage. Growing up, my older brother Francisco, Cisco for sure, short, and I shared a bedroom. His twin bed on one side, my wood bunk beds on the other. My fondest moments from that room consisted of him and me, mostly him, I was seven, building a hammock out of a sheet. He'd tie one end to the top of the bunk bed and he'd finagle the other side to the bed frame. Once he ensured I wouldn't break my tailbone as soon as I got in, we would stockpile pillows, blankets, and all 47 of my stuffies. Okay. Maybe not all the stuffies, but a lot of them. Then I'd crawl into it ever so gently, remembering it was a hammock built out of a sheet tied to a bunk bed and a bed frame, and feel nothing but freedom 
and protection. Freedom because I was swinging midair, and protection because of the cocoon-like feel of the blanket, sheets, and stuffies. And then the sugar, the cherry on top. Cisco would tell me one of his fabulous bedtime stories. My favorite, the three little pigs. His stories would include explosions and catapults and smoke bombs and things falling on the big bad wolf and epic celebratory fireworks shows. Man, I absolutely loved my 14-year-old best friend, his hammock, and his stories. That was a snapshot, not only of my awesome brother, but what our family life was like. Just like that hammock, our family environment was one of both freedom and protection. Inside our modest, two-story, 1,500 square foot, three bedrooms and one bathhouse that included stairs to, that too many people to count fell down due to their steepness and unevenness, one of my father's earliest projects, lived six not small people. My father was born and raised in a mud brick ranch house in central Mexico and immigrated to Chicago in his early 20s looking for opportunities not available back in Mexico. Similarly, my mother was born and raised in a small farming community in southern Illinois. And by fate, they met each other in the same working class neighborhood on the south side of Chicago where I grew up. They married and quickly popped out three boys. But finally, after seven long years of parenting boys, they received perfection in the form of a girl who they nicknamed Andy, and now 39 years later, her friends call her Dre, mostly because they can't pronounce her name correctly. We didn't have a lot of money or space, but we were what I now call a high quality family because of the model that was set for us. Our, my parents' parenting practices centered around high expectations within the context of the warm and fuzzies. We were expected to earn the highest grades possible or else our father would look at us and say, you only cheat in yourself. And mom, she brought the warm and fuzzies. She always told us she loved us even when she didn't like us. Nothing outside our house looked as idyllic as that hammock. Growing up, in my neighborhood, I watched many of my peers turn, who were being raised in low quality families, turn to drugs and gangs before I hit high school. I remember my senior year, a guy I did judo with shot and killed a 20 year old man a block from my house, all because he was wearing a baby blue shirt. I've often wondered why Fidel, Jose, and I never followed any of these seemingly self-destructive paths and defied Pew Research Center's statistic that Mexican Americans have some of the lowest educational attainment rates by becoming a physician assistant, a family doctor, and a clinical child psychologist. I got my answer in a courtroom, but first, a story about what landed me in a courtroom. It's April 1995. My two oldest brothers are away at school. I'm 11 and have my own room. Cisco's 18, living at home and in the middle of a gap year. Our parents supported Cisco's decision, but they did not support the friendship he formed with a 23-year-old man at work. But because they valued the freedom to make our own mistakes, they only occasionally poked and prodded why this man had a wife and a girlfriend and multiple kids he was not providing for. I remember April 7th, 1995, like it was yesterday. It was the day my brother Cisco disappeared. I experienced an unnerving sensation in my chest that morning on the school bus. Ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where the bad guy thrusts his hand into people's chest and yanks out their hearts? Yep, that about sums it up. But 
I did what any good Mexican does. I compartmentalized it and went about my day. After all, I couldn't cheat myself. I got home. Cisco wasn't there. The next week, the police were called. So much searching, misdirection and lies. Knock, knock. Two police officers deliver the news. I remember a blur of words. Cisco's body, forest preserves, murdered. For those of you who have lost someone unexpectedly, you know the days following the news are a whirlwind. Funeral preparations, grief, staring at the corpse, praying it's all a practical joke, willing him to move, just move, please. He never did move. The next two years, court proceedings, the murderer denying responsibility, him being found guilty of first-degree murder and armed robbery. Finally, it's my turn as a 13-year-old girl to step into the courtroom and give the murderer who stole my best friend the what for. The DA motions. I slowly stand, walk past the defense attorney, murderer, and DA, and into the witness stand. The judge high above me to my right, waiting for me to start. I stare at the murderer. He looked down immediately. And for the next few minutes, I try to convey how his choices and behaviors impacted my life. I stop. I walk back and sit between my parents, my safe place. Court recesses. The door opens. All rise for the Honorable Judge Carmody. He sits, we all sit. The judge scans the room, pauses on us, and takes a deep breath. I am not sentencing this man to death, not because of moral or professional objections against the death penalty, but because this man had a rough life. See, the man came from a dysfunctional, low-quality family, one full of psychological and physical abuse, where someone abuses drugs and alcohol, suffers from a mental illness, and engages in criminal behavior. Five out of the seven adverse childhood experiences associated with a plethora of detrimental effects. And because of this, the judge sentenced this murderer to 80 years in prison in which he only served 27. I sat there flabbergasted at the idea that the judge attributed this man's heinous act to a rough childhood. And right then and there, I had my never again moment. Never again would I allow this event to consume my life. Never again would I allow my brother's death to be in vain. That never again moment transformed into my life's mission of creating more high quality families, to fortify families. To live out this life's mission, I completed 10 years of schooling and became a clinical child psychologist who specializes in the treatment of antisocial and aggressive behavior. While in grad school and reading the research, one idea synthesized. High-quality families create strong individuals, whereas low-quality families create weak individuals, which leads me to where I stand on the nature versus nurture debate. But first, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It doesn't matter which side you're on. Either way, it's your parents' fault. <laughs> All kidding aside, when it comes to the debate, I'm strongly on the nurture side. I don't believe the murderer was born. I think he could have been a stand-up guy who goes to his 9 to 5 Monday through Friday, speaks his wife's love language by bringing her Reese's Fast Break candy bars, and coaches his kids' soccer teams. But in order to be that guy, he needed to be raised by a high-quality family like mine growing up. One where the success sequence is modeled. First, you earn a high school diploma. Then you establish a career. 
Then you marry before kids. According to Brookings Institute, 97% of adults who hit these milestones in these order, in this order, are not poor. Children raised in high quality families where the success sequence is modeled have the opportunity to maximize their life instead of the thwarting effect of a low quality family. Life isn't fair. We all experience injustice. Some are due to external events, such as your brother is murdered, or someone runs a red light, T-bones you, and shatters your life as you know it. And sometimes they're because of internal things, crap comparisons, such as believing, I should weigh the same amount I did on my wedding day, three kids ago, or the all too familiar self-limiting belief that I'm not good enough, that manifests as the imposter syndrome. So when bad things happen to us, what do we do? How can we return to the hammock feeling of both freedom and protection? You build your fortress. The fortress I speak of has three sides, individual coping, relationship, and parenting skills. And today I'm gonna to focus in on the most important, and that's on the individual coping skill side. Develop agency. Agency is when humans act with intention. You're in charge of how you spend your time, energy, and resources. People need to know that they can act as agents in their own lives and that we're a hell of a lot more powerful than some would like us to believe, especially social media companies. A victim mentality doesn't serve you. It paralyzes you. You develop learned help helplessness. You're like Seligman and Meyer's dog, just laying there taking shock after shock because you don't believe there's a damn thing you can do about it. There's always something you can do to better your life and the life of your family. Flex your agency. Tell yourself, so this happened to me. What am I going to do about it? The first part is acceptance of where you're currently at. It is not an acceptance that this is your fate. And the second part is developing a plan to live a high quality life, even though this terrible thing happened to you. That's one side of your fortress. You still have relationship and parenting skills. But if you can get one thing down, if you can learn to take agency of your own life, then you're on the right path. What am I going to do about this terrible thing that happened to me? What am I going to do about my relationships? What am I going to do about the way I choose to parent? And you, I have a choice. And you, audience, have a choice of whether or not you will be agents in your own life and create a high or low quality family. And it truly begins with taking control of your life and building your fortress. Continue to build your fortress higher and higher because once you've built your fortress high enough, you become the third pig. It doesn't matter what's thrown at it. Ain't no big bad wolf able to blow down a fortress. I know this from personal experience, and now I want other families to experience the freedom and protection that comes with fortress living. And that's why in February 2021, I resigned from a tenured position. And for those of you not in higher ed, that's kind of a big deal. It was a job I could never be fired from a guaranteed salary, but I felt so pulled and not so gently nudged to live out my life's mission of fortifying families and help others build their fortresses. I searched for the highest rooftop that would have me, thanks TEDxVGSU, and now I'm screaming, if you want to change the world, it starts with your family. Because if my husband and me create freedom and protection that comes with fortress living for our three kids, and we teach them how to build their fortresses, and they marry and each have three kids, then the, the ripple effects go exponential. And if we can model fortress living and inspire others to do the same, then more and more ripples. And maybe, just maybe, 
we can live in, our great-grandchildren can live in a society where an 11-year-old girl doesn't lose her best friend because someone had a rough life. My hammock story was 32 years ago. I still miss my brother. I still believe there was injustice that day in the courtroom. But what I now know with all my being is, I was handed my life's mission that day. And you know what? I not only honor and keep Cisco's memory alive by fortifying families, but by incorporating hammocks in all areas of my life, including the one along the pond of the house we're about to buy. From that hammock, I'll cuddle with my kids and we'll create stories. Their favorite, the three little pigs. But instead of pigs, ours include aliens, elves, yetis, and sasquatches. And my hope for you all is that you bring freedom and protection to your families and start your own ripple. Wow, wow, wow. What a powerful message. Thank you. How are you feeling? I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. She killed it. Round of applause, please. All right. Question time. Okay. You're ready, World I promise. World, <laughs> World peace. All right. My question for you is, in your line of work mm -hmm. and everything you've experienced, you got up here on a stage today and shared a very personal story. Talk about the value and importance of being vulnerable. I think it's huge to be vulnerable. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this was because I've always held my story very, very tight. And so it was like, okay, it's time to be vulnerable and share that story. You did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Huge round of applause for Dr. Mata. Thank you. I gotta say, we've had some really incredible sessions today, but don't you all feel so lucky to have people that were willing to take the time, take months to plan this? You now are walking away with ideas and experiences that you may not have heard otherwise. Hopefully you all feel inspired today and go and make change for the public good. And that does conclude our public good, our change for the public good session. I do hope that you feel encouraged and inspired today. We do encourage you to go head on over across the hall to the multicultural or the multi-purpose, not multicultural, multi-purpose room just across the way over there by the mezzanine. There's going to be refreshments, but you'll get to talk to our lovely speakers, talk about their experience. There's also a plethora of other activities going on there as well. Our next speech or session, our final session, will start at about 4.20, and we're going to focus on the concept of advocacy. Thanks so much for all of you who joined in on our live stream. Thanks so much for all of you in the audience today. I know our speakers appreciate it, and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much.
All right, hello, hello. How's everyone feeling? Wow, okay. Can we try a little bit harder? How is everyone feeling? Thank you, thank you. Welcome to the TEDx BGSU event. You are attending the final session of the day, which is advocacy for the public good. I'm Claire Mitchell. My name's Steve Iwanek, and we are here today to talk about advocacy for the public good, our final session, just as Claire mentioned. And we have five fantastic speakers ready for you guys today. So with that, I'm going to dive into what I believe the concept of advocacy means, right? So what do we as society maybe advocate for? We advocate for change. We advocate for help, policy, or McDonald's to fix their ice cream machine. I knew that would be the reaction. It's okay. I, I have like this dad humor, you know, so I, I expect it. But advocacy in my mind ignites the engine that operates Gen Z because we're the ones who are going to become the next global leaders, right? The next wave of inspiration, right? The next set of innovators. And how are we going to do that? We need to do that by being bold, by being prepared, by being educated, and not being scared to roll the dice of life and take a chance, not just on yourself, but for those around you in your life. So here today to demonstrate this concept through the lens of media is Carl Smith. He's the faculty manager for BG Falcon Media, and he's also a dear friend of mine. So with his talk today on how student media, media can transform the barren local news landscape, please give a warm welcome to kick off our final session to Carl Smith. That's quite an introduction. I hope I can live up to half of it. Thanks, Steve. Um, there was a time when news about national issues came from a small handful of outlets. Three major networks, some of us remember, a few national radio syndicates and newspaper outlets. We've seen that change dramatically over the last couple of decades with a barrage of 24-hour news outlets and a seemingly endless flood of faux news websites and podcasts. This dramatic increase in national news outlets could have provided us with deeper information and better information, but has instead introduced us to terms such as fake news and an entire cottage industry of fact checkers, proving once again that more isn't better, better is better. On the flip side, we have a much different situation on the local level. Communities once served by newspapers and other outlets dedicated to the lives have been either disappeared entirely or consumed by hedge funds and decimated beyond recognition. In contrast to the overwhelming flood of information and disinformation at the national level, what we have seen is the advent of the news desert locally. There was a time in the not too distant past when local newspapers covered every council meeting, the zoning board of appeals, every taxpayer dollar spent, but they also showcased our Eagle Scout ceremonies, our festivals, our band concerts. In too many communities to count, that has been replaced by a void a bleak landscape lacking even the most basic coverage of community importance. That scarcity of local news weakens the fabric of our communities. It isolates us from what were once shared experiences and taken one step further, it diminishes our citizenry, stripping communities of information, knowledge, and context we need to hold our elected officials accountable and for us to make informed decisions at the ballot box. Experiments like AOL's Patch Initiative, Lion Publishing, Tapped Into, have tried to fill that void with, at best, varying degrees and more accurately limited success. Independent local news websites have sprouted up all across the country, often heavy on passion, but short on resources. But another solution has risen to address the local news desert, one that deserves more attention and wider application. Because for decades, university student media operations have served as a proving ground for aspiring journalists, a place where they can immediately take what they've learned in the classroom and put it into real world action. We've seen this recently where student media organizations and their universities have engaged in broader partnerships with local media outlets, providing multifaceted benefits that enrich students' education bolster the depth of information available to local communities, and strengthen the bond between university and community. It is the epitome of Bowling Green State University's mantra, a public university for the public good. 
Right now, more than 100 colleges and universities have organized programs to provide local news coverage. As you might imagine, there are a number of different models and different ways to do things and a lot of considerations to figure out. It's a work in progress. For example, at Northeast University, the project is called The Scope, which you can find at thescopeboston.org. They utilize a staff of undergraduate and graduate students, some paid, most volunteer. And in this instance, the project is separate from other news outlets, though they offer content for free. All they ask is to be credited and informed when it's republished so they can include that information in an impact report. They're not competing with other outlets, they're supplementing. And their focus is clear from their tagline, Boston's stories of justice, hope, and resilience. That's a narrow niche, but an important one. How do these projects work? Well, in a recent webinar at the University of Vermont, the folks from Northeastern shared these two lessons inextricably, inextricably connected. First, buy-in from the university is crucial. A single staff member or faculty member cannot do this alone. And the buy-in extends beyond journalism faculty and staff. Other faculty, deans, and in fact, the very top of the administration must be committed. It must become part of the university's DNA. Second, students have to be excited by this project because enthusiasm is the jet fuel that makes projects like this fly. How are these two connected? It is up to the faculty to articulate the importance of the work the students are doing. It is up to them to stoke the enthusiasm. These two lessons hold true across the country, though models vary. At the University of Montana, they take a different approach with two or three students providing a legislative news service which produces written and broadcast reports to more than 150 outlets during legislative sessions. More than 150. That's more than 150 outlets able to provide citizens with news and information about their state's legislation and politicians. That's citizenry in action. On the other side of the country, at the University of Vermont, a number of journalism classes provide stories to more than 20 community newspapers. Well, next door at Northern Vermont University, the News 7 Multimedia Newsroom shares content with broadcast partners. Right up from Interstate 75 from where I'm standing right now at Eastern Michigan University, a broadcast journalism class partners with WEMU, an NPR station, to produce six to eight minute long audio features. And just down the road at Denison University, students in a number of journalism classes cover news across multiple rural communities and share that reporting to other media outlets. This takes a collaborative effort with five faculty members and 80 members of the journalism program. Now, in addition to the lesson learned through Northeastern's project, there are still questions to be answered, not the least of which is libel, which can not only be complex, but expensive. Some universities have blanket insurance policies to cover this, others don't. And the fact that faculty is involved actually makes it more complicated. Obviously, it's something that needs to be worked through. Then there's the matter of student schedules. We know about summer break, but schools have spring break, they have winter break, they have fall break. And just because the students are on vacation doesn't mean the news stops. Then there's the skills gap. These are students, they have learning to do. But despite these questions and hurdles, these student news projects, over 100 nationwide, are making an impact and filling critical roles in local news. It's a great start, but more is possible. While journalism and local news coverage serve as the primary objective of these projects, the opportunity extends beyond that. The fundamental reason most local news organizations struggle or have struggled isn't their content, it's their economics. And a strong university partnership can help on two levels. First, there's the near term. Just as journalism and multimedia students can gain experience while helping inform the community, Students focused on careers in advertising and marketing can help local news outlets improve their revenue streams. At the same time, students with an interest in marketing and social media can help local businesses develop more robust, effective ways to connect with consumers, to connect with members of the community. Thinking longer term, faculty and students can help with the most fundamental challenge for local news organizations, sustainability. 
Look no further than the Schmidorf College of Business at Bowling Green State University for examples of how business students innovate new ideas and approaches highlighted most widely in the annual Hatch program, which mirrors the popular television show Shark Tank. Now imagine applying that energy, that passion, into developing and stress testing business models for local news organizations. This could help build a sustainable news organization for the 21st century. And these lessons can help establish or strengthen news operations in an area where a university partnership just isn't feasible. And isn't that a core value of university research? Taking academic knowledge and turning it into real world impact? Executed broadly and effectively, this strategy will result in better journalists because the students will leave college armed with more than a degree, with real world in-depth experience. They will learn that they can make a difference. This strategy will result in a more closely knit community with better informed citizens capable of holding their elected local officials to a higher standard and elevating their expectations of national and regional officials as well. This strategy will strengthen the local business community and integrate the university into the very fabric of daily life. Building a better country doesn't start in Washington. It starts right here and wherever you are on main streets all across the country. It starts with citizens who don't just care about their community, but are also informed and engaged enough to understand and demand the action necessary to create the communities they deserve. It's an opportunity for universities to go beyond being connected and to become a part of the very fabric of a community. It's a tremendous opportunity for universities to become part of the public good for the long term. Thank you. Hi, Carl. Hey, Steve, how are you? All right, how are you? OK. If I didn't mention this already, he's kind of like my boss, per se, but he's been a huge influence on me as someone who works in student media. So Thank everything you. he says is, is quite true. So how do you feel now that this is done? You got to kick off the final session. By the way, it's hard to kick off a session and set the standard. So give him one more round of applause for setting the standard for our session. Right. Actually, I prefer to do this and follow some of the other speakers because I know they're going to be pretty amazing. Yeah, so. Yes, they will. And so here's my question for you. You know, as student journalists, we have to find that balance between the self-responsibility of holding those elected officials accountable and, and to tell the truth, while also going through the education curve, mm -hmm. right? Because we have to learn how to fail in college. That's how we build up that, those ethical duties as a journalist. And so my question is, how do you do that? How do you merge those two sort of ideals together and still keep the respect from the community that you represent? I think a lot of that falls onto the faculty and staff. Right, because that's up to us. So in my role as a student media manager, if we're going to invest in local coverage, it's up to me to play a stronger role in that. Um, when you have people with experience and with that type of talent, that we need to impart that upon the students. And it, frankly, I think it puts the onus on us to accelerate that learning curve, right? Because you do have to make mistakes. The goal is that we can help you get there quicker and with uh, little or no um, secondary damage, collateral damage. Well, I'm sure that's being demonstrated right now at the Cooling Center, the home of the School of Media Communication. One more time, round of applause for Carl Smith, faculty manager for BG Falcon Media. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Carl, for starting things off for us. Moving on to our next speaker, very excited about this next one. We have Emma Horner. Emma is a third year here at BG studying advertising with minors in marketing and leadership. She's a student leadership assistant in the C. Raven Marvin Center for Student Leadership and Civic Engagement. She's also a social media intern with BGSU Dining as well as an honors ambassador. Her speech for you all today is titled, An Idealized Body Type is Being Sold to Us and We're Buying It. Please welcome Ms. Emma Horner to the TEDx BGSU stage. Recently, I took on a project that I've been putting off for years. I cleaned out my bathroom cabinet. You know how you have that everything cabinet? Anything and everything that you don't know exactly where it goes, eh, just throw it in there. 
Okay, this was my everything cabinet, and let me tell you, going through this was like a trip down memory lane. I would reach a section of products and think, oh yeah, these are from when I was a hormonal preteen and I was mortified about the acne sprouting up on my face. I came across facial products galore, all with packaging promising that they would clear my skin forever. None of them did, by the way. I came across teeth whitening strips that claimed to make my teeth 10 shades whiter, but they really burned my gums. I came across a contouring makeup stick that was supposed to make my face look thinner. This one really didn't last long. I looked like a checkerboard. I came across some magic tea bags that I bought from a commercial saying that it could help me lose 10 pounds in one month. I came across shapewear undergarments that I would squeeze myself into before every school dance. The packaging said, tell me be gone. So I bought them. I came across a box of exfoliating sponges that promised to remove cellulite from your skin. I remember standing in the store Googling, what is cellulite? Hmm. I had never noticed those parts about me and I definitely didn't know they were bad. And so the more and more I pulled out of my cabinet, the more and more unsettled I felt. I felt her pain all over again. The pain of poor 12-year-old me, so frustrated with her inconsistent and changing skin type that she avoided looking in the mirror. The pain of my 16-year-old self, feeling embarrassed that she doesn't look like the girls on her Instagram feed, wondering what she did wrong to be the shape that she was. The pain of my 18-year-old self, so confused as to why her body doesn't look the way it did when she started high school, and as to why her new clothes didn't fit the way they did on the mannequins. I felt the pain all over again of feeling so upset about the way I looked that I was practically throwing my money at anything that claimed it could change me. So here I sat, at 20 years old, on my bathroom floor, surrounded by piles of products, all with packaging covered in empty promises. I asked myself, what was I really paying for? It wasn't the product. It was the insecurity. They told me my skin didn't look good, so I bought their makeup to cover it up. They told me cellulite was bad, so I believed them. They told me I should hide the shape of my stomach, so I said, OK. And now I'm drowning in insecurities that they sold to me before my brain was even fully developed. Insecurities that I paid for. Sitting on my bathroom floor, I realized I had to do something. I had to change something about the commercial industry because I don't want my 10-year-old sister to consume media that tells her what her body should look like. My name is Emma Horner. I'm a college student studying advertising in school right now. Every day, I'm getting a better understanding of the commercial industry of buying and selling and marketing. With my knowledge now, I know exactly why companies use insecurities to advertise their products. Because it works. They point out a natural part of our bodies and convince us that we should try to fix it. And we, as instant, com in easily convincible creatures, believe them instantly. Our brains subconsciously think, oh, if I buy this, I won't be insecure about that. If I buy this, I will look like the model on that package. Of course, it doesn't work like that. Companies plant an insecurity in our mind, and then we buy products to get rid of it. When their product doesn't get rid of our insecurities, we keep buying. They give us more to be insecure about, and we keep buying, and we snowball into this vicious cycle of never feeling confident and spending money to reach an end goal that is always just out of our reach. All of this gets even scarier when we consider the harsh reality of digital manipulation. Technology today allows companies to take photos of human beings and alter them, to airbrush their skin to impossibly smooth complexions, to alter their body shapes, to add makeup to faces. In my opinion, the scariest one may be the Photoshop practice known as Frankensteining, which is where companies can digitally manipulate one model's face to put it on another model's body. 
So when you may think you're looking at the flawless person, you're actually looking at features compiled together by a computer. Let me walk you through what happens, okay? Say you're online shopping. You decide you want to buy this foundation because her skin is flawless. You want to buy that toothpaste because her teeth are so white. You want to buy that weight loss vitamin because her stomach is toned. She, in the pictures, she is not real. She was made by computers and editing and lighting and filters, and she does not define your beauty. From the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to sleep, you see somewhere around 3,250 advertisements or promotional media pieces. That's 3,250 chances in one day for a company to make an impression on you. There aren't any exact statistics about how many companies and influencers use digital manipulation in their media, because most companies don't want to willingly admit to altering a human body. But experts in the field estimate that 99% of photos and advertising are digitally manipulated. It is important to note that digitally manipulated is a blanket statement. This could include anything from altering a body shape to adding a filter. But 99% of the media we're interacting with every day isn't exactly real. But our eyes can see it, so our brains accept it as real. This unattainable image becomes our reality. A medical institution called the Florida House Experience ran an experiment with 1,000 people. From this, they gathered that 87% of women and 65% of men compare their own bodies with the bodies that they see in social and traditional media. That's 87% of women and 65% of men using idealized bodies that have been altered and distorted and softened and manipulated as a comparison to their own real self. When this many people are using digitally manipulated images as a point of reference for what they should look like, the issue becomes even bigger than representation. Now it starts to cross dangerous borders of mental health, body dysmorphia, and eating disorders. Beauty was once something we experienced with the people around us. Beauty was once thinking, I really love how good my friend's smile makes me feel. Now, beauty has turned into an unattainable but tangible image and a reality that we can access at our fingertips 3,250 times a day. And that clear, picture-perfect definition of beauty that we have today was created to sell something to you. And we buy it over and over and over again. So what can we do to stop this vicious cycle? And don't even say, oh, that's just the way of the world. I am so sick of hearing answers full of, well, there's just nothing we can do to stop it. Of course there's something we can do to stop it. We are the ones keeping it going. I promise you that you, as one individual, have some leverage here. The companies that sell you insecurities are not going to like me telling you this right now, but I'm holding my industry accountable. Let me fill you in on the secret. The second that you are truly happy with yourself, the second you are truly confident in your own skin, they've lost a customer. The second you realize that you don't need that one beauty product or clothing item or weight loss plan to be beautiful, their marketing plan is foiled. When you love yourself for the way you are, they have nothing to sell you, and you'll save a lot of money along the way. Once companies see that we're not falling into their trap anymore, they'll realize that they have to change the way that they're talking to us. They'll have to come up with a new marketing plan that is authentic and inclusive. They'll have to use slogans that empower us rather than pick us apart. Maybe then we'll start buying again. But until then, I challenge you all to stop engaging with media and products that sell you a new insecurity every year. 
The next time you find yourself wanting to buy something in hopes that it will transform the way you view yourself, I challenge you to ask yourself where the insecurity came from. Have enough stubbornness in you to not pay for something to be self-conscious about. Get angry. Look right at the enticing advertisements and tell them that you will never pay for an insecurity that they sold to you ever again. Because the definition of beauty is your real, authentic self. Thank you. All right. Hi. You did great. Didn't Thank she kill you. it? Another round of applause, please. Thank you. OK. How do you feel? I feel great. I'm so excited to share my ideas with people. It's over and done with, though. It is, yes. <laughs> Nap time in a few minutes. OK. All right. So, so let's talk about, you know, you shared a lot of statistics explaining how the stuff we see on TV, the stuff we see on social media, a lot of it's fake. Right. But people younger and younger and younger are getting phones, are getting social media. I have um, kids in my neighborhood, seven and eight years old. They have an Instagram and a phone. I did not have that when I was eight. Um, that's kind of scary. But it's not always easy for people to pinpoint what's fake. Correct. What are some signs, some, some key things to look out for that you can tell this is fake when you're looking at an image, when you're looking at a video? So that's kind of the scary part. Um, when I was researching this, I was having a lot of trouble finding things. And I was like, why is no one talking about this? And it's kind of because there's no, like, with your eyes, you can't just see, oh, yep, that's fake most of the time. So um, I guess considering their motive, like, why are they putting this out there? Is it to get views? Is it to get you to buy something? Um, those are all reasons that companies can try to, like, alter um, photos of humans because they want you to use your insecurities to buy that thing, if that makes sense. No, I think it does. Thank you so yes. much. Big yes. round of applause again for Emma. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right. We are on now to our third speaker of this last session. And we're going to dive into a little bit of a different world, right? Because. When we talk about the world around us, it's full of people that are unique in their own wonderful way. Because of that, the concept of professionalism is one that can be tricky to clearly define and enforce. Do we have a right to enforce a standard when every person has their own circumstances? That is something that our next speaker will be diving into as we welcome Brianna Miller to the stage with her talk on redefining professionalism through a lens of neurodiversity. So please welcome Brianna Miller. Professionalism. What is it? And how do we define it? Well, a simple dictionary definition describes professionalism as the skill or competency expected of a worker. Now, despite this rather simple definition, lies a rather complex history. An article from 2000 by researcher Ian Duncanson states, all signs of professionalism were part of the colonial enterprise. Practices of professionalism dating back as far as the 1800s still exist today with racist and sexist dress code standards. So, surely, maybe you know what it looks, or what it means to look like a professional, but what does it mean to act like a professional? And does this history still hold relevance to how we behave? A German psychologist by the name of Kurt Lewin in 1936 created a theory to better understand human behavior. He proposed the equation B equals FPE, meaning that behavior is a function of a person and their environment. The person is represented by internal factors, such as identity, history, personality, and genetic makeup. The environment can be represented by external factors, like where someone is, who they're with, what's happening in the world, and how they're treated. 
So what it means to act as a professional may also be discriminatory because behavior is deeply influenced by culture and brain structure. Let me rewind a bit and paint you a picture of how I came to this realization. So there was actually a period of time in my life where I had lost several jobs back to back. Like, I got fired. <laughs> and most who know me would probably be pretty shocked to hear that. And trust me, I was too. And I'll admit it, there was one time where I felt like I had deserved to be let go because I kind of lost interest and in return had some spotty attendance. But other times, I had a hard time understanding why because my performance evaluations were so conflicting. Supervisors were telling me things like, you have such a strong work ethic, you always go above and beyond, and you're our best employee. But in the same breath, they would add comments like, but you zone out too much, you really need to sit still, but you make others feel uncomfortable, but you're a bit of an oddball, but you just don't fit our environment here. Or my recent favorite, why are you so awkward? I later found myself kind of go through an existential spiral with flashbacks to my elementary days of kids calling me names like weirdo, nerdy, and awkward. Those same kids were also the ones to argue with teachers as to who got to partner with me on assignments, knowing they'd get an A. I realized I was fed a very confusing narrative of being wanted for my abilities, but rejected for showing my true self. So the question of why are you so awkward, I felt needed an answer. So as many medically anxious people would do this day and age, I turned to Google, and yeah, I know what you're thinking, not a great idea. But after reading past all the rare and scary possibilities, I came across an umbrella term called neurodiversity. It describes different ways people's brains can develop atypically. So maybe I had some faulty wiring. And then I read more and I stumbled upon autism. The American Psychiatric Association essentially explains that autism spectrum disorder includes early deficits in social communication and interaction, restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior, and hypo or hypersensitivities to sensory input. I was so confused by this vague definition, but then I realized maybe it's because I didn't know how big the autism spectrum actually is, or that autism doesn't have just one look to it. So in an order to increase my competency on the matter, I read more. I found examples of symptoms like struggling with holding conversations, difficulties with eye contact, issues creating or maintaining relationships, hand flapping, an inflexible adherence to routine, hyperfixations on niche interests, picky eating habits, sensitivities to noise, lights, textures, temperature, and the list went on and on and on. I thought, huh, this kind of sounds like me. So we'll fast forward a few months and I refer myself to get tested. And what do you know? I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD. So finally knowing where my awkwardness was, what, what it was, was actually a product of how my brain was designed. And it was kind of relieving to hear. But then I became quickly enraged as I realized that the negative remarks I had heard over the years were really just a series of ableist microaggressions. I couldn't fix this stuff. I couldn't simply turn it off. And any time I would even try to contain the awkwardness, I struggled even more. It was exhausting. Masking my symptoms to fit in with society was already a full-time job. How could I possibly sustain another? And perhaps I'm not alone with that feeling. I recently came across a statistic published on the University of Connecticut's uh, website that autistic workers are three times more likely than any other disability and eight times more likely than the rest of the US population to be unemployed. Now, I couldn't find much, much rationale as to why this was the case, but I do have a few ideas based on reviewing existing research, 
my own personal reflection, and the endless conversations I've had with my fellow neurodivergent people. Number one, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was passed to legally protect those with disabilities from discrimination. Now, this was an incredible step in the right direction, but there's still a bit of an issue. If one does not have documentation of an eligible diagnosed disability or does not disclose that to their workplace, they aren't necessarily protected. As I said before, autism has pretty vague diagnostic criteria, which can make it difficult to understand, even in the medical profession. Additionally, going through the diagnostic process is a great financial barrier for many, as assessing can cost thousands of dollars. That being said, tons of people don't know or will never know if they're neurodivergent, so they may not be protected. Reason number two, people with invisible disabilities, meaning those who don't show any obvious physical signs of a disability, are often misunderstood or not believed. When I first started to open up about being autistic, I had a lot of people tell me something like, you can't have autism, my six-year-old nephew has autism and he's nothing like you. This thought process often comes from a place of confirmation bias meaning what you see is what you know. And what we know, as noted in a 2007 article by Mandel and his team, is that the majority of research on atypical brain development has primarily been conducted on young, white, cisgender boys. So that's all we see. Neurodivergent behaviors can present a lot differently in adults, women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus identities. Similar to Levin's equation, age, gender, and cultural factors all play a major role in how symptoms can be expressed, much how all behavior is. So, of course I'm not like your six-year-old nephew because I'm not your six-year-old nephew. And reason number three, I believe we're judging behavior and not work quality or ability. Think for a second about a job interview. It's all about first impressions. Now, we neurodivergent folks often struggle with things like understanding social situations or maintaining the focus, all of which gets quickly tested in a job interview. Noticing deficits like these assume that people like me make poor candidates for a position without even considering the skills actually needed for the job. It just seems counterintuitive. So. With these issues in mind, a lack of protection, a lack of understanding, and implicit biases, what can we do to resolve some of this neurodivergent unemployment crisis? I have a few ideas from my own personal experiences as to how we can start. Firstly, check your bias. We all have biases, whether implicit or explicit. It's just human nature and it typically comes from a lack of awareness. But if we can at least know what the problem is, we can work towards erasing that bias. And that starts with doing your own research, not expecting us to teach you about it, although I realize that's what I'm doing right now, but we're exhausted from having these conversations. It happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So the more you're able to learn, the quicker you can correct the issue. For my earlier argument, obviously don't label your employees as awkward, weird, and oddball, or anything similar. And don't ask, did you take your meds today? That's not your place to ask, unless if you're their doctor. And another issue is tone. Like, yeah, I'm sensitive to tone, I'm autistic. But what I mean is that often people with disabilities are infantilized, meaning we're talked down to or treated in a way that makes us feel younger than we actually are. It doesn't feel good. None of it does. At least treat us with the same respect you would with other employees of a similar age. Secondly, employers should ask what accommodations their employees may need in order to support their successes. 
Now don't just do this for employees you know who have disabilities, but normalize asking this for all employees. And check in on this from time to time too, because needs always change. Make accommodations and expectations. What works for one employee may not work for the next, but some examples of accommodations for neurodivergent folks might look something like adding a white noise machine to the environment, offering fidget toys, finding a relatively quiet workspace, establishing a routine, or dimming the lights. For me, having breaks is needed to refocus and a slower paced transition into new roles is what helps me avoid burnout. But from my personal experience, these breaks and a slower transition are what employers freak out about the most because they view it as downtime or wasted dollars. But that's not true. It's absolutely necessary in order to increase productivity. And lastly, I believe the most important part of resolving this unemployment issue is to acknowledge the advantages neurodivergent people bring to the table. A 2017 Harvard Business Review article discussing the competitive advantages of a neurodivergent workforce suggests that these inclusion practices can make your company up to 30% more productive. 30%! Why would you not want that? And compared to our neurotypical counterparts, us neurodivergent folks have some pretty unique strengths like a strong ability to recognize patterns, pay close attention to details, hyperfixate on work we enjoy, great levels of creativity and innovation, and so much more. Neurodivers neurodiversity should be viewed as an asset, not a setback. We have so many strengths to offer you if you just give us a chance. Any more, my ultimate gauge of whether or not I can see myself staying at a workplace is if I can safely be myself. I got this idea after an incredible mentor recently told me before a series of interviews. Free, if they can't accept you for who you are, then they don't deserve your greatness. And I think this is something we can all learn from. Sure, it might take a thousand no's in order to hear a yes, but I'd rather feel valued than just a number. I think most would. And once I finally found a job where I felt accepted, I have only grown more comfortable, confident, and willing to work. In those type of environments, I thrive and I want to stay. Most of us work for about two-thirds of our lives. We don't want to feel miserable for that long. We want to feel appreciated as professionals. Huh. There's that word again. What was once a trigger word for me, I now view professionalism as one's unique ability to perform a task while feeling appreciated for showing their authenticity. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> How's it feel to be finally done with it? What do you think? I know you were a little nervous coming in. Yeah. Uh, it feels like a fever dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, I, I heard some, some whooping and hollering when you first came up here. Do you have any sort of family or friends here today? Oh, I didn't even know this. Um, yeah, I do. Like, I have I see one someone of my best friends. Here, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, sorry to say. Nice. I do have one of my best friends here, and I have a bunch of um, uh, colleagues, mentors, and uh, supervisors who have all really made a great impact for me, so. Wonderful, yeah. well, that's yeah. great to have everybody. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, thank you. So my question for you, I'm gonna keep it sort of simple, right? Yeah, you know, okay. you talked a little bit about your personal background, but just talk more about why this topic for you is just such a, a hard-hitting passion, why you wanna share this message today. Hmm. If you can. Yeah, yeah, so actually a year ago to this day, I was still going through the assessment process to uh, figure out if I was autistic or not. And um, around the same time, the, the TEDx talks were happening, and I, I knew I wanted to do a TEDx talk, and I was like, I'll just let the idea come later. And then in the summer, maybe, I was like, oh, I think that's a good idea <laughs> to talk about it, because I had never really heard much discussion about it before. Um, so yeah, I just, I felt like it was a good message to share and I wanted to start that conversation and keep it going. 
Well, I think everybody here can agree with me when I say we are thankful for having you share that message today. One more round of applause for Brianna Miller. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bree. Up next, we have Jim. He's a senior here at BG studying international business. He's very involved on BG's campus. He is involved in the DACODI, got that one. He's a student ambassador and has worked for six companies in different industries and countries. Today, his speech is titled Global Citizenship. Aren't we all citizens of the world? Please welcome Jim to the TEDx BGSU stage. Everyone guess what was my first cultural shock when I came to the United States. People here ask, how am I doing without actually expecting a full on one hour answer about my life. So I'm going to spend the next one hour talking about my life. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm Tong and I'm going to share my thoughts on global citizenship. With the world population hitting 8 billion and globalization becoming more and more prevalent, how are we approaching diversity and inclusion? There's been much discussion about how to create an all-embracing environment in the United States, but there has been less talk on how American expatriates can best adapt to a foreign culture. How do American expatriates feel when they are now the minority? And how should they assimilate? What if both discussions are two sides of the same coin? A worldview. Global citizenship is when an individual Identity goes beyond geographical and political borders, embracing humanity as a broader class. Many great activists have talked about global citizenship, but most focus more on what we should do as global citizens, like helping others in developing countries. But your journey of becoming a global citizen doesn't need to start in Syria or Liberia. Before we look to the outside world and seek to help others, I think it's beneficial for us to step back and look within ourselves. What should we care? Being told to embrace differences and altruism wouldn't cut it. It's part of our evolution that we tend to favor and help those that are within our own group more than those from other groups. In-group bias has been a central aspect of human behavior. And this mechanism can be a force for good, like helping us enhance our self-concepts or increasing our winning chances when competing for scarce resources. But it can also manifest itself as a force for ill, characterized by outgroup hatred leading to war and race discrimination, which costly harm everyone. We need to be aware of this bias and try to address it. Why? Evolution takes millions of years to have lasting changes. While our society is changing by the day, what was suited for our ancestors may not be optimal for us right now. And what we need right now is more collaboration and compassion. Why don't we try having humanity as our in-group for once? Being inclusive and empathetic doesn't just lead to zero-sum games. It leads to win-win situations. A global citizen doesn't just give, but also receive. The United States only accounts for 4% of the world population. So there must be attractive opportunities elsewhere. Hence the need for global citizenship and global mindedness. When people adopt global mindedness, they understand the world in which they live and how they fit into that world. Great ideas and collaboration can arise from such understanding. In other words, global mindedness can lead to better career, financial, and life outcomes. To grab global mindedness, I think we should first understand acculturation, which is the interaction style a person adopts when interacting with other cultures. There are four approaches to acculturation, integration, assimilation, separation, and marginalization. Marginalization is when a person has no cultural or psychological contact with the traditional culture of the larger society. Separation is when that person maintains the ethnic identity while there's a simultaneous absence of relation with the larger society. Assimilation, on the other hand, is when that person gives up their cultural identity to move into the larger society. And when you have the best of both worlds, you have integration, meaning you retain your cultural integrity while becoming an integral part of the larger society. When I came to the United States, separation was how I 
adapted to the new environment. I was reserved and slow to change. I expected people to think and act like how I was accustomed to. And when they didn't do so, I felt as there was a dividing wall between us, stopping me from making genuine connections with them. So I chose the easiest solution, which was to make friends with other Vietnamese students and stick with them. This approach, however, made me feel even more disconnected and isolated. It was not until I realized that I needed to be more of a blank slate to acculturate that I started to seek more changes. I started to join student organizations and make friends with peers from various backgrounds, trying to see the world through their lenses. Practicing open-mindedness opened my eyes so much. As I stopped seeing myself as Vietnamese, but instead as a member of this world, I felt so free and at home. The best part is I didn't even need to change my core value. I just needed to change my mindset. Nonetheless, I feel like my personal experience alone wouldn't be a good enough help to jumpstart the journey of becoming a global citizen. So I asked 25 C-level executive for their advice, and here are the common answers. To answer the questions, why should we care? The world is interconnected. An event in one country can lead to chain reactions in others. We need to see beyond our regional boundaries to grow. Understanding how different cultures see the world can bring new perspectives and challenges to the belief system that we accept as the norm. Having established that, how can we thrive in a multicultural environment? I think Stephen Covey Court would summarize this best. Seek first to understand rather than to be understood. Different culture emerged from historical events, religion, even the weather. So we should have and show genuine interest in the cultures of others by asking thoughtful questions. People especially bond around food, as is a common place for fellowship and passion. And how do we feel at home in any nation? Knowledge is power. When you know where you're going and what other people recommend doing there, you can feel more confident that you can navigate the new surroundings. Be adventurous. Getting as much understanding of the culture and the country to fully experience it is just as important as having things like home. All in all, I want to end my presentation with this. The more global season we have, the better the world becomes. When you segment the world by political and geographical borders, by ethnicity and culture and stages of the economic development, we allow pettiness, competition, and discrimination to creep in. But we see ourselves as members of this world. We can better see commonalities in people. Global citizens can connect better with others, think for the common good, and build a better society. Everyone can be a global citizen, and more people need to know about global citizenship. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. I've got to say, you're standing up here pretty confident, mm -hmm. not so nervous. Yeah. You feeling good? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Really good. He did a great job, right? Another round of applause, please. <laughs> okay, so you started off the speech saying, I don't want to really tell my personal story, but mm -hmm. I am curious about your personal story. Mm -hmm. you, first sentence right off the bat, when I came to the States. Tell us about your journey to the States. Yeah, um, I, as an ambassador, I got this. Good. Okay. <laughs> as an ambassador, I got this question a lot. Uh, why be just you? Why in like a thousand colleges that I choose be just you? I guess part of it is serendipity that be just you was in my list of the top colleges I want to attend to. And I, I realized I want to challenge myself with being a totally different environment than what it is in Vietnam. And by doing so, it really opened my eyes and showed me what differences can teach you and how you can better adapt to a new environment. And yeah, I really like the journey so far. Yeah. What are your future plans? You're a senior, right? Yep, I am. <laughs> really excited to graduate, actually. Uh, I'm probably going to move to California. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, that's my plan. All right, as soon as you graduate, out of this Ohio <laughs> snow, I the winter, like the I cold. get it. <laughs> the people is great. I just don't like the cold. <laughs> I think we can all agree with you on that one. All right, thank all right, you, thank Jim. You. All right, we have made it.
to the final speaker of the entire day. I want to give a round of applause so far for all the speakers today. Can we do that? I mean, what have you been here for the whole day or just this session? It has just been a fantastic day of speakers, so many different topics, so much just variety of thought. The, the civil discourse has just been absolutely phenomenal. So, but with that being said, our final speaker of the day is Anna Brown, who is going to dive into the world of words and how the power of them can dictate a relationship and a conversation in a variety of ways, while also mending and creating new bonds between humans. So please, to present her talk on Pretty for a Black Girl, Why Words Matter, please give a warm welcome to the stage, Anna Brown. You know, you're really pretty for a black girl. The words still echo in my ears from time to time. It wasn't the first time I heard it, nor would it be the last. But this time it hit differently. Pretty for a black girl. As though my blackness was somehow a barrier to being fully attractive, meaning that the only people who could be considered truly beautiful were white. I know this isn't what she meant, this troubled woman to whom I extended kindness by driving her home, but words matter, and the internalized privilege that whiteness provides betrayed her. Despite my being a college graduate with a full-time job and a car that I own, this woman who struggled to stay out of jail, let alone keep a job, thought she was better than me simply because she's white. This is a very personal and real-life example of what we call a microaggression. Microaggressions are slights, insults, indignities, and denigrating messages that are directed toward an individual's marginalized identities. Microaggressions are based in a person's unconscious biases and stereotypes, which is what makes them so hard to correct, because most people who commit microaggressions think they're giving compliments, unaware of the hidden messages they're communicating. If we're unaware that what we're saying is harmful, even if we're trying to be positive, we're going to continue to cause harm and hurt. How many of the microaggressions on the slides that will come have you heard or even said? All of these examples, even though they're directed at different populations, have one thing in common. They are not purposefully malicious. Some are even menace flattery, but they still cause great harm. We call this intent and impact. Intent is what a person means to convey what they're trying to say. Impact is how those words land and the effect they have on the other person. Paying attention to a person's intent is really important. They may be learning and growing and trying to understand, but not have the proper language to get their point across. Or they may be using what they think is appropriate language, but because language is a living thing, words change, meanings change. And if we don't adapt to the changing language, we could end up saying something harmful that we don't mean. When I was younger and in between jobs, I ran errands and spent time for, with a younger, sorry, with a 90-year-old woman in my hometown. Once she referred to me as colored. Usually when I say this, all the black folk in the room vocalize their displeasure at hearing the term. But I have to remind them that she was not denigrating me because in her time, colored was the respectful term for a white person to use. We are so quick to jump to our own knowledge and understanding without considering the other person's frame of reference. Listening critically and thoughtfully to what others are saying helps us distill the words to their essence, to get to the meaning of what they're trying to say. And that is keenly important if we want to build a productive dialogue. Now, it is not my job to educate everyone. And there are days where I am just too tired from all the bridge building I've done to take on one more person. And that's okay too. But how I respond in that moment can make the difference between whether that person begins to move forward and grow or whether they double down and further entrench themselves in ignorance. So if I choose to respond, I work hard to do so with kindness and with grace, 
even if I am not the one helping them along their journey. Now, granting a person grace when they make a mistake does not exempt them from accountability. If they make a mistake and you address it with them, but they keep making the same mistake over and over, it isn't a mistake anymore. It's a choice. And that may impact your choice of how you interact with them from that point forward. And while we don't want to make other people feel guilty due to their ignorance, neither should we feel guilty when we can't save everyone. Because the truth is some people don't want our help. They prefer to remain where they are, and trying to address intentional ignorance is a study in futility. So by the amount of time I've spent on intent, you're probably thinking that's the more important concept, right? However, nothing could be further from the truth. I focused on intent because that's the first place we as humans go when we've made a mistake. I didn't mean to, or I was just trying to. But when we've made a mistake, we have to shift our focus and get out of our feelings. It isn't about us anymore. And what we meant to do, because if we focus on us, we're centering the people who caused harm, not the ones hurt. And all we're doing is deepening that hurt. This is about the other person and the harm that we have caused them, the impact that it has on them. And if we are going to be the allies and advocates that we say we are, we need to shine the spotlight on the right place, and that isn't on us. When we're talking about impact, we're talking about focusing on thinking empathetically. No one walks up to a person just hit by a baseball bat and says, stop complaining, that didn't really hurt, because we remember the times we ourselves have endured physical pain. We apply our sensitivity to their situation. So my question is, why we do this so easily with physical pain, but have, the same t have a difficult time doing the same thing with emotional pain? We say things like, toughen up, or grow a thicker skin, when we see people harmed with words when what they need is the same reaction we give those experiencing physical pain. Because the cumulative effects of negative impact are huge on both mental and physical health. Everything from feelings of exclusion rather than belonging, to declining job and classroom performance, from chronic anger and fatigue all the way to self-harm. We must put a greater emphasis on impact because the stakes are so much higher than just hurt feelings. And no matter what our intentions, good intent does not negate bad impact. So when we're informed that our impact didn't match our intent, we have to avoid saying things like, it was just a joke or it didn't mean anything because in that space, someone obviously felt that it did. Instead, we have to take ownership of our words and our actions, and rather than hone in on what we meant, focus on what we said or did and apologize. Apologies must be more than just words. Kevin Hancock, who is known for his philosophy of shared leadership and his sustainable business practices said, quote, apologies aren't meant to change the past. They are meant to change the future, end quote. This is really powerful framing that helps to explain why the non-apology apologies are so meaningless. We've all heard them, phrases that start with, I'm sorry, and then add if, that, but, or just, making the apology conditional and usually deflecting responsibility onto the person impacted. You know, things like, I'm sorry that you were offended, or I'm sorry if you feel that way. According to Dr. Natalie Martinek, the non-apology centers intent instead of impact or denies negative impact altogether and tries to provide an excuse for the speaker who did or said something wrong. To properly apologize, there has to be accountability. Highly acclaimed professor and scholar Dr. Lori Patton Davis gave us a wonderful template to use when apologizing. First, Acknowledge our words and our actions. Second, apologize without condition. Third, recognize the harm that we caused. Fourth, commit to future action. And finally, be genuine and do the thing. Additionally, we need to recognize that no matter our intent, how sincere we are, how heartfelt our contrition, 
the person impacted is under no obligation to accept our apology. Expecting acceptance is once again centering ourselves and our intent, and the situation is about the impact on them, not on us. And that we're not forgiven is something we may have to deal with for the rest of our lives. I know it's a lot to take in, but we have to find a way to better communicate. Our society is so polarized, and if we don't find a way to reason together across difference, to move forward and become who we say we are, our institution, our community, our state, and our nation are threatened. We have to do better for the greater public good. You know, there is a less challenging way to deal with all of this. Being mindful of what we say and putting careful thought into what we verbally share before we share it. Because words matter. Thank you. I don't think we could have asked for a better way to wrap up the entire event today by talking those last couple of sentences that you just said, right? Words matter, and it's about doing better for the public good. The whole theme of why we're here today for the TEDx event. So number one, I got to ask you, just take a deep breath a little bit. You're done now. The speech is over. Do you have any sort of family and friends in the audience today? I have chosen family in the audience today. Okay, nice. Well, thank you for those who showed up to support you today. Now I got to ask you a question. <laughs> In your personal life, has a situation like this where someone maybe upset you or maybe even vice versa, if you wanted to get really vulnerable, ever happened to you and how that maybe changed a relationship or even maybe even made a relationship better by finding that way to mend? Yeah, I mean, we all make the mistakes, right? We all slip up from time to time. We all say or do things that intentionally or not cause harm. And so it's about trying to, to find that space within yourself and to humble yourself and own it and say, okay, I know this is what I meant, but that's, that's, we gotta put that aside for a moment and focus really on the other person because if we don't try and, and bridge that with them, then there could be irreparable damage. I have friends that I've lost because through no fault of my own, at least here, I said or did something that was not acceptable to them. And so we no longer speak. I have tried to mend fences when I know that I'm the one that makes the mistake, but I can't always ensure that. So all we do is, is our best, learn from the moment. Um, Maya Angelou said, now that I know better, I do better. And so keep moving forward with that. Absolutely, that's what we're all about, right? We're all gonna make mistakes, it's about how we do better. So, thank you for sharing your message, Jane. Thank you for ending what has been an absolutely fantastic day here at BGS, BGSU TEDx. So, one more time for Anna Brown, round of applause. Thank you. So, that concludes our advocacy for the public good section and our entire TEDx event for today. When we hope that all of the events left you feeling inspired, informed, engaged, and today we heard from a wide variety of people. We heard from some doctors, some musicians, some students, some writers, all kinds of different people from all different kinds of backgrounds, and we learned about all different kinds of topics like sustainability, preservation, art, science, media, all kinds of good stuff. So we hope that you take some of this away and ask, ask yourself, you know, am I humbled by this? Have I maybe discovered a new passion? And what is going to be my role now moving forward in order to create a better public good? Huge thank you to the teams of people that put this event on today. Can we get a round of applause for them, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. This takes months of planning, months of meetings. This is, this is a lot of work put in here. And thank you to everybody who came out today. We have a live stream um, of viewers that came out today. So thank you so much for your time, whether you stayed all day or you came and went. We appreciate that you were here. And then just across the way um, at our multi-purpose room, you'll be able to connect with the speakers you just heard. There's some Light refreshments. There's all kinds of stuff going on over there. So again, thank you so much for your time. And that concludes this session and the whole day today. Thank you.